At the same time, or rather four days later, Ms. Leach also made a post to Facebook that put forward an email address that solicited direct email money transfer donations in support of the Freedom Convoy. Both the Give, Send, Go campaign and the email money transfer campaign were associated with a bank account at the Toronto Dominion Bank in Ms. Leach's name. And both campaigns began to receive funds on the days that they were created. Next slide, please. In its interview with Commission Council, representatives from GoFundMe indicated that they became aware of the crowdfunding campaign on their platform within hours of its creation. This was because it was flagged through its algorithms due to the very high rate of donations that were made very early in its creation. This flagging caused individuals within GoFundMe to review the campaign, and relatively early on, those individuals began to be concerned about the ability of this fundraiser to comply with the GoFundMe terms of service. In particular, the concern related to the GoFundMe terms related to campaigns distributing money in accordance with their description. When an individual creates a crowdfunding campaign, they have to describe what it is that they're going to do with the money that's raised. GoFundMe requires people who organize campaigns on their platform to actually distribute money in accordance with what they tell the public they will do with it. In the case of the Freedom Convoy fundraiser, the description said that it would do certain things with the money such as, we are asking for donations to help with the costs of fuel, food, and lodgings. Funds will be spent to help cover help cover the costs of fuel for our truckers first and foremost, will be used to assist with food if needed, and contribute to shelter if needed. Any leftover donations will be donated to a credible veterans organization, which will be chosen by the donors. GoFundMe reported that it had concerns with these statements. They indicated that, for example, they were uncertain how it would be possible for what was now thousands of donors to all agree on a credible veterans organization that could receive leftover funds. Because of these initial concerns, they tasked what they called their VIP team to reach out to Ms. Leach. This is a group of GoFundMe employees who are responsible for dealing with high profile fundraisers. And they reached out to Ms. Leach starting on January 16th of 2022 to discuss the fundraiser and how the funds might be spent. Next slide, please. These communications continued between the 16th and January 27th, initially with Ms. Leach, but very quickly turned over to a group of other individuals who were working with her to manage the campaign and to deal with GoFundMe. Over the course of this period, GoFundMe representatives posed questions and received answers. And by January 27th, they had reached the part where they felt comfortable releasing at least some of the money that had been raised. Up until this point, donations remained in the control of GoFundMe. On January 27th, in order to formalize the assurances that Ms. Leach had, and her associates had provided GoFundMe, they provided something that they refer to as the attestation letter. The attestation letter was a document that they asked Ms. Leach to sign that set out a number of obligations on her part that she would have to agree to in exchange for access to the first $1 million of funds. This included pledges that she would act as a fiduciary for the beneficiaries of the fundraiser, that is to say, the truckers involved in the Ottawa protests, that she would deliver funds in a manner that was consistent with what she had set out in the fundraiser itself, a series of accountability mechanisms, such as requiring truckers to sign registration forms and to provide receipts in order to receive reimbursement, and to make reimbursements through email money transfers to create a form of a digital paper trail that could be tracked. Finally, there was a requirement for the group of advisors that had surrounded her on these matters to form a formal <laughs> finance committee that would be involved in overseeing the distribution of funds. Ms. Leach signed the attestation letter on January 27th and returned it to GoFundMe. Next slide. 
It is at this point that GoFundMe decided to release $1 million Canadian to Ms. Leach's bank account. However, the money did not actually get transmitted on January 27th, and this led to some confusion amongst various actors. As the commission discovered, while GoFundMe had reached the decision to release the funds on January 27th, it wasn't until February 1st that an actual trans, uh, transaction was initiated. In the time between January 27th and February 1st, Chad Eros, the accountant who by this point had been brought in by the organizers to assist them in their dealing with GoFundMe, began to express concerns about the idea that funds would be sent directly to Ms. Leach's personal bank account. In his view, it would be more appropriate for there to be a nonprofit corporation that would receive donated funds and would manage their distribution. To that end, on January 30th, again, after the money was agreed to be released, but before any release of funds took place, Mr. Eros incorporated the Freedom 2022 Human Rights and Freedoms Nonprofit Corporation, which is referred to in the overview report as the Convoy Corporation. As I've mentioned, February 1st was the date in which the actual fund transfer from GoFundMe was initiated. Records obtained from Toronto Dominion Bank indicate that on that date, Chris Barber was added as a second signatory to Ms. Leach's account that was receiving the funds. Records also showed that a second account at TD Bank was opened jointly between Ms. Leach and Mr. Barber on that date. The overview report refers to these as the first and the second TD accounts, respectively. February 2nd, in the early morning hours, was when the $1 million was in fact deposited into the first TD account. However, for reasons that I'm going to get into later in my presentation, very little of that money was ever accessed. And on February 3rd, TD Bank itself placed holds on both the first and the second TD account. Next slide, please. <coughs> Before continuing the story of the GoFundMe fundraiser, I'm gonna speak a little bit about a second fundraiser that was taking place during the same period of time, the Adopt a Trucker fundraiser on the Give, Send, Go platform. Next slide, please. Chris Guerra articulated the concept of Adopt a Trucker on Facebook. The idea was to pair Ottawa area residents with incoming truckers, so that the truckers could receive support like showers, food, and billets. In order to support this concept, Mr. Gare created a crowdfunding campaign on January 18th on Give, Send, Go. This campaign was attached to a bank account in his name located at the Royal Bank of Canada. Sometime after the creation of that crowdfunding campaign, he also, with the assistance of a man known to the commission as Serge, created a website. The website did a number of different things, including soliciting email money transfer donations. Those donations were associated with an email address that was also connected to the same RBC account. And again, on January 18th, these campaigns began to raise funds. Next slide, please. So I'm going to return now to the GoFundMe campaign and discuss the events that took place that eventually led to that campaign being shut down. Next slide. Now, I've already indicated that on January 27th, GoFundMe had authorized the release of $1 million in funds. We'll recall that January 28th was the first day in which protesters as part of the Freedom Convoy began to arrive in Ottawa. GoFundMe representatives told the commission that on January 28th, they began to receive conflicting media reports about the nature of the protests that were taking place. They were aware of some media reports that described the protests as peaceful and other reports that described it as involving harassment or unlawful activities. 
This led GoFundMe to have concerns about Terms Service compliance, not only with respect to whether the funds would be distributed in accordance with the description, but also their requirement that funds not be used to fund unlawful conduct. A series of further communications between GoFundMe and convoy organizers then took place. On January 31st, GoFundMe sent emails to organizers asking a series of questions, and in particular asking them to confirm that no funds would be given to protesters that were engaged in a range of unlawful activities. One of the activities specifically mentioned by GoFundMe in their communications was blockades of roads. Subsequently, on February 1st, the day in which the $1 million transaction was actually initiated, GoFundMe emailed organizers asking a further series of questions, including whether or not they would agree to publicly disavow unlawful conduct that GoFundMe was concerned may be taking place in Ottawa. GoFundMe asked the organizers to respond to their questions within 24 hours. A response was not received within that time frame, and on February 2nd, the same day that $1 million was received into the first TD account, GoFundMe decided to suspend the fundraiser pending further investigation. Over the course of the next two days, a series of important meetings took place. On February 2nd, representatives of GoFundMe met with Deputy Chief Bell of the Ottawa Police Service, and on February 3rd, with Mayor Watson of the City of Ottawa. On February 3rd, the Freedom Convoy organizers also had a series of communications with GoFundMe. A letter drafted by Keith Wilson asking as counsel for the Convoy Corporation was sent responding to the questions posed in GoFundMe's February 1st email. Subsequently, a telephone conversation took place involving Mr. Wilson, Mr. Eros, other associates of the fundraisers and the GoFundMe platform. In their interview with Commission Council, GoFundMe representatives indicated that they left that meeting unsatisfied with the responses that they had received, and they continued to have concerns about the lawfulness of the protests and the role that the funds might play in those protests. On February 4th, GoFundMe had a second meeting with Deputy Chief Bell. It was also on that date that representatives of GoFundMe reported that they believed that individuals associated with the Freedom Convoy leadership were using social media to encourage harassment of GoFundMe employees. GoFundMe reported that its employees had received a number of threats after the decision was made to suspend the fundraising campaign, and those threats increased in frequency on February 4th. In the evening of February 4th, GoFundMe made the decision to cancel the fundraiser, and over the course of the next 24 hours, arrived at the conclusion that they ought to refund all donations made to the platform. Next slide, please. The overview report also describes the events that took place surrounding the move of the Freedom Convoy fundraiser from the GoFundMe platform to the Give, Send, Go platform. But as I mentioned before, often events were taking place in parallel. And as it turned out, there were critical events involved in that move to Give, Send, Go that were taking place as early as January 26th, even before Ms. Leach had signed the attestation letter let alone the GoFundMe campaign being shut down. Next slide, please. In order to understand this part of the story, there are some additional individuals who have to be introduced. On January 26th, a man named John Ballard reached out to Jacob Wells, the co-founder of Give, Send, Go. Mr. Ballard, is understood by the commission to be associated with an American-based social media platform called CloutHub. In the January 26th meeting, Mr. Ballard spoke to Mr. Wells about the possibility of the two men working together to convince the Freedom Convoy organizers to move their crowdfunding campaign off of GoFundMe and onto Give, Send, Go. 
In furtherance of this discussion, on January 27th, Mr. Wells created what he described to the commission as a mock-up of a campaign on his platform, showing what a Freedom Convoy fundraiser would look like on Give, Send, Go. Although to be clear, this was not an active campaign and was not capable of receiving funds. On January 28th, Mr. Ballard obtained Mr. Eros's contact information by way of Mr. Guerra. Mr. Ballard contacted Mr. Eros and asked him to join a phone conversation to discuss the possibility of the Freedom Convoy raising funds on Give, Send, Go. Mr. Eros agreed to join that conversation. However, before that phone call took place, Mr. Eros reports receiving a phone call from another man named James Peloso, who is associated with the organization Taking Back Our Freedoms. Mr. Eros and Mr. Peloso had not previously had interactions with each other. Mr. Peloso indicated that he should be involved in any phone call involving Give, Send, Go, because Taking Back Our Freedoms had funders who would not agree to fund the Freedom Convoy unless one of their individuals was on the inside for discussions related to fundraising activities. On January 31st, a meeting took place between Mr. Aros, Mr. Wells, Mr. Peloso, Mr. Ballard, and another individual named Jeff Brain, who is the founder of Clout Hub. During that meeting, Mr. Ballard described a plan to move the Freedom Convoy off of GoFundMe and onto Give, Send, Go. As part of this plan, he also suggested that Freedom Convoy organizers should use Clout Hub as their main web presence to advertise their campaign and indeed their movement as a whole. Mr. Ballard also described how Clout Hub would provide a secure means of communication between organizers of the Freedom Convoy. Mr. Brain, again, the founder of Clout Hub, also offered to provide Freedom Convoy organizers a quarter million dollar loan to finance their operations, pending the ability for them to access donated funds. At the end of this meeting, no decision was made with respect to taking Cloud Hub up on its offer to use its services or indeed to accept a loan from them. Indeed, Mr. Wells and Mr. Eros in their interviews with the commission found it confusing that Cloud Hub was involved in these meetings at all. However, as a result of this meeting, Mr. Eros and Mr. Wells did form a connection. And as a result of that connection, an agreement was made to create a crowdfunding campaign on Give, Send, Go connected to the Convoy Corporation. That campaign was created and went live on January 31st again, prior to the release of funds the next day from the GoFundMe campaign. Ultimately, when the GoFundMe campaign was shut down, Ms. Leach advertised the fact that the Give, Sent, Go campaign was in existence, and funders then moved and made donations there. Next slide, please. I mentioned before that payment processors played an important role in the story of the fundraising of the Freedom Convoy. This was a role that was played largely behind the scenes, and it had the most significance when it came to the Give, Send, Go campaign. To the public, there was only ever one campaign on Give, Send, Go associated with the Freedom Convoy fundraiser. However, for reasons connected with how Stripe operates, there were in fact in effect, two campaigns associated with the Freedom Convoy fundraiser on Give, Send, Go. And in order to understand why that came to be, one has to understand a little bit about what payment processors are and how they operate. Most crowdfunding platforms don't actually accept and distribute funds themselves. They are, in effect, kind of a social network shell that provides a platform to attract donors. The actual work of receiving electronic donations and distributing those donations to bank accounts are done by payment processors like Stripe. On the Give, Send, Go campaign, in order to set up a, a campaign at all, 
one needs to have a Stripe account. However, in order to create a Stripe account, an individual has to have a bank account to associate with it. This presented a unique difficulty for Mr. Eros, because at this point, the Convoy Corporation did not have a bank account. Recall that the Convoy Corporation was only created the day before, on January 30th. He therefore could not create a Stripe account, and therefore could not attach it to the Give, Send, Go campaign. As a temporary solution to this problem, Mr. Wells suggested that he use his Stripe account, attach it to the campaign on Give, Send, Go. And that is what happened. And so between January 31st, when the campaign first went live, and February 7th, the Give, Send, Go campaign was actually attached to Mr. Wells' Stripe account, and through that, his personal bank account. On February 7th, Mr. Eros did create a Stripe account. However, that account was not connected to the Convoy Corporation directly. By February 7th, the corporation still did not have a bank account. In order for Mr. Eros to create a Stripe account, he reached an agreement with Keith Wilson to have the Stripe account attached to Mr. Wilson's trust account at his law firm. Once this took place, on February 7th, the fundraiser was switched over from Mr. Wells' Stripe account to Mr. Eros's Stripe account. And from February 7th until February 10th or 11th, the evidence on that point is conflicting, donations made to the Give, Send, Go campaign went into Mr. Eros's Stripe account. On either February 10th or 11th, the Stripe account was switched back to Mr. Wells' Stripe account, and all further donations made to the Give, Send, Go campaign went there. Next slide, please. I'll return to the crowdfunding campaigns in a moment, but before I do, a few words about some of the activities involving cryptocurrencies that were taking place. The majority of these activities occurred between January 27th and February 17th of 2022. Next slide. There were a number of cryptocurrency campaigns and fundraisers taking place during the Freedom Convoy. This overview report focuses on three main ones. The first was a cryptocurrency campaign associated with Mr. Guerra's Adopt a Trucker campaign. I mentioned before that an individual named Serge created a website for Adopt a Trucker. In addition to soliciting email money transfers, that website also provided information that would allow individuals to donate any of six different types of cryptocurrencies to the Adopt a Trucker campaign. However, it appears that those cryptocurrencies were not in the control of Mr. Guerra directly, but were rather controlled by Surge. A second different type of cryptocurrency campaign took place in association with Pat King. This was the Freedom Convoy token campaign a new cryptocurrency that was created and marketed in association with the Freedom Convoy. The idea behind this campaign was that individuals would exchange pre-existing cryptocurrencies for this new cryptocurrency called Freedom Convoy token. Built into Freedom Convoy token was a process by which 4% of every transaction involving it would be diverted to an entity called the Freedom Convoy Foundation. The idea being that this would provide a long-term source of funds for convoy protesters. However, the commission was unable to determine whether or not such an entity even exists. And it appears that there is not an active market today for Freedom Convoy token, and therefore funds are not flowing to any such entity. 
The most significant cryptocurrency campaign addressed in the overview report was the Honk Honk HODL campaign. Next slide, please. This campaign was started by an Ottawa area resident named Nicholas St. Louis on or about January 27th. While Mr. St. Louis was the creator of the campaign, there were a number of individuals that were associated with it at different stages, including Benjamin Dichter. Using a cryptocurrency crowdfunding platform called TallyCoin, this campaign ultimately raised approximately 22 Bitcoin in donations. The value of those 22 Bitcoin at the time was approximately $1.2 million Canadian, although today the value would be significantly lower. Of that money, approximately 800,000 was distributed to protesters involved in the Ottawa protests. This was done by splitting $800,000 worth of Bitcoin into 100 individual electronic wallets, and then handing out, in sealed envelopes, 100 sets of instructions on how to access one of those unique online wallets. These were distributed to truckers in Ottawa over a 24-hour period on February 16th and 17th of 2022. Next slide, please. We get to the part of the narrative contained in the overview report that deals with how all of the funds we've just been discussed were eventually blocked from arriving in the hands of fundraisers. In order to understand this, it's useful to understand two types of court orders that were involved in the process that led to these funds being blocked. The first is something called a restraint order. This is a type of order that can only be obtained by the Attorney General of a province or of Canada, and it exists within the Criminal Code's Proceeds of Crime provisions. In essence, a restraint order is obtained by the Attorney General when they're able to show that there are reasonable grounds to believe that some property meets the definition of offense-related property. Offense-related property is defined to mean any property that is used in any manner in connection with an indictable offense or is intended to be so used. The effect of a restraint order is to prohibit anyone from dealing in any way with the property in question unless in accordance with the terms of the order. The second type of order to understand is called a Moreva injunction. A Moreva injunction is a civil court order. It is ordinarily obtained by plaintiffs in civil proceedings against defendants. It is used to freeze and preserve a defendant's assets and funds when there is a risk that they may be dissipated. Its purpose is to freeze those funds in place so that if plaintiffs are successful in their lawsuit, there will be assets that they are able to execute judgment against. Both of these types of orders, <coughs> restraint orders and Moreva injunctions, played a significant role in how funds that were raised were ultimately disposed of. Next slide. On February 10th, the Attorney General of Ontario applied ex parte to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice and obtained a restraint order against the funds that had been raised on the Give, Send, Go platform, those being the Freedom Convoy campaign, as well as the Adopt a Trucker campaign. As a result of the restraint order, Stripe froze the accounts of Mr. Guerra and Mr. Eros. It did not, however, freeze the account of Mr. Wells, as it was held not by Stripe Payment Canada Limited, but by the American payment company Stripe, which Stripe felt was beyond the reach of the Ontario restraint order. I've mentioned before that it is either on February 10th 
or 11th that Mr. Wells changed over the Stripe account associated with the Freedom Convoy fundraiser for Mr. Eros's frozen Stripe account to his own active Stripe account. Mr. Wells also took action with respect to the Adopt a Trucker campaign. While Mr. Guerra's Stripe account was frozen by the restraint order, Mr. Wells switched that campaign over to a backup payment processor based in the United States called RallyPay. Thus, while both of the fundraising campaigns remained attached to active payment processors and could continue to receive funds, it would be difficult for those funds to arrive in the hands of the organizers. By this point in time, both TD Bank and RBC had been put on notice of the restraint order, and they too were prevented by its terms from dealing in any way with the funds raised on Give, Send, Go. On February 17th, Zexi Lee, in her role as the representative plaintiff of a proposed class action of Ottawa residents, obtained a Moreva injunction. This order applied to a broader set of category, uh, uh, assets. It included those assets covered by the restraint order, but also applied to several other individuals and other assets. For example, it applied to assets that were raised by Mr. King, and it applied to a range of cryptocurrencies that were not the subject of the restraint order. On the same day, the Toronto Dominion Bank applied to court to pay in through an interpleader approximately $1.4 million that were in the first and second TD accounts in the joint control of Ms. Leach and Mr. Barber. They did so on the basis that the true owners of those funds were unknown and that the funds should be held by the court until such time as the proper recipients of that money could be determined. The money then stayed in these various bank accounts in various locations, frozen by both the restraint and the Mareva orders. This changed on March 9th, when the Mareva injunction was varied to allow these funds essentially to be pooled in the hands of an escrow agent who would hold them all pending the outcome of the Ottawa litigation. <coughs> and in the days and weeks that followed, the funds that we have been discussing so far were transferred to the escrow agent where the commission understands they remain. Next slide, please. This then takes us then to what the commission understands about the sources of the various funds and their ultimate destinations. Next slide. During the events in question, there were many public statements and questions raised about the issue of foreign versus domestic funding. And in the order and council creating this commission, this issue is also flagged for the commission's consideration. As a result of this, the commission made inquiries with various entities about the sources of funds, both in terms of number of donors and in terms of the value of donations. The result of these inquiries show different patterns for different fundraisers. The simplest are the email money transfer campaigns associated with the Freedom Convoy and Adopt a Trucker. Those campaigns were 100% Canadian in that they relied on the email money transfer system that exists within Canada. All donations to those fundraisers originated at least immediately from a Canadian domiciled financial institution. The Freedom Convoy GoFundMe campaign was also largely Canadian in its origin. GoFundMe reported that 86% of donors were based in Canada, and that by value, 89% of donations originated in Canada. The two campaigns on Give, Send, Go, however, show a different pattern. Both of those campaigns were largely American-based in terms of where donors were located. Freedom Convoy, 59% of donations originated from the United States, 51% for Adopt a Trucker. 
However, when measured in terms of the value of donations, <coughs> the values are slightly different. 55% in terms of the actual dollars donated through adopt a trucker originated in Canada. And in terms of the Freedom Convoy campaign, an equal amount of money originated from Canada and the United States at 47% each, the remainder from other countries around the world. Next slide, please. And so we return then to this chart that describes the value of money flowing into and out of a number of different entities. I'll begin with the GoFundMe campaign. The GoFundMe campaign raised in excess of $10 million Canadian. $1 million of that was released to Ms. Leach's Toronto Dominion Bank account. However, the full amount was also refunded to donors. In other words, while GoFundMe released a million dollars, it also refunded all donors the full amount of their donations, making up the $1 million shortfall themselves. In addition to the $1 million that was deposited into Ms. Leach's TD account from the GoFundMe fundraiser, she also received $419,000 $416.63 in email money transfer donations. Out of this approximately $1.4 million put into the first and second TD account, only $26,000 was accessed. The remaining $1,393,000 and change was placed ultimately into escrow as part of the Moreva injunction. With respect to adopt a trucker, Mr. Guerra raised around $800,000 Canadian on Give, Send, Go. Of that amount, approximately $330,000 was released by Stripe into Mr. Guerra's RBC account. The remaining money contained in Mr. Garris' Stripe account was either ultimately paid into escrow or was the subject of a variety of credit card disputes, chargebacks, or fees by various financial institutions. In addition to the $330,000 that Mr. Uh, sorry, that Mr. Guerra received into his RBC account, he also received approximately $31,000 in email money transfer donations. Of this amount, approximately $220,000 was released from Mr. Guerra's RBC account and spent on a variety of things. Approximately $141,000 was paid by RBC from that account into escrow. With respect to the Freedom Convoy campaign on Give, Send, Go, it begins to become a little bit difficult to provide precise figures. This is because Give, Send, Go was reporting donations in US funds, but that those donations were made over a period of time subject to a number of different exchange rates. What we can say is that Give, Send, Go reported receiving approximately $9.8 million US in donations, and that using the February 10th Bank of Canada exchange rate, that would be equal to roughly $12.4 million Canadian. Of this, around $3.75 million was put into Mr. Eros's Stripe account, and the remaining approximately $8.6 million went into Mr. Wells' Stripe account. The money in Mr. Eros's Stripe account was sent into escrow. It was not provided to Mr. Eros or into the trust account of Mr. Wilson. There is a bit of a discrepancy there, which was explained by Stripe being taken up again by credit card chargebacks and a variety of fees. 
In terms of Mr. Wells' Stripe account, while we, the commission did not have access to any banking records associated with this, in communications between Mr. Wells and Stripe that the commission did review, it appears that all donations made and put into his Stripe account were refunded to donors with the exception of certain fees that were subtracted as well as components of those donations that donors had indicated should go directly to give, sent, go. With respect to the Honk Honk HODL campaign, as I mentioned before, out of approximately $1.2 million of Bitcoin that was raised, 800,000 of that was distributed to protesters. Paid into escrow, was 7.57 Bitcoin, which at the time was worth approximately $413,000. Finally, there was a $10,000 bank draft that was also paid into escrow. This money originated from a very brief period of time when the Convoy Corporation did have a bank account at the Steinbach Credit Union. Next slide, please. The overview report contains substantially more detail about these transactions and the events surrounding them. For the parties, the overview report is available in the participant database. And for members of the public, this overview report will soon be published in both English and French on the Commission's website, along with over 100 source documents that provide further detail on the things that I've discussed in my presentation. With that, Mr. Commissioner, I'd ask that COM OR705 be entered into evidence. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so that, uh, that detail on all the movement of funds. Now, are we in a position to move to the next uh, phase? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the next witness is Benjamin Dichter. <coughs> Mr. Dichter, will you swear on a religious document or do you wish to affirm? A uh, religious document? We have the Bible, the Quran, or the Torah available? You have a Siddur, Torah, yeah, please. Torah. 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 For the record, please state your full name and spell it out. Benjamin Dichter, B-E-N-J-M-I-N, Dichter, D-I-C-H-T-E-R. Do you swear that the evidence to be given by you to this commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God? Yes, I do. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Dichter. Good morning. Uh, well, uh, the registrar grub, uh, takes the Torah. I, uh, your counsel here, uh, Jim Carajalios, I believe wants to make a brief statement before we begin. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mather. My name is Jim Carajalios. I'm counsel for the witness, Mr. Dichter. The last name is spelled K-A-R-A-H-A-L-I-O-S. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner, for giving me uh, a minute in the introduction. Mr. Dichter has a, um, a couple of requests. Um, as the uh, commission has posted on their website, Mr. Dichter made a late application for standing um, uh, that was dismissed. Uh, in that uh, application, uh, the application for standing was done uh, jointly with um, Mr. Christopher Guerra, uh, who, as we saw in the previous report, uh, was the lead on the Adopt-A-Trucker campaign. Uh, Mr. Guerra has uh, standing as a member of the, uh, what we are calling the Convoy Organizer Group. Uh, Mr. Guerra is in attendance here today. 
We received yesterday the time allocations today um, uh, with regards to after the evidence in chief is provided. It provides for 15 minutes for the convoy organizers and five minutes for, uh, I believe, the Democracy Fund, the JCCF, and 10 minutes for Mr. Dichter's council. Um, given that the convoy organizers and the JCCF Democracy Fund have very similar interests, Mr. Dichter, Mr. Dichter uh, would like to ask the commissioner, uh, with the approval of Mr. Guerra, who's a member of uh, jointly uh, the convoy organizers in standing and gives his approval, uh, to consider, and I hope my friend from the uh, convoy organizers would uh, agree to uh, reallocate some of the 15 minutes provided to the convoy organizers to Mr. Dichter's council uh, at the end uh, for further questions. Okay, so if I understand correctly, uh, you're seeking to have a, a transfer from the convoy organizers uh, of five minutes to your uh, final submissions or presentation? That, that's correct. I think that would uh, better balance the uh, time allocation after the evidence in chief with the interests of everyone involved. Okay, I don't know if that's been discussed with the convoy organizers or not. I haven't had a chance to discuss uh, with my friend, but Mr. Guerra is here today in attendance, and he's uh, a member uh, uh, jointly having standing with the convoy organizers, and he gave his blessing. Um, so I apologize, Mr. Commissioner, I haven't had a chance to talk to um, legal counsel of the convoy organizers in advance. Oh, I see con convoy organizers, councils just walking in. So um, that obviously hasn't been discussed, uh, so uh, we can address it when we get to the point of cross-examination if it hasn't been sorted out before then. And uh, I can assure you uh, we won't be uh, shortchanging uh, the witness. We've been quite uh, understanding about the situation for witnesses who are not uh, represented by Thank counsel. You. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. The second uh, brief uh, uh, thing I'd like to ask on behalf of Mr. Dichter is um, in his application to have uh, his counsel lead his testimony here today, uh, you correctly pointed out, Mr. Commissioner, Rule 59 uh, that allows for Mr. Dichter to apply for uh, additional time in the evidence in chief led by his counsel, if I understand it correctly. At the end of Mr. Mather's uh, evidence in chief, if you could just uh, give uh, Mr. Dichter a little bit of time to decide whether he wants that Rule 59 application to be brought forward to you for more time and evidence in chief by me. Uh, that would be appreciated. So that's a similar, it's sort of six different, and one. Different that. periods of the, uh, of the testimony, but yes, yeah, similar. Okay, well, the, the same response. Where, okay. uh, we will, of course, uh, endeavor to make sure it's, it's fair to the witness and uh, we obtain the evidence we need. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Okay. Good morning again, Mr. Dichter. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Mather. I'm Commission Counsel. Um, I just have a few questions about your background uh, to start. I understand you're from Toronto, is that correct? Uh, yes, I grew up in Toronto in a middle-class family, Bayview York Mills. Uh, I grew up uh, in a Jewish home. I was adopted and uh, I hit the jackpot with my family. And later in life, uh, I found out from my, um, uh, my biological siblings who found me, I am the uh, descendant or the, the grandson of Brigadier General Dennis Whitaker. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, and what's your current occupation? Uh, I'm a trucker uh, and I produce podcasts. How long have you been a trucker? Uh, several years, about four for four years approximately, and I've been an owner-operator for a couple of years. And can you just give the commission a sense of the nature of your trucking business, where you travel, what sort of loads you carry? Uh, yeah, I drive to the United States, mainly in, as we call it, the upper right corner. So Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, all that sort of stuff. Uh, with the carrier I work with, predominantly commodities, paper, that sort of stuff. And can you... Uh Give the commission a sense of the sort of podcasts you produce? Uh, a variety of stuff. So uh, Professor Stephen Hicks, uh, we produce a podcast called Open College. I do a legal podcast called Not on Record with a couple of lawyers and uh, a really well-known legal researcher. So I've been learning a lot over the past uh, couple of years. So a wide range of stuff. 
and we've we've changed some of the stuff that we've had on this little it started as a hobby and we're slowly growing it into a small little uh, side business any other podcasts uh i mean there's a, a, a few of them there's we did for a while um uh you two with mike bullard but we're not doing that anymore uh untrue crime diana davison one godless woman uh she's a saudi activist the quiggan report and we at the most i think a total i've produced and created seven different podcasts with different creators Sometimes uh, podcast uh, companies, have, or they fall under an umbrella. Like, is there a name for your podcasting publishing platform? Yeah, possibly correct. <laughs> possibly correct, okay. A little tongue-in-cheek humor. Okay. And were you uh, podcasting uh, with Possibly Correct in January 2022? Uh, yes, it was a little bit slow. Uh, things were, you know, you're coming off the, the new year, and um, it kind of... Uh, ebbs and flows there's different times where it's busier depending on what my creators are sending me you know they'll do their scripts they'll do the recordings send it to me and depending on their availability that availability that's when i'll upload content okay and um the commission has read reports that indicated that you've also had jobs including being a gemologist designing safety equipment for motorcyclists um, and owning a commercial printing shop is that accurate I went to school for gemology and I was a diamond grader, was my specialty. Um, I patented a product for motorcycles uh, many years ago and moved out to Canada when my girlfriend at the time was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, and I had a printing business on Ryerson University's campus, well, adjacent to Ryerson University's campus for uh, several years, yes. Um, I also understand you ran for city council in 2014, is that correct? Ran for city council in 2014 and also ultimately ran for federal politics for the conservatives. Right. And that was in 2015? 2015, yeah. And uh, I should, when I say city council in this setting, I should say that was the city council of Toronto, not yes. the city council of Ottawa. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you've also founded a group called LGBT, sorry, LGB Tory. Yes. Um, can you tell the commission what that group is? Yeah, LGB Tory was uh, basically um, uh, a community organization for friends of mine who were conservative and in the gay community. There was a lot of uh, tension that was building up and they felt very, I don't know, we'd say alienated. Where my business was, was adjacent to the gay, because I have a lot of gay friends. And uh, so we decided let's put together uh, an advocacy group, a meeting group, whatever, just to allow people to come to come out. And, you know, Doc, who founded with me, always says uh, it was easier to come out as gay than it was to come out as a conservative in the gay community when we started. And is that group still active? Uh, periodically. Uh, we actually, we had a meeting a couple of months ago and looking at uh, moving forward in the near future. Uh, I'm so busy with so many other things at this point. So they just kind of meet with me for my ideas, advice, messaging, that sort of stuff. Um, shifting now to the yeah. protests in Ottawa in, 2020, in fe January and February 2022, how did you get involved? Tamara Leach called me on January 15th and uh, you know, I knew Tamara, it seems to be, from what I'm learning in testimony, I knew her the longest. And she reached out to me. She said, we've started a GoFundMe campaign within the past couple of days. It seems to be taking off. Uh, if you could come on board, help me with messaging, uh, pressers, press releases, all that sort of stuff. And I said, um, yeah, sure. Uh, so I decided to, uh, to get involved with her. And how did you first meet Ms. Leach? I met her 2017 or 2018. I was in Alberta. I was connected to her through some other people. I went to Medicine Hat, and that's where I made her stay at her house, actually. When you say you connected with her through some other people, uh, who were those people? Uh, people that were fans of one of the podcasts that I was doing. And uh, so they invited uh, the podcaster out, and I just kind of tagged along and got to see uh, Medicine Hat and Grand Prairie uh, for the first time in my life. And what was that podcast that they were fans of? Uh, the Quiggan Report. Quiggan Report. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so, sorry, you said that was around 2017, 2018? Seven, yeah, 17, 18, some of that. And uh, after you first met Miss Leach, how frequently were you in contact between then and January 2022? Pretty frequently, actually. We would, um, sometimes it was every couple of weeks, sometimes once a month, just, hey, catching up, how are you, that sort of thing. Uh, me and her really bonded on the whole, I think I made fun of, positivity, sort of woo-woo, good energy sort of thing. We really connected when we first met each other. And she had interests in politics, and so we would discuss politics in general. And there were a lot of concerns from people in rural Alberta, uh, what had been going on in Canada from the perspective of people in her community. What did you come to learn about Miss Leach's political interests? Uh, when I was in Ma Medicine Hat, uh, I didn't I, I didn't know that she had been involved uh, politically and knew people in politics out there. I thought she was just, you know, just a fan sort of thing. And I uh, just kind of, well, okay, fine. She knows people in politics, great. And just didn't really delve all that much into it at that point. But it sounds like you had subsequent conversations with her about politics. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. for sure. That's one of the things we would talk about. She'd call me and, you know, just general, what do you think about what's happening? So. And through those conversations, what did you learn about Miss Leach's politics? What was she trying to do? What was she hoping to achieve? What was her interest? You know what? I don't know. It's really interesting because she's, she's really practical. And um, I wouldn't call her extreme to any side. I would say she's, I don't like the labels. It's the problem. Uh, so the political spectrum thing, I would I'd call her maybe very center-right if we're going to use that antiquated um, definition, which I don't think is accurate. But yeah. she's very, very pro, you know, she's no, I'm, I know I'm very libertarian on social issues and she's the same way. So we, we crossed over a lot of that stuff. And I'm not asking you to put a label on Miss Leach. Yeah. What, I'm, what I'm interested in understanding is through your conversations with her, what did you understand, you know, the causes that she was interested in? What, what was she trying to achieve regardless of what the label is? Um, I don't know. I know she, like, she ended up with this maverick party and, um, uh, which I tried to explain to her, like, uh, Jay Hill, who's leading the maverick party is a conservative party MP. Like that's as establishment as it's not a real party, Tamara, is what I told her. What are you spinning your wheels with this for? Uh, but she said, no, I'm going to give it a chance. You never know. Like, you know, we need to have more voices for people in Alberta. I'm like, Okay. And actually, uh, leading up to prior to the uh, convoy, I had a conversation, I guess, before Christmas, if I'm memory, remembering correctly, and she seemed to be coming around. <laughs> she said to me, yeah, I think you're right all this time. I think I'm just getting frustrated because she noticed it was all people tied to the Conservative Party and Maverick. I don't know the details. That's just what she was communicating to me. So the sense I get from that response is that she was involved in the Maverick Party and you raised with her you know, this is this is tied to the Conservative Party or has relationship, and that's an establishment party. It sounded like that was something you weren't in favor of. Is that fair? No, it's it's kind of the, the deceptive tactic that if you're the Conservative Party, then just be part of the Conservative Party. Don't make fake parties. Like, just, it, it, you see a lot of that going on lately. And uh, I just find it's, uh, it's deceptive to the voter base who may not understand this is the sort of thing that goes on in politics. And I just don't support that. Just be who you are, right? At that point in time, in December 2021, were you still a supporter of the Conservative Party? You know, <laughs> I still I have some have some people in that party who love me, and I have some people in that party who hate me uh, because I will call us call the uh, Conservative Party out when I think they're doing something wrong. So I don't know. It, it shifts it depends on uh, the month and what's going on and who's leader. And I personally just leaning up to the convoy, I just feel like I'm done with politics. Just, it's not for me. Again, setting aside labels, how would you describe your political views in December, 2021 to January, 2022? Um, like I'm a downtown middle class or grew up middle class, uh, Canadian, uh, fiscal conservative, Libertarian on social issues, let's all get along, let's all talk to one another, and let's not get into these different echo chambers and silos, which is something that uh, I've seen worsen over the years. And I saw it particularly uh, on the university campus when I had my business there. 
So Miss Leach calls you, I, I forget you said what date you thought it was, but it was January 2022, and she asks you if you can come yeah. and assist with messaging and press releases. Um, I think we know from the evidence that you took her up on the request. Is that fair? Yep. Why did you want to participate in the convoy? Um, I would just, I was very uncomfortable with the mandates and the arrive can app and the, the data tracking. I know lots of truckers that were being affected by it. Uh, I'm vaccinated myself, but um, I saw the amount of stress that it was causing on people. And I figured if I can, I know where her frame is in terms of being very positive. And I figured um, it might work well together to get a positive mes message out there for peace, love, unity, and freedom, which are the four words I kept repeating over and over again. What day did you arrive in Ottawa? January 28th. And how did you get there? I drove. Your truck? No, no, I drove my car. I never, I, I because of the nature of my contract with my uh, owner operator, I can't, I can only, I only have insurance when I'm hooked up to a load. So I, uh, and I had no desire to bring my truck here. Did you consider at all whether or not you could find a truck or another commercial vehicle to bring with you, you know, in solidarity with the other truckers that had arrived? No, because my perspective, my, I was there to be messaging, right? And I figured I'm going to be spending all my time doing interviews and talking. I'm not, yeah, I'll try to get on the street and talk to people, but I wanted to just get maximum exposure and again, uh, convey that message of peace, love, unity, and freedom. What did you hope to achieve by participating in the convoy? I thought, I hoped we would uh, help to uh, convey, uh, we would affect some positive change and help bring some people together. And I got to tell you, on the 28th, it's amazing. We're in front of the Chateau Laurier. I see <clears throat> thousands of people walking across from into Quebec because we know how strict the regulations were in Quebec with Canadian and Fleur de Lis together signs that said liberty and freedom and they came up and they're on Parliament Hill and they're hugging these Albertan truckers and Saskatchewan truckers like everybody's finally getting along and so this this division of you know Quebec doesn't like Alberta and that, that was gone everybody was getting along and you know Keith stole one of my experiences and I'm glad he can conveyed it yesterday with these two truckers and Tim Hortons one was from Saskatchewan the other one was from Quebec and they were communicating via Google Translate. And they're hanging out, they're joking, it was amazing. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and so, again, you've said that you were there to assist with messaging and, and, and public relations, is that fair? Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. And uh, was there anyone else who was uh, working on, on that aspect of the organization? Yeah, I ultimately had a team of three people working with me as well in uh, my hotel suite, and we were one, the ones putting out most of uh, the press releases and messaging and all that sort of stuff. Okay. And as um, maybe if you could assist the commission and, and, and give us a sense of what it involved to be doing messaging and press release uh, and public relations. What, what, what did your day-to-day -day involve? Uh, lo scheduling lots of interviews. My, uh, my email and Twitter threads, uh, sorry, Twitter DMs, uh, social media, uh, direct messages. I was getting requests from all over the world, from every news agency imaginable and I was trying to figure out who can we go to where I know we'll get fair representation and compared with who's going to have um, enough engagement and enough views that will allow us to be effective. Um, and as the commission understands it, uh, you gave uh, some television interviews during the convoy, is that correct? Many. Um, and those included with outlets like Fox News? Uh, Tucker Carlson, Hannity, uh, Newsmax, did a lot of podcasts, Gad Sad, Jordan Peterson, Stephen Crowder, like just uh, I looked for what is what I what I believe is current media. And yeah. And you, as I understand, you also gave a, at least one interview with Russia Today. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I did. And you say uh, you gave interviews with what you view as current media. Could you just explain what you meant by that? Uh, yeah, so media that has been successfully able to leverage uh, alternative media platforms. So 
uh, we're not doing an interview with a media organization that's going to have 30,000 people watch at night and then it's not going to be uploaded anyways. There's no archival of it. So it's kind of a balance of uh, those newer platforms. And I actually, with Russia Today, I explained that. They're one of the, uh, like them or not, they were one of the platforms that was able to leverage both uh, online media as well as alternative media. Um, so when you say current media, you were looking for, in your view, the media that had the largest platforms or would reach the largest audience? Is that, is that That's what right. That would be the most effective, yeah, for sure. Um, and I understand that you uh, would not give interviews to uh, media organizations such as uh, the CBC, the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail. Is that correct? That's right. And why wouldn't you give interviews to those Canadian media? Well, for example, the Toronto Star uh, put out um, a meme, and I, I can't remember the exact cartoon, but it was completely defamatory of the, tr of the truckers. Um, you already saw some narratives coming out from established Canadian media trying to tie us to January 6th, which has nothing to do with this protest. And we saw in testimony here that there were text messages coming from the Prime Minister's office, which proved exactly that, so I was right. Um, we've heard some evidence from d different witnesses so far about uh, you having suffered some injuries uh, during, on your, on your way to Ottawa and during your time in Ottawa. I'll yeah. just give you an opportunity. Can you just explain exactly what happened and when it happened? So on February 4th, uh, somebody came into my room and said, the lawyers just did a video that's the complete opposite of our messaging. We call it the War of the Worlds video uh, now. And I looked at it and I was horrified. It was, come to, Ottawa, come to Ottawa, your freedoms are dying, Canada is dying here, like doom and gloom. Not peace, love, unity and freedom, which built the movement. So I went over to the Arc Hotel to explain my sentiments, and maybe a little aggressively, but <laughs> you know, there were so many problems going on at that time that's just another wrench that was thrown into the spokes of the wheel. And uh, as I went back after a 20, 30 minute long uh, meeting about a few issues, a number of issues what I'm sure we'll get into, um, I was presented with the class action suit and a retainer here. We're going to give you free legal advice if you guys sign it. So that was the nature of the meeting. And I went back to the Sheraton and I realized I left my laptop. I was so heated I didn't pull it out. So I went back and I slipped the first time I was going back and forth and finally uh, in a panic going to get my computer, my laptop, which is my life. Uh, I slipped on this massive thing of ice in front of the EDC building and uh, I slipped on the ice and I remember the exact moment, I still picture it, I was, it was 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night on the, the 4th approximately and there were a couple of trucks in the parking lane, a bunch of cars, the driving lanes were completely open. A couple of cars were parked in front of the Sheridan dropping people uh, off. And it was silent. There was no one around. And that's why when people honk him, like, it was dead silent. I felt very alone and secluded. It was weird. So I tried to get up. I heard a crack. I've never broken anything, but I'm wiggling my toes. I'm like, it's not broken. So, uh, but I couldn't get up. And I hear from the distance, uh, in front of the Ark Hotel, a trucker, a red suit, big beard, says, uh, you need help. And I'm like, I think so. And he's screaming. I'm like, yeah, I think so. So he comes over and he says, um, you need help. I'm like, yeah. He puts his hand on my, my ankle and he says, Jesus, Lord, God bless this ankle. Heal it now, thy father. And whatever. I'm like, I love you, man. But... <laughs> I was thinking of a paramedic. <laughs> and another guy is like, do you need help? I'm like, yeah, this time send a medic, please. And it was amazing because there was, you know, just an hour, there was so much friction. But, and this was a common thing. There was friction and then we get together. Friction, we get, so we, we were able to work out our differences when we needed to. They carried me on to the, into the Arc Hotel lobby. They put me uh, on the couch. They called the paramedics and everybody... Just, it was a serious moment. Everybody came back to help me 
Chad was by my side. Miranda was pumping me with drugs. I don't know she's given me. Uh, Bridget was there. The doctors came down to look at me to say uh, that um, that it's broken. So it was uh, it was an amazing. And then the paramedics got there in I don't know, 30, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And they said, yeah, it's broken. You need to go to the hospital. So I said, uh, okay, should I call an ambulance? They said, well, the problem is uh, you're not an important case. You're just a broken ankle. There's other people who have more serious cases. If you can call one, it might take about an hour or so. So I, I asked the, uh, our volunteers, and they said, yeah, we can, uh, one of us can drive you to the hospital. And Ottawa General, I'm telling you, Ottawa Hospital, 20 minutes from the hotel to having a, do a, a, a doctor cutting up my new jeans. Wow. It was crazy. It was great. Wow. So, so that, that was that incident, and then I'm going to return to a second. Were you also in a car accident, just briefly? Is that true? Uh, yes, I was the day before. Okay, so you had a bit of, a bit of run of bad luck. Um, <sighs> yeah, but there were other things on my mind. My mind was the messaging. We need to keep every, everybody ha happy and peaceful and all that sort of stuff, but yeah. So I want to pick up on the, uh, the context or the, what, what, what happened before you, you slipped and, and, and fell. Mm -hmm. um, you said that there had been a press conference on February 4th with, I think you said, the lawyers. Is that right? No, it wasn't a press conference. Okay. Somebody came in and said, uh, the lawyers put up a video uh, that's <laughs> doom and gloom, the opposite of our messaging. And I, and I said, what lawyers? Who? <laughs> Who, who are, what, what are you what lawyers are talking about? And that's when I went across to find out who these people were. Okay, so um, did you see the video yourself? Yes, I did. They okay. showed it to me. And did you recognize the lawyers in the video? No, no, I didn't. Who did you come to learn who the lawyers were? Uh, Keith Wilson. Okay, and so you were staying at the Sheridan Hotel? That's right. And you went to the Ark Hotel? Yeah. And why did you go to the Ark Hotel to Be find out who was in the video? Because that's where they were. And who's the they in this? Uh, so um, we, we had... Three different hotels, so the Sheridan became messaging. My team was dealing with that. The Arc Hotel was doing, I guess, logistics. That sort of there was always conflict there. And the Swiss Hotel, I think, was security communicating with the police, emergency lanes, all that sort of stuff. They actually had it. Took a while, but they got it pretty well organized. So I was told that they're at the Arc Hotel now. Go and see them. That's why they said the video. So I went there. And they are at the hotel. The the lawyers. Yeah. And then who did you meet at the hotel? Uh, Keith, um, Andre, um, uh, Eva, and Chad. I met him for the first time. There's a couple other people. I think Bridget came. Tamara came in about 15 minutes after, uh, after I had my heated exchange. There's maybe 10 people there. Okay, so yeah. Keith Wilson. Yeah. Eva Chipiuk. Yes. Andre Memo Memomari, I believe. Yes. Okay, uh, Chad Eros, yep. Bridget, Bridget Belton. Yes, and there's a couple other people from the board. I don't remember who. Okay. Um, and what, describe the conversation you had at that point in time. Um, I might have used some trucker words with, uh, with Keith to explain my uh, discontent that I just spent uh, almost three weeks of my life getting everybody on a message of peace, love, unity, and freedom. And it worked. People are here with hippie tie-dyes, there's people left wing, right wing, all wings just hanging out together. And uh, you just, I said to him, do you understand what you just did? Knowing, I have a brother in policing, two nephews in policing, like I, I understand that world a little bit. Uh, mood and behavior is what they're monitoring. They don't care what we say, it's mood and behavior. The mood and behavior was positive until right now. You just undid all of that. And he seemed concerned and he said, oh, oh, I'm." Sorry, like, well, and I should have thought that uh, before. Uh, anyways, that was it. And then the next thing was, well, you've just been served, congratulations, with a multi-million dollar lawsuit. And it's, what are you talking about? A class action lawsuit for what? For honking. It's, what honking? <laughs> it was the same night that it was, I broke my ankle. So you had this conversation with Mr. Wilson. You expressed your concern. Um, did, uh, uh, did, did, did. Did things improve after that in terms of Mr. Wilson's messaging? Uh, no, it, um, it seemed to be on the same trajectory. And I felt like one of the things that to look at the convoy itself, when people talk about the convoy organizers, 
there were many different groups, right? It wasn't just one group. And every different group had their own idea, but we were all converging on the idea of arrive can and, and the uh, mandates, but he seemed to be representing another group that wanted to go in a different direction. And what was your understanding of that direction? Uh, that it was counter to peace, love, unity, and freedom. And it was, it was weird. It was, um, it seemed to be coming from, you know, I started to put the pieces together after a couple of days that these people were politically connected in some way, shape, or form. And, um, you know, it, it, it just within a couple of days, we have, uh, or a few days later, we have uh, Keith Wilson and um, Randy Hillier's buddy, Tom Marazzo, and Doug Ford's buddy, Dean French, uh, setting up meetings with people in the city, uh, pretending to be negotiating some sort of deal. And what was shocking is nobody in the Ottawa police, in the mayor's office, uh, in the city council, did the most basic due diligence to see if these people possessed the position of moral persuasion that they could, talk, they could speak on our behalf. It was just really weird. Did you think that Mr. Wilson and Mr. Marazzo could speak, had, had a position of moral persuasion? No, I didn't, I don't think so. Why not? Um, just because, uh, firstly, for up until that point, on the GoFundMe was myself and Tamara, and that's why we were getting so much attention, so many people were reaching out, so many people knew who we were. I, I'm a trucker, so it's a little bit of a, you know, there's a culture amongst uh, truckers as well. These were lawyers that, I don't know, they seem to have some ulterior motive, or they seem to know people in politics that I don't know that they had, our, like they may, may have been organizing a deal um, with the city, but maybe they're, they're structuring a deal for Doug Ford, but it wasn't for the truckers. If that makes sense. So it sounds to me that um, you had a concern that they were they were pursuing political a, a political agenda and or ulterior motives. Is that fair? Yes, and it's one of those things you can't put your finger on it. You kind of you realize there's something going on, and these people are well connected. So do you think Mr. Wilson and Mr. Morazzo had the same goals as you in terms of ending the mandates? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think they were, their goals were ending the protests and get every, getting everybody out of the city as quickly as possible. Because when, when I first met Tom Morazzo, he said to me, <laughs> if, I thought we got somewhere, he said, listen, I'm just going to be here dealing with the trucks. I don't know who put him there. I, I don't, you know, there was very fluid all the time. Okay, fine. He said, I'm going to be uh, dealing with the trucks. I'm going to be a ghost. Nobody's going to know I was here. I will be invisible. And I thought, great, perfect. So finally, because every day we were dealing with different people setting up their own press conferences, we finally got that under control. I'm like, great. So I'll deal with the messaging. Uh, the trucks are parked, so I don't know what you want to do. You want to move trucks? That was a little suspect to me in the back of my head. But I just kind of left it there. And uh, then the next morning, <laughs> somebody comes into my, my uh, hotel to tell me, uh, Tom Morazzo, guess what he's doing? I'm like, what? A press conference. I'm like, it's less than 12 hours ago. He told me he's not going to. What is going on? And that's, uh, that's the cats we were trying to herd. Did you ever speak with Mr. Wilson or Mr. Razzo about the concerns you had about what they were doing? Uh, yes, yes, many times to everybody. I spoke to Tamara about it, and Tamara agreed with me. And she put out a number of messages to people. She was typing messages with me to tell people. She got on the phone, because this happened numerous times, telling people no comms or no communications goes out unless it's approved by Benjamin and his team. So that's with respect to who's doing the messaging, but that's right. your concerns that uh, uh, Mr. Marazzo and Mr. Wilson were uh, seeking to end the protests or find a way for the protest to end, is that something you ever brought to them and asked them about? Uh, I didn't say to them directly. I'm going to go to him and say, you're trying to sabotage the protest. I mean, then it's a little bit jumping the gun. It, the indicators seem to be there, but I can prove it, so... What did you do to try to understand if this is actually what they were trying to do? Um, what I wanted to do was just control the messaging first. Stop going out and doing press conferences. 
Uh, I remember when Keith said to me, uh, yeah, we're going to try and reach out to the city. And I remember saying, what are you reaching out to the city for? Just wait. Dance parties, barbecues, we're feeding the homeless. Just wait. So we have to have a press conference every day. I'm like, it's not a hostage negotiation. And you're the ones, because they agreed with me, that the legacy media just lies. So you're telling me the legacy media lies, yet you want to run to the legacy media and do a press conference every day. I'm like, just calm down. Everybody relax. We'll do a press conference at the end of any we every week, except for if something materializes and we need to do a press conference when the government brings some sort of representative who's going to speak with us. I can't hear they're talking. Sorry. Okay. You try and either uh, not talk or keep it down, please. Um, and uh, Mr. Dictor, if yes. we're translating all of this. Oh, sorry. Slow so down a bit. Please slow down. It's. Uh, My apologies. Yes. You know, you get excited, and that's okay. But I'm try and get excited with a slow. Speech. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. My apologies. So, Mr. Dictor, I've I've heard you know what you what you've said about dealing with the messaging and your approach to the messaging, um, and I understand your what you're saying with respect to I wasn't going to go to Mr. Wilson or Mr. Marazzo and say I you know I'm concerned you have ulterior motives. Are you trying to are you trying to uh, mm -hmm. end the protest? Did you raise that concern with Miss Leach, Mr. Barber, Miss Belton, anyone? who I presume you didn't have a concern about? Uh, with Tamara, for sure. And uh, Tamara and I spoke all the time. Um, there was a day and a half that I have to, had to leave from the when I left on the 30th, came back on the 2nd, ended up being the 3rd because of the car accident. I must have talked to her 25 times that day. Like, we were in constant communication. Me and Tamara had great communication during the entire time. And what did Miss Leach say in response to your concerns? Uh, I'll handle it. We'll take care of it. I'll talk to them. Uh, the The primary thing was the uh, the messaging, of course. But uh, when this whole idea of let's move trucks to Wellington, it's, I don't understand what what is the goal of that. I mean, I was just in some of these not the the streets in the middle of downtown that only had a few trucks on it. I didn't see these residential streets, and I'm sure. People will tell, give me some, you know, anecdotes of a street here and there that might have had a truck on it. Okay, that might be the case, uh, but that was not my experience. I just the whole idea of let's consolidate everything into Wellington. If the cops told us where to park. Chris Guerra was here for a week. He got maps from the Ottawa police saying park your trucks here because we wanted to have safety routes so safety vehicles could get through during the protest, emergency vehicles, and people could just generally drive around. Um, and I was driven around a couple of times. Uh, so I was in a car when I came in and out of the city. Like, I got an in and out of the city, no problem. And we'll get to the uh, the agreement with the mayor to move the trucks more in a moment. But okay. I, I, that, I, I understand that's what you're referring to when you're talking about moving trucks to Wellington. Um, and the evidence we've heard so far is that um, the mayor uh, wrote a letter saying that he would agree to meet with some of the organizers if the organizers uh, were able to show that they could move trucks out of the residential areas onto Welling and perhaps else, uh, perhaps elsewhere. In it. And we'll get to how that came about in a moment. But ultimately, at some point, you did you learn that Miss Leach had entered into that agreement with the mayor? No, I didn't know that she got into that agreement until. Like during the convoy, I don't even remember seeing that. It was all really opaque. So it was, we're doing a deal. What? We're taking care of it. Okay, well, that's the inverse of the way it's supposed to work. you got to tell the messaging people first so we can communicate it to people. Because all that would do is that would heighten potentially conflict and anxiety of the protesters, protesters who've been sitting out there freezing all day. I need to be able to tell them what's happening. But they wouldn't do that, no matter how much I tried. Right, but at some point you learned that Tamara had sent those letters. I appreciate, and we'll, I mean, we'll probably speak to a moment, you, you, that it may be the case you didn't understand what was happening at the time, but at some point you learned that, yes, Tamara had exchanged letters with the mayor. I don't remember seeing it during the convoy. I might have, and just amongst the thousands of messages, it just in and out, I, I okay, great, and forgot about it because we're dealing with so much other stuff. Have you ever spoken with Miss Leach about the agreement that she reached with the mayor? 
Uh, no, I haven't spoken to Miss Leach since I gave her a hug in my hotel room uh, the night before she was arrested. And because I didn't want to put her at any risk. And I knew the slightest uh, misstep that she would be targeted. So Miss um, Leach was arrested uh, after the agreement with the mayor and after February 14th, when we've heard evidence of moving trucks onto Wellington. In that last time you spoke with Miss Leach, did you ask her at all about whether or not she had agreed with the mayor to move trucks up onto Wellington? No, I was because I was so focused on messaging. I just had done, uh, that was when I did the statement on Jordan Peterson's podcast to clarify that we are not here to overthrow the government. We are, that's what elections are for. We hope that our uh, parliamentarians and our media tone down the rhetoric. Uh, she was really stressed. So Tamara was coming in, um, infrequently different days two three times sometimes once a day sometimes not at all she would she would disappear and it's because she was under tremendous amount of stress uh not only this class action suit that we were all uh given we didn't know what to do everybody was scared and we were being told we had to behave in a certain way or else we're going to lose our free legal advice but at the same time uh every three seconds she was getting hounded with another problem here, another problem there. And I did communicate to her and I said, Tamara, uh, we need to get you a handler. And she didn't want to. She wanted to deal with people directly, which I get, that's her strength. She really communicates well with people. Um, but she, I mean, you know what decision fatigue is. I, I'm, she had decision fatigue by early morning. She was just burnt out because there was so many demands that were being put on her. I put a little bit of a moat around me I had the three people in the, the comms team working with me, and I said, everything, send it to us, and we'll filter it. Otherwise, we won't be able to, to deal with a million problems all at once. But her uh, management um, uh, structure or system is different than mine, I guess. Um, and, and just to further that, so she would come into my room uh, to give her a hug and to relax and calm down. The world's not falling. Everything's going to work out. The government's not evil. They're problematic, but we have a lot of love around us. And I, don't know, I just remember we did a bunch of those little sessions where we focused on all the good things. So I, again, I, I take it you, uh, you see Ms. Leach as one of the organizers of the, the convoy, is that correct? Yeah, one of them. Mr. Barber? One of them as well, yeah. Uh, Ms. Belton? Yeah, one of them as well. Anyone else who you think was sort of a key organizer or played an important role? There's so many people that um, that I wouldn't even know because there were so many. I remember I went to a, a road captain meeting. I went and crutched in the snow to, over to the ark because no one would come over to me. I'm like, okay, let me just go sit down with all of them. There were 40 people in the room. I had no idea who half those people were, but they were leading different convoys from uh, around the country. It was great. They're, they're amazing people from all over different cultures of Canada. Um, so... It's, it's not a group of two or three people. There were hundreds of people. And then there were all these other little groups as well. It's a very, you know, the parallels to Bitcoin, very decentralized. And, uh, but I think we had the greatest, what I mentioned before, uh, position of moral persuasion that we could uh, help influence people more. But that's not a guarantee. And that actually came up on the 18th when the road captains came into my hotel after a trucker had guns drawn out him, his, they smashed his windows, they, the police pulled guns on him, arrested him in the snow. Uh, Tamara had been arrested, Chris had been arrested. The road captains came into my uh, room. There seemed to be, I don't know if a lack of leadership, but maybe a lack of decision making, or they needed just another head to bounce ideas off of. And they told me the story, and I said, okay, well, I'll support what you guys want to do. But if you're asking me, if the police are getting violent, maybe it's time to leave. And to my surprise, the first person to pipe up was Bridget. And she said, we can't let people get hurt. We need to leave. And then Joe did the same thing. And all the other road captains that were sitting on my bed and standing up and Johnny and everybody said, yeah. And I said, OK, call your police liaison officers right now. Don't argue. Just tell them we're going to leave. We're going to go. We're going to communicate the message to everybody that we're going to leave. Um, and then I went on to social media and I did 
Uh, I echoed that sentiment in a Twitter message that I probably should have done a thread to clarify it better, but a little bit of a panic. And then Keith Wilson called me and said, you need to leave. I said, well, I need to, <laughs> I'm in a wheelchair with a broken ankle. What do you think of the bust down the doors of the hotel and arrest me? And uh, he said, they just might. I'm like, Keith, don't be so dramatic. That's not, I'm, I'm not on the street, but he argued with me for 20 minutes. And he convinced me, he said to me, I always, you know, I always remember, he said, somebody needs to be able to speak up for freedom. And if you get arrested too and end up getting subject to a gag order, then you can't speak. And I thought like, all right. And so I had a friend in Ottawa and uh, I called an Uber. I got out of the hotel, the red zone, which is what the police wanted to clear out. And I went to stay with my friend until I could get my cast off. Um, <clears throat> When you arrived in Ottawa, were you aware that Pat King had had involvement in organizing the travel of the convoy across Canada to <laughs> Ottawa? January 24th or 25th, the first day that Tamara left Ottawa, my social media lights up and I see some videos from this guy, Pat King. Never heard of him. I called Tamara, said, who's this guy? She says, oh, he's some blogger from, uh, I don't know, wherever he was. She, I said, okay, he's got to go. Uh, we can't have this sort of rhetoric. Peace, love, no, no, this, this is not for here. So I don't know who he is. Tell him he's got to go. And there was a lot, there was some back and forth, a follow-up call. She con confirmed the videos. She ended up telling him, she told me, she told him to leave. And he was very upset, but he said, fine, if I'm not welcome here, I'll go home. And I said, great, nothing personal but we can't have that sort of rhetoric here. And then the next day or two, I don't know what was going on behind the scenes because they were driving across the country. I was in Ontario preparing, doing messaging. And um, uh, she said to me, yeah, we, he said he was going to leave. And then he showed up at the next trucker stop. I'm like, well, you got to deal with this. I don't know what to tell you. So. And when you talk about Mr. King's rhetoric, uh, what, what rhetoric? Uh, I don't know if he was trying to be comedic. I don't know if he was serious, but uh, some offensive rhetoric to myself and, uh, well, not to me personally, but to certain ethnic groups, uh, indigenous ethnic groups, Jewish groups, whatever. And then uh, I saw the vid first I saw his bullets. I, I don't know who, I just stopped in the middle. I, I too much, let's get rid of this. Were you able to see Mr. King's testimony yesterday? I did. Okay, and uh, some statements were put to him, including uh, statements he made about Indigenous people, um, statements uh, he made about uh, a a Asians. Is, is that what you're referring to? Uh, yes. Is, is, do you remember, were those the social, were those the postings that you saw yep. at the time? Okay. Yep. And I take it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, con uh, were you concerned, uh, did you, did you, let me put it to you this way. Um, were you concerned about the fact that the, the substance of those statements, did they offend you, or were you concerned about those statements would be associated with the convoy, or was it both? I personally don't get offended very easily. I got th thick skin, and I think people who say silly things should be able to say, say silly things, and we should be able to respond to them. Uh, I didn't really care about that. I really cared uh, that he would negatively impact... Um, the the tenor of the convoy, the mood of the people. It might cause. I was worried that he would cause some unnecessary anxiety. You know, when I was thinking about how are we going to envision this protest, a little too personal. Well, personal, but I thought of. Don't laugh at me. I thought of when I was younger, going to Grateful Dead concerts or Fish concerts or Almond Brothers or or Bob Dylan. That that vibe of peace and love, especially the Grateful Dead, without the drugs, because I'm not into drugs. <laughs> and I thought that's, that's the feeling that we need for this protest to bring everybody together. And I was worried that these sorts, this sort of rhetoric, which is completely inappropriate, uh, just did not marry to what we were trying to achieve. So, uh, and, and as, as discussed with Mr. King, the media reported on some of his past rhetoric um, some of his past statements. Um, the media also reported on statements you had made in the past. Are you, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes. 
Yes. And in, in particular, there was reports that, uh, in, in this case from the Globe and Mail, that at some point in 2018, you gave a speech to the People Par People's Party of Canada in which you alleged that Isla Islamic front groups were infiltrating the country's political institutions, and they quote you as saying, quote, the adaptation of political Islam is rotting away at our society like syphilis. Do you know the media report I'm referring to? The, specific, the Globe and Mail, I, didn't, I don't remember. It's been a few years, but yes, in general, yeah, I do. Is that something you said in 2018? Yes, and I entered my testimony in the Ontario legislature into evidence in this hearing where I quoted quoted uh, numerous uh, imams that were quite extreme in their rhetoric about Jews and the gay community. And amongst LGB Tory, there were a lot of people that supported us that were part of our group that were really concerned about that sort of rhetoric. So I stand by the statements. Did you have any concern, and I appreciate you stand by the statements, but do you have any concern about how those statements might affect the Freedom Convoy given your role in the convoy? Uh, no, no I didn't. Um, as you've noted, in, uh, uh, you, provided con you provided context to those statements in the legislature, is that correct? Yeah, in the Ontario legislature. Okay. Um, at the time, did you take any steps to contact the media who were reporting on those statements and provide the context you provided the legislature and now provided today? No, I mean, I look at during the, con the I mean, my uh, skepticism for uh, legacy media is quite high. And w I saw during the convoy, a headline from the same newspaper that the truckers are uh, weaponizing freedom in the name of white supremacy or something like that. And I just kind of, at this point, I dismiss it all. I really, I really don't care what you write. The commission has heard uh, a fair bit of evidence about uh, Mr. King's role, and we've spoken about Mr. King and also about uh, Mr. James Bowder. Um, as someone who was involved in the organization, uh, in your view, how influential were Mr. King and Mr. Bowder to the convoy? I don't even know what James Bowder looks like. I've never seen him before. Um, I so He had some MOU thing that was written in 2019. I thought it was a meme. It was a joke. Like, that's not how people are serious about litigation and political change, right? So I just dismissed him. Uh, there was the other guy, Jeremy McKenzie, who's been my personal troll because I'm a Jew for the past several years. And these are all people that have almost zero following, but the, the legacy media seems to be wanting to make these people who have very little or nothing to do with the convoy into celebrities. That's why I was really concerned that uh, in the case of McKenzie, that he's being asked to testify here. Why? And nothing to do, it's not a trucker, had nothing to do with the convoy. There's just rhetoric. Do we want to make him famous? Like, I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. When you say Mr. McKenzie was your personal troll, can you expand on that? Yeah, he... Um, uh, he see, has made several comments throughout the years uh, about Jewish conspiracy theories. He, I, I laughingly say he makes Mel Gibson look like a rabbi. Uh, he is really, really aggressive towards Jews. Whatever, that's fine. I don't really care. And uh, while I was producing a podcast several years ago, uh, this woman who is a, a Saudi refugee uh, who grew up over, uh, under extremism, uh, she was a doctor, and moved to Canada. And uh, he was harassing her online, he was harassing me online, like that's what he does. Uh, apparently that's comedy. Whatever, fine. Do you think what Mr. McKenzie does is comedy? No. What do you think it is? I think we, we're living in this era where there are people, they, when they want to, when they say something that is uh, extreme rhetoric, then they say, oh, it's just comedy. But when it's, you know, digestible, then they say, oh, I'm, this is serious. They want it both ways. Um, and I think he kind of, he goes in that category. And that's why these people have such small followings. But again, there are, there are personalities in the media that want to elevate these, uh, these individuals. It just makes no sense when people say, oh, they have, you know, 20,000 followers. Firstly, that's not very much. And secondly, yeah, he would have two if it weren't for you. Keep talking about him. The Streisand effect, right? I'm going to return now, and we, we, got, we got to it already a bit, but I just have a few more questions about the agreement that was reached between Ms. Leach and the mayor and, and uh, some of the events that's surrounding that. So um, the, the, the mayor and Ms. Leach exchanged letters on February 12th. 
Um, on February 13th, there was a news report that came out saying that the agreement that was reflected in those letters had been reached. And then if we could pull up COM 831. And so this is a tweet uh, from your Twitter account. If we can scroll down, you can see the timing, just so we can scroll down to the bottom, from 8.24 p.m. Uh, and if we could scroll up, it says, more fake, and this is, you're referencing the, the media report I referenced, it says, more fake news, this time from City TV News. No deal has been struck. The federal government has not yet lifted its mandates and passports. Do not watch hashtag fake news. It's bad for your mental health. <laughs> this is completely false. Why did you send that tweet? From the original time that I was told by Keith that he's going to reach out to the, the city, I mentioned before, and I said, why? Just wait for the government to, the, you know, they will come to us. Uh, but no, just went over my head, went over, um, my sense from the rest of the board is that they felt the same way. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they told them differently, but that was not my sense. So throughout uh, that week, I would yeah, maybe tease Keith a little bit. We actually had a pretty good working relationship, which is why I was shocked yesterday. And um, I would say to him, so Keith, <laughs> Keith how's the deal gone? <laughs> and he would say, oh, well, not, not great. And on February the 13th, uh, I did the same thing. I said to Keith, uh, how's the deal going? And he says, not great. So either he was lying to me or he was lying in this scenario. I don't know. And then that night, I went on to, I was starting to go into Twitter spaces to communicate with people. And I just got uh, destroyed. I, sorry, I got attacked by a couple of thousand people in a Twitter space. You're a bunch of sellouts. Uh, Randy Hillier put out a tweet. So I, I don't know if you can't convince Randy Hillier, Tom Ratzo's buddy, that we have a deal. Then how have we convinced the city or anybody else there's a deal? But okay, fine. And uh, so I sent a message to uh, Keith the following morning. And I said, Keith, I just got attacked last night. I think I get everybody calmed down and whatever. What's the status of uh, this deal so I can put an end to it? I can't remember how I worded it exactly. And he said, neither Eva nor myself have drafted anything for the city. More rumors. Okay. So everything is the same as I have been told the entire way throughout. That's fine. So if we, if we could pull up BJD uh, 6017. And this is a document that you provided to the commission, I believe, yesterday. Okay. Yeah. What was the date of the tweet we just saw? It's uh, February 13th at uh, 8.24 p.m. I must have the wrong number. Um, perhaps I'll, I, I, I think we have the message you're referring to. Um, I, I, I don't have the number now. It, maybe I have an opportunity to show it to you and confirm that's the message. But so you, uh, you had a text exchange with Mr. Wilson or a messaging exchange. Signal, yeah. Signal exchange with Mr. Wilson on the 14th when you said what's going on. And he said there's been, been nothing with the mayor. And again, we will, when we have the opportunity, we'll pull that up. Um, my question for you now is, between when you read the news article that you tweeted about and when you tweeted about it, did you ask anyone whether the news article was true or make any inquiries about the news article? No, just, just out of uh, time being overwhelmed with stuff. And, you know, I already communicated my uh, skepticism on uh, legacy media. And I'm getting it directly from the source. I'm getting it from our lawyers who's telling me, no deal. I mean, I know right, they... Right, right, but your lawyer told you that on the 14th, not on the 13th when you tweeted it out. No, no, no. What I say, I spoke to him on the 13th oh, as well. Oh, sorry. That before. So during the... I did another, so how's that deal going? And he says, not so good. Okay, fine. And went late at night into the Twitter space and then re had to reconfirm it again the next day. So uh, that conversation you had with Mr. Wilson on the 13th, was that in writing or was that... No, face to face. I think it was in my hotel room, if I'm not mistaken, um, or the adjacent room. We were always in and out. Um, 
I would sometimes go to the other hotel rooms, uh, Tamara's and the others, or they would come to me. And then if we could pull up COM 841. So the first, uh, your tweet, which uh, is, is there, uh, says more fake news from City TV, no deal has been struck. And then we see this is a retweet by Tamara Leach, uh, or sorry, from Miss Leach's account, which I think is an important distinction as yep. we get to uh, three minutes later, uh, in which Miss um, Leach's account says the media lies to their viewers, no quote deal has been made, and the mandates and the passports. That's why we are here. Um, the commission has, has, has heard and received evidence that it, you had access to Ms. Ms. Leach's Twitter account and that you were the one who made this tweet. Oh, from the very beginning. Yeah, she asked me to take over. The, she didn't know Twitter very much. She did Facebook. She said, you deal with Twitter. Fair enough. And did you, did then you do this retweet from her account? Yes, and it was very important because what was happening, this, remember I explained earlier, I was trying to go for peace, love, unity, and whatever. And there seemed to be another counter-narrative that was creating anxiety. And people were starting to attack Tamara, myself, everybody, your sellouts. I never got my money for gas. What do you do? You can see the tenor already of frustration was building up. So I needed to communicate to everybody that no, relax, nothing has changed. If it is, we'll let you know, kind of was my, my thought, but you could already see the anxiety being ramped up. And I, the last thing we could have was any sort of conflict and violence, and that's what I, that's why I was trying to echo that statement until we get something substantive. If we got a deal in writing and said, "Here we are," okay, fine, that's a different story, but uh, that never materialized. You were in regular contact with Miss Miss Leach. Oh yeah, for sure. Is there any reason you didn't speak with her before you sent out this tweet? No, because we had a communication teams of myself and two other people, so all the comms were amongst us um, on the you know the Twitter side, which became a primary platform that we were using. And you know, if we were doing that on every little tweet, then we would get nothing done. And Tamara didn't have much interest in Twitter. I noticed was it that day with around that time, like she would do a positive good morning message. I saw those would pop up periodically. So she had access to the accounts as well, right? And, um, but that's about it. And I guess because she was overloaded, she was dealing with so many other things and she was, I think, primarily on Facebook, if I'm not mistaken, which I wasn't on. So, uh, Mr. Commissioner, I've come in my time. If I could have f five more minutes just to address one more uh, document and then one more item. Okay, and uh, you'll come back to that one document. You wouldn't... Yes, if, okay. uh, yeah. Actually, why don't we do that document right now? So it's BJD18. I was one digit off. My apologies, Mr. Dictor. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> so on the screen, uh, this... Uh, this appears to be a message uh, you've provided to us. I take it this is the message that you sent Mr. Wilson on Signal. Yeah. And then if we scroll down, we have his response. Yeah. Is that what you were referring to? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Wilson has uh, both given testimony and also uh, had an interview with the commission. Um, and in his interview, Mr. Wilson stated that uh, you were, at least to his understanding, aware that an agreement had been reached uh, with the mayor, between the mayor and Tamara, and he expressed some surprise uh, that, you, uh, that you sent your tweet and Tamara's retweet. Um, and specifically, Mr. Wilson has uh, uh, identified this, the following document as evidencing that knowledge, uh, HRF 1491, HRF... Four zeros one four nine one. So we'll scroll down. You'll see that um, this is February twelfth at three forty seven in the afternoon. 
Um, Mr. Wilson writes you, uh, the middle paragraph says, hence the drafting committee will keep working on the broader document for review by the board tomorrow. But in the meantime, below is a draft communication for the captains slash truckers specific to the mayor's arrangements to allow you to advance into Wellington and, and Elgin while at the same time taking away the excuse that Trudeau wants to unleash the police goons and seize trucks. Remember, we are trying to block Trudeau from having the justification to cause the police to use the new emergency powers against the truckers and to allow the truckers to stay here in Ottawa for as long as it takes, et cetera. And then if you scroll up, sorry, to the top, you then replied uh, shortly afterwards saying, looks good to me. What did you understand Mr. Wilson to be talking about in his email when you responded, looks good to me? This was a communication to the Premier's office, was my understanding, is that they were going to be drafting something for Doug Ford, they're making some headway with him, and uh, that's how it was communicated. Okay, fine, uh, good to me. If we get a response, they want, they're finally going to talk to us on the provincial level, that's progress. In Mr. Wilson's email, he says... Um, uh, below is a draft communication for the captain slash truckers specific to the mayor's arrangement to allow us to advance into Wellington and Elgin. What did you understand that to mean? Uh, the, in terms of the mayor's arrangement, I don't know. I don't know the details because, again, everything was opaque, that I wasn't told any specifics or details whatsoever. Did you take any steps to learn what Mr. Wilson was talking about in that email? No, this is what I was trying to do as I explain with the messaging, not step on everybody's toes. This is the drafting or the legal committee. Okay, fine. You're going to do what you can. If you bring, have something signed, whatever, send it to me when you have something prepared and whatever and let me know. And my final question for you, Mr. Dichter, is you referenced um, that you had a a good working relationship with Mr. Wilson and you were surprised uh, by his testimony yesterday. Other than what we've spoken about, is there anything else that surprised you? Yeah, well, there was one caveat which I started to, you know, people say things and you put the red flag up in the back of your head. So with the class action suit, there were um, the injunctions and motions put forward and whatever. Okay, we already signed off with him and the JCCF Turns out a retainer was with the JCCF. They were going to go, okay, fine. And he came back and he said to me, uh, and all of us individually, but he remember saying to me, okay, so I have good news. We got a, a number of items that the class action suit uh, wanted, the people on the, the, com the complainants wanted, and they've all been rejected uh, with one exception. The one exception is the horn honking has to be limited in scope into one designated area. And I said to him, who cares about the horn honking? Like, that's not what we're here for. We're here for mandates, whatever. And that's how he communicated it to me. And that, that was it. So then what I didn't tell him is I took that document and I sent it to a friend of mine who is a legal researcher at a firm. And I said, this is what I was told this document says. I don't read legalese. Can you just interpret it? Uh, because he's saying that the media is lying, that we actually won. What is your interpretation? And she said to me, I don't know who's telling you uh, you won. Uh, they wanted the, uh, the horns stopped or whatever. That was the part of the injunction. And uh, they won. So whoever's telling you you won is not being honest with you. And I thought, is he just overselling it? because he's trying to be compassionate and he knows we're under a lot of stress? Or was it uh, just dishonest? I don't know. I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt at that time. But maybe he's just trying to be supportive in some sort of way. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Commissioner? Sorry. Yes. Would I be able to um, submit my application for Rule 59 to have... Uh, some more leading testimony from my, uh, from my lawyer. The normal is your lawyer will do it at the end, and that's when I would do it. I mean, I, unless there's any particular reason to do it now, um, I would suggest we do it at the end, which is the normal. If, if uh, Mr. Commissioner, if you're going to make us pick between now or the end, I think you're right, the end is better. 
I think what Mr. Dichter is suggesting that I be able to ask a couple questions now, um, uh, leading questions, and at the end uh, have the opportunity to close with non-leading questions, as per Rule 59. And how long do you propose to be? Um, at this time, uh, five minutes. Five minutes of some leading questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, are there any objections or concerns? So, uh, um, oh, sorry. I, I do have a concern. Um, perhaps I had misunderstood. I understand that counsel for the witness, who is not a party, now wants to ask him leading questions. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? Yes, he's, he's, we, I denied uh, the right to, or the right, the, uh, the application to have uh, his counsel lead the evidence. And now he seeks to have five minutes to do that. There may be some additional at the end. Um, and uh, so that's what it's, it's being proposed. And if they would be leading questions for five minutes. So I guess I would oppose it because if he was not given standing, then I question why he's allowed to examine his uh, clients. Um, and I guess further to that, if he is allowed to examine his client, why would he be allowed to ask him leading questions as opposed to non-leading questions? So, Mr. Commissioner, uh, just for your assistance and for the assistance of the, the parties and the public, uh, I'll rule, I just want to read what read, rule, read what the rule, rule 59 yeah. says. So rule 59 says that if a representative for a witness intends to adduce evidence in chief not adduced by commission counsel, the representative will examine the witness immediately following commission counsel and then will have a right to re-examine the witness following questions by the other parties. There is no reference to leading or non-leading in the rule. Okay. So... Um, with that clarification, I, I suppose he can ask his questions now, but I would suggest that what's contemplated and what's fair is that the questions be asked in a non-leading fashion. Uh, he obviously doesn't have the right to cross-examine his client. Okay, well, I guess it's, uh, there's some uncertainty in the rule. Uh, what a surprise. Um, so uh, I think what I'll do is I will let the questions go, and if there's a problem, we'll deal with them. But I think it's preferable to get that evidence out so before the parties do their cross-examination. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, I'd like to point um, the witness to BJD 40. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, BRB40, my mistake. Mr. Dichter, do you uh, recognize the screenshot? Uh, yes, I do. That oh. is the group, one of the group chats in Signal where we were communicating myself Tamara, the lawyers, the board. And what, um, who was part of this group chat? Uh, like I said, most of the board that were involved, Chad, uh, Keith Wilson, Eva, Tamara, um, uh, Chris Guerra, like all of us were in it. And this echoes uh, the same sentiment of the other text message. Um, you made a statement in that group chat on uh, February 14th at 6.51 a.m. talking about how um, you were being accused of certain things from supporters on your Twitter space the night before or early morning, depending yep. on how you look at it, 1 a.m. But what was the response to your... Um, if we can scroll down, we can see a response to Mr. Dichter's statement there. Uh, can you read that out for the commission? Yeah, from Tamara. I haven't seen any statement yet, so don't worry about meeting at 9. If I hear anything, I will let you know. Where was uh, Mrs. Leach uh, staying uh, during the protest? Uh, the Sheridan. Where were you staying during the protest? In the Sheridan. What floor were you on? The 16th floor. What floor was she on? 
I think the 14th, but I might have that wrong. How often did you guys see each other? Uh, frequently. There were a couple of days where she wasn't around, but frequently. Did she ever mention to you in those frequent interactions that she was working on or had reached any kind of deal with the mayor? No, and if, uh, if she did, I forgotten it, but I don't think I would forget that. And, and this uh, exchange on the group chat seems to confirm that? That's right. Um, Mr. Commissioner, am I allowed to ask about the email uh, HRF 1491 that Mr. Mather was asking Mr. Dichter about just now? A different uh, aspect of the uh, content? If, if you like. So uh, far sure. you haven't been leading, so... HRF 1491. Try avoiding leading, and that makes it easier. I'll do my best. If we can scroll down, um, this was referenced in Mr. Wilson's testimony yesterday. Uh, he suggested to the commission that this was your sign-off on a deal. Can you read the first sentence or a line of the first sentence of the second paragraph of this email from Mr. Wilson. Uh, hence, the drafting committee will keep working on the broader document for review by the board tomorrow. But in the meantime, below is a draft communication for the captain's truckers specific to the mayor's arrangement to allow us to advance into Welling Street and Elgin, while at the same time taking away the excuse that Trudeau wants to unleash the police goons and seize trucks. Did a draft communication ever follow? No. Did you receive any other email? Not that I'm aware of, no. Can we scroll down to the attachment that was with this email? Can you have a quick review of this uh, attachment document, Mr. Okay. Dichter? <laughs> Let me know when you're done. Yeah. Does this look like a document uh, that's a deal or a contract between two parties? Uh, no. Well, that was my whole point. There's no witness, signature, date, nothing. It's just... Just a letter. What is this? Like in your experience as a communications person, what is this document? Public relations. Like a press release? Mm -hmm. Okay. If um, I can ask the attention, uh, the commission to pull up a document that I'm uh, BJD 12th. It's an article in the Toronto Sun. Um, uh, talking about um, Dean French working on a deal. If we can scroll down to, I think, the fourth page. Um, some text, uh, maybe go up. Um, okay, down, sorry. The next line in the article. Um, Maybe it's page three. Sorry to have you fishing. There's an article in this uh, document, Mr. Dichter. Have you seen this article? Yes, I have. Where Mr. French gives his public perspective. Yes. And he's on the protest. And he says on page six of the document, I don't believe in protesting or honking on residential streets. Do you know who Dean French is? Uh, he is Doug Ford's former chief of staff and uh, friend since the 1990s. How did he end his tenure as a chief of staff to the premier? Uh, he resigned in disgrace. Did you read or hear um, the mayor's testimony on Dean French? Yes, and you know, I was confused when he thought he was a credible person that he could reach out to. And the other problem is, how do you have somebody negotiating on behalf of the truckers who's not a trucker, who's connected to the premier's office, who's critical of the trucking protest? Former chief slowly testified that the mood on the ground 
was a powder keg. If the truckers heard that their interests were being represented by the first chief of staff of the premier, who was responsible for most of the mandates in Ontario at a provincial level, how would the mood have changed on the ground, or did it change when reports came out that it was Dean French talking to the mayor and Mr. Wilson and Mr. Marazzo? That's where you saw some of the conflict, and I can understand where Chief Slowly might have interpreted the powder keg issue because, again, I said before, the mixed messages. Uh, you want to go to a trucker and say, hey, yeah, the guy who brought in your provincial mandates, uh, he's negotiating a deal for you guys to leave. Uh, which is not a deal, that's capitulation. Uh, a deal is both sides get something and we would have gotten nothing. They, that would have, these are the sorts of things that were causing uh, so much anxiety and division. Furthermore, you know, the first week was really stressful. Uh, we were overloaded. We had far more people than we imagined would be here. And it took about a week to get everybody finally on the organizational side of all the different groups slowly to talk together or at least decide go your separate ways in some scenarios and then this started and the level of distrust all of a sudden came back again okay i think your time is up mr uh, caralius so uh i'm, I'm uh, gonna ask you to wrap up this part of your uh your questioning you asked for five minutes. I've already given you much more. Am I allowed one more question, Mr. Commissioner? Yes. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a War of the Worlds video. You mentioned dealing with a Jordan Peterson podcast, I think, talking about how we're not here to uh, overtake the government. Specifically, is the uh, War of the Worlds video that you're talking about um, uh, submitted uh, a video of Mr. Wilson BJD8 and the uh, reason that you felt you needed to explain that you guys weren't here uh, was in response to the February 8th press conference of uh, Tom Marazzo, correct? That's right. Um, Mr. Wilson yesterday testified that when he met Tom Marazzo, he was uh, very impressed with his calm demeanor uh, I'll ask the commission to pull up um, um, a video, BJD 17, uh, it's 20 seconds starting at 340. Tom Marazzo, give it up. It's going to go ahead to 340 because it's a long uh, video. I live in my car. I lost everything. And you guys won't even shut your mouths for two minutes and let me get some sense into your heads. Just stop. Just stop. Check your ego. Thank you. I think, uh, I think that's all we need. Okay. I'm sure Mrs. Uh, Ms. Zexy Lee will be very proud of Mr. Rat Marazzo talking about supporters of the I'm uh, not protest. sure you're here to give evidence. So. Mr. Dichter. Um, um, uh, what can you say about um, Mr. Marazzo's demeanor uh, in the context of Mr. Wilson saying yesterday uh, he found I, him a good negotiator? I think we're going to close this off at the moment. Uh, you, I gave you a question. You've done more, so we'll okay. put off. If we can deal with Thank further you, questioning at the end if need be. Okay? So we'll take uh, the uh, morning break and come back in 15 minutes. <laughs> The Commission is in recess for 15 minutes. La Commission est levée pour 15 minutes. Freedom in 2022 is certainly about being able to make free choices for ourselves and for our family.
who we believe are the best. We have seen so much suffering over the last two years. People who die alone in terrible conditions, people losing dream jobs, polarized families, and a society that insult and yell at each other for making a different medical choice. But people have risen, and it will be through them that the future will have an important meaning for all of you, but especially for the next generation. Ruben News has been present at every step of this great challenge, but so many other pioneers whom you could meet and hear at our great conference about freedom for our beautiful country, which is Canada. This conference, which will be held in Calgary and Toronto, will show you the faces of the influence of freedom that you have seen over the past two years. You don't want to miss this. So get your ticket now at ribbonnewslive.com. And it will be a pleasure to see you there and meet you in large numbers. It's time to drop these masks and let the truth shine. Hello everyone, William Diaz here with Rebel News. This week, the nation heard from former Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly as he testified the Public Order Emergency Commission. Uh, Slowly had the lengthiest appearance before the inquiry today, two full days in total. The Emergency Measures Act inquiry is taking place in Ottawa from October 13 to November 25th because Justin Trudeau used a never-seen-before anti-terrorism law on peaceful protesters who were protesting the federal government's uh, COVID-19 measures. And the inquiry is built into the act to ensure no authoritarian leader uses it unnecessarily. To follow and support our independent coverage, please visit truckercommission.com. Soli had an important role during the beginning of the convoy, as he was the police chief in place when the truckers entered the city. He then resigned the day following the invocation of the Emergencies Act by Justin Trudeau's cabinet on February 15, which is the reason why we're here today. Now, Chief Slowly's testimony went back and forth with him, appearing sympathetic and under extreme pressure and being undermined, but then appearing hard-handed and intolerant of the peaceful truckers using the same language as his replacement to describe the demonstrators as violent. And there's a lot to unpack. Do you feel that they were misunderstood? Yes. Can you elaborate on that? I think I've given this testimony in parliamentary standing committees. Um, the level of disinformation and misinformation was off the charts. It was crushing to the members' morale. It was crushing to the incident command team's morale. It was crushing to my executive team's morale. I suspect it was crushing to the board. It was crushing to everybody. It was unrelenting. It was 24 hours a day. And I think by the end of the weekend, it had become a global story that mainstream media was following. On the first day of his testimony, former Chief Slowly began crying when he was asked a question about the morale of his officers on the ground in Ottawa, which isn't surprising as according to Slowly's testimony, he seemingly couldn't satisfy anyone. And there's a reason for that. To handle the convoy, no policing solution was needed as there was no violence taking place and the protest was officially not declared a riot since no one invoked the riot act. It was not an illegal public gathering. The convoy needed a political solution that Slowly could not offer However, all three levels of government, federal, municipal and provincial, decided to delegate all the responsibilities to the police. Unlike politicians, chiefs of police in Canada, since they aren't elected, are accountable to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and to the law. Whereas politicians are accountable to the population and at elections, Slowly was receiving political pressure from the three levels of government, as we previously mentioned. Even though politics should not be mixed with policing, in addition to that, you had the left thinking the police weren't doing enough. And then you also had the right that thought they were doing too much and playing with fire when it came to respecting civil liberties of protesters. And a police chief usually has to remain non-political. But when you have all the pressure from all sides, plus different levels of government, I believe it is understandable how it can be crushing. 
We also learn later that the cabinet explicitly consulted him prior to invoking the Emergencies Act. Because they would give us more powers and we didn't have any resources to implement those powers and then we would be accused again of not doing our jobs or not using powers available to us. So for a significant portion of my time in office, discussions around injunctions, discussions around emergency declarations were maybe that's something that we actually don't want at this point. I was never consulted explicitly on the Emergency Measures Act um, uh, that was put into place on February 14th. Mm -hmm. After the first day, I believe people were empathetic towards slowly, but that understandably changed through the second day of the testimony. Through cross-examination, we heard Chief slowly use pejorative words while saying he was careful not to use pejoratives towards a convoy, insulting the protesters and talking about what he called assaultive behavior, quote unquote. The surge contained and enforced was announced on the Friday morning at a media conference. And this was specifically to address the level of ongoing disorderly, assaultive, hate-related behavior that our downtown communities and businesses were experiencing, particularly in uh, Councillor Fleury's ward and um, Councillor McKenney, although I'm not sure she's in office now, but former Councillor McKenney, uh, her ward. Um, and, and the overwhelming amount of community complaints, business complaints were coming from the unlawful, assaultive type behavior in that area. And we needed to, that surge containing in force is, is not for the red zone, that is for the areas outside of the red zone. Slowly then backpedaled and admittedly and admitted that his words were very pejorative towards a convoy when pressed by Freedom Convoy lawyer, Brendan Miller. Watch what he said. Yes, I used the term assaultive in the broadest case possible, broadest way possible. Um, it is my understanding that there was criminal code assaultive behavior by individuals in and around the protest areas of the city, but I can't tell you that they were specifically a part of one convoy or specifically a part of some group that had clearly established themselves as a major, if not a dominant factor. But there was criminal code, criminal code level assaultive, assaultive threatening behavior that became the subject of criminal investigations. I don't know the status of those investigations. Right. And would it surprise you to know, uh, it's already in evidence, that in the time period between the start of the protest and when the invocation of the Emergencies Act came about, uh, there was a total of five charges for assault in total? I don't know the statistics, sir. Thank you. Um, so the second thing I want to talk to you about is... I believe that slowly pejorative and biased comments towards the convoy were part of what made some people lose compassion towards the man. Slowly still did not explicitly state his approval of the use of the Emergencies Measures Act on peaceful protesters. As I mentioned before, he was also not explicitly consulted prior to invocation of the act. Finally, hear what Slowly had to say about what he calls systemic bias and racism in the police force. Take a look. There is a bias, and I've spoken very publicly about systemic bias in policing, not limited to systemic racism in, in every aspect of, of humanity. I saw this during my time uh, in Kosovo in peacekeeping um, after 911 happened. There was a, a significant shift operationally, politically, socioeconomically, geopolitically to the threat that was posed by the various terms around radical Islam and Islamic-based terrorism. Um, when I was in private sector, I was invited by Public Safety Canada to be the co-chair of a committee of citizens from across the country looking at uh, online radicalization to violence and terrorism. And we received a briefing from CSIS, in, including senior RCMP officials, on the current state of, uh, of the national threat assessment. And this would be the summer of 2019, 18 months before the arrival of the convoy. But this is also the time that we had the incel van attack in Toronto. This is also the time that we had seen a rise of uh, right-wing extremism, white supremacy, and violent events south of the border, and increasing levels of violence and recruitment north of the border. Presentation that we got on the National Threat Assessment had no mention whatsoever, zero, of right-wing extremism and white supremacy. To the question that was asked of me, is this a concern of mine? It was a concern of mine in my days with the Toronto Police Service, 
in peacekeeping missions, in private sector, on a Public Safety Canada committee, and as a chief of police here in Ottawa. To conclude, here are some of the thoughts Andrew Lotz and journalists with True North had in regards to Chief Slowly's testimony. It was interesting because slowly and the OPP commissioner, Karik, it seemed like we're very, very tight. And the issue that uh, the former chief slowly kept raising today was Brenda Lucky, the RCMP commissioner. And, and I think if you and I again, I feel like that meme with like the guy that's like just trying to weave all of these strings together and the chalkboard like the conspiracy theorists. But I know we know that Brenda Lucky has shilled for the Liberals and has been uh, very much an agent of the Liberal government's agenda. And in that context, not even convoy related, I wonder what's going to come out further in this inquiry when you find out that it was the RCMP that seemed like the weak link, uh, slowly felt anyway, as far as that unity and, and the lack of support for him. Freedom Convoy organizers and key actors are testifying in the week of October 31st following Slowly's testimony. Stay tuned for more in that regard. Thank you for watching. This is William Diaz here with Rebel News. To stay up to date with what is going on here in Ottawa throughout the Emergencies Act inquiry for a whole six week and support our independent journalism of the inquiry, make sure to visit truckercommission.com. Freedom in 2022 is not sitting idly by while health diktats with no skin in the game make up all the rules. If you're like me and want to play an active role in upholding civil liberties and freedoms for all Canadians, for our children and eventually our grandchildren, then come out to our Rebel Live event and get to know us in person. We'll hearing from some of the most influential leaders in the freedom movement. We have events in Toronto on November the 19th and in Calgary on Saturday, November 26th. Tickets are on sale now at rebelnewslive.com. Come out, have lunch, get some Rebel swag, meet the Rebels and more. You don't want to miss this event. Check it out, rebelnewslive.com. takeaway regarding the Trudeau government's plans to demonize the Freedom Convoy even before it arrived in Ottawa. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, the narrative they've tried to push is that, oh, we, we had no choice but to use the Emergencies Act. It was a last, you know, last ditch resort. You know, there's nothing we could do. It just, the situation got so bad. And the fact that they were already calling, you know, the, the Freedom Convoy extremists before it got there, as you say, getting in in their words on the narrative that the media was pushing, it just shows that they had their end game kind of thought out ahead of time, right? They were always going to try to make it look like, um, you know, January 6th. They were always going to try to make it look extreme and they were always going to try to use it to, to, to uh, justify expanding government power. So, you know, the idea that they were ever acting in good faith and that they were ever really willing to listen to other people is, is you know, obviously, you know, absurd. And what's so unfortunate about it is, you know, the at, at one point, Justin Trudeau, before the 2021 election said, you know, Canada is not a country that mandates vaccinations. You know, he didn't seem to want to divide Canadians down those lines. And then the second they got worried about an election, you know, their poll numbers weren't looking good. He decided to divide the country. And even after the election, he decided to keep pushing with that division and obviously drove so many people to the point where they felt they had no choice but to go and protest. And so at, at each step of the way, he's chose to escalate and, you know, push people to be angrier and divide people more and more. And then he goes in there and talks about, oh, divisions are real threat in this country and Canadians need to be united. And uh, it's just the hypocrisy is just absurd. No, indeed. As the saying goes, physician, heal thyself. But, you know, Spencer, you, you brought up um, the inquiry. And of course, the reason for the inquiry is the invocation of the Emergencies Act. And it's an automatic that an inquiry does follow when it comes to the Emergencies Act. Here's the thing, of all the people that are going to testify, I just can't wait to see Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino <laughs> take the stand because he has said repeatedly and over and over again that law enforcement asked the government to invoke the act we have no evidence. We have everyone from the Ottawa Police Service 
to the RCMP saying, not us. So either Marco Mendicino is shockers lying or there is some, I don't know, remote police force somewhere that advised the government to invoke the act. What are your thoughts on that? Well, today you have Brenda Lucky saying that, oh, she doesn't know why she sent a message talking about, uh, you know, showing retroactive, you know, police and authority support for using the Emergencies Act. So obviously they're trying to get their story all lined up and it's not working for them. And so, yeah, I think you're, you're right. He's going to be very interesting to watch. I mean, he also has talked about needing the Emergencies Act because of the threat of arson. Um, you know, the, the supposed story of someone from the Freedom Convoy trying to set an apartment on fire, which, of course, the police repeatedly have said did not turn out to be the case. And he repeated it after the police said that wasn't the case. He still went out and repeated it. And so what I think it shows you is the just the fact that they're they still don't really have their story together and they're just flailing around. They're trying to, you know. The commission is reconvened. Like Commissioner Rapprom. Okay, so now we're ready to get started on the cross examinations. Uh, for the Government of Canada first, please. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr. Dichter. My name is Andrea Gonzalez. I'm one of the lawyers for the Government of Canada. Um, so as I've understood your evidence, Mr. Dichter, you were uh, the spokesperson and really generally media relations person for the Freedom Convoy, correct? Yeah, we had a team of three, of three other people and myself, and I led the, led the team. You were one of the uh, directors of the corporation as yes, well? Yes, I was. Um, and do you have a, any formal training degree or professional experience in communications, media relations, anything of that sort? No, I don't have a degree in communications, but I worked for companies previously that um, basically taught me general um, media communications, owned a business for many years, had to deal with it. So I've been in media, in and out of media for business purposes for quite some time. And you do your own media? Yeah. Yeah, for instance, you've got a book that's set to be released next week that you're promoting through your own website. Uh, yes, I actually um, <laughs> I wrote that book with a friend of mine who was a journal, an investigative journalist for the Toronto Star for 30 years and a published author. And I said to John, I said, I don't know how to write a book, uh, but can you teach me? And can we do this project together? And it was amazing to have somebody in my life who understood the process of um, investigative journalism to build uh, a framework, a timeline, all that sort of stuff so we could get the story out factually as it was, and not just my story, the story of other people uh, involved in the convoy. And during the period of the uh, protests, when you spoke or when you uh, proved publications on behalf of um, the Freedom Convoy, uh, those were, you were speaking on behalf of the group that the Freedom Convoy represented, right? That was the attempt. So there were many other uh, ancillary groups that were attached and whatnot. Um, you know, you can't speak for everybody. You do your best to find a message that will resonate with all sorts of people. And as you know, as you've seen by some of the people here, they're quite enthusiastic. Uh, sometimes they were upset that the, uh, the tenor was, it was not as enthusiastic as they wanted. So there was a balancing act with the different uh, personalities involved. Um, right, and you've, you've said previously you couldn't control the truckers, you couldn't control the protesters. Well, I think we were in a position, uh, and primarily because of the success of the GoFundMe and the subsequent uh, Give, Send, Go, where we had the highest degree of moral persuasion. So if there uh, was a representative of the government that came to speak with us, we would be in a unique position that would be easier for us to sell uh, whatever settlement idea that... Um, agreement we would come to with the government. It might take a little bit of time. And for example, 
I mentioned on February 18th when the uh, the road captains were in my room and they, they agreed with me saying, yeah, it's time to leave. The government is getting violent. And Miranda piped up and she said, yeah, but Ben, some of these people are not going to want to leave. And I said, that's your job as a road captain to convince them and persuade them to leave. If you need me to help, we'll try and get everybody uh, to get on board with us. So, Mr. Dictor, I've only got a limited amount of time. Okay. Um, and what I've put to you is a, a simple question that you have said in the past. In fact, you've sworn an affidavit. It's in our documents, JCF 6014, where you said, I do not control the truckers and other participants in the current protest in Ottawa. You recall saying that in an affidavit? Yeah, control and moral persuasion are two different things. That's and I asked you about control, so I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. No, nobody controls anybody, of course. Yeah. Right. And um, do you recall speaking at a press conference on January 30th? Uh, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, we have a transcript of that. Uh, it's COM 50895. Um it's a transcript, as I understand, of a video that has been prepared by Commission Council. Okay. Uh, have you had an opportunity to read that transcript? I, I skimmed through most of as much as I could in the past 24 hours. I understand. It's been hard. Um, but you would have no, no concerns about the accuracy of that transcript? From what I've seen so far, no. I'm... Okay. Um, and... Uh, we can put it up if you need your memory refreshed, but you said at that um, press conference uh, that, that there were so many truckers you lost track, right? Yeah. Um, and the various participants in the protest had a variety of viewpoints, objectives, demands, fair? No, I think what we all we all agreed on was arrive can and the mandates. Everybody has all sorts of uh, grievances with the government, uh, but we had one unifying grievance, which was the arrive can and uh, the mandates, which is what we were here for. And everybody kind of understood that, right? That was the baseline, and then there were others who wanted more. Uh, there were some. To your knowledge, you know that we're um, interested in a change of government. Uh, again, uh, not the convoy. There's may, people might have said things incorrectly. Uh, people might have given that impression. There's always fringe elements uh, in these sorts of uh, events. And, uh, but that's not what we were about from the very beginning. When you say the Freedom Convoy, you're talking about that organization where you're one of the board of directors, you've spoken about some others involved, and those who subscribe to that messaging and were, were following that group, correct? Well, there was the board, but everybody, you know, what you could see is evident on, online that everybody saw themselves as participants of the Freedom Convoy, that that's how they viewed all of this. And the board itself, the, the name we settled on was Freedom 2022 Human Rights Freedom Organization. And there were others such as Mr. King who participated in the protests. He had followers. They had different objectives and views, correct? Well, Mr. King has a very small social media following. Uh, I heard some of the numbers he threw out, and I pff, went online, and I know analytics, and he has nowhere near that sort of thing. He's got 3,000 followers online, uh, which is why it's odd that we keep focusing on him when on the 25th of January, I said to Tamara, 25th or 24th, whichever day she left, I can't remember, uh, he's got to go, and we had that back and forth, and she ultimately agreed with me, and then we released a press release it was our first update to the GoFundMe, and it stated that Pat King uh, represents only himself. Uh, he does not represent the Freedom Convoy, and uh, that stayed up there for quite some time. Um, and I know the document you're talking about. Yeah. It's GFM seven zeros and a one. Um, and that uh, update to the GoFundMe page in distancing the Freedom Convoy from Pat King, you felt that was, that was important to pursuing the objectives that you, you and those you were aligned with. 
to get people in the framework of peace, love, unity, and freedom, yes, we needed to um, ensure that people didn't get confused, that the government didn't get confused, and the government could understand that we were reasonable people that they could speak with, and they wouldn't get that impression uh, with that sort of rhetoric, which is why we all uh, were quite concerned about it and wanted it to not to be in, well, not to be involved. Um, and the uh, these concerns about what uh, was being um, seen on the part of the protesters. Um, this, in fact, prompted you to put out a number of public statements distancing uh, the Freedom Convoy from violence, correct? Of course, yeah, of course. And that had to be done repeatedly. Um, for example, there's a Sun article on January 26, com five zeros, six, seven, uh, six, three zeros, uh, six, three zero. There was an, uh, uh, official daily event and safety report put out on January 27th, HRF seven zeros eight. Um, and in fact, could we put that document up on the screen? Is this the type of document that would have been uh, approved through you or one of the other three working on um, communications? Uh, no, this was produced by Tom Quiggin, okay. uh, who's the intelligence analyst. But the reason we needed to put these messages out to answer your question, it wasn't because of the people, it was because of the legacy media that was putting out a narrative that was completely false about these phantom violent people that I never saw. And um, so we had to put these things out to, and, and we saw by the text message in this uh, testimony from the prime minister's office that they were doing exactly what I thought they were doing. Again, I'm going to ask you to just focus yourself on, on my question. All I did was ask whether you approved these messages before they went out. Uh, these, the daily safe, safety reports? No, that was Tom. No. And if we go down uh, maybe on the second page, bullet number 10... Convoy organizers are developing an internal intelligence capability to identify potential sources of violence. A separate report on identifying violent groups slash individuals will follow. And uh, if that's going out in the name of the Freedom Convoy, it's uh, being represented as something true and accurate, correct? Uh, yes, it also has the word potential. Right. Yeah. Now... Um, the objective, as I understood it, uh, from the GoFundMe page of the Freedom Convoy was to stay in Ottawa until all mandates were lifted. Yes. Um, you understand, sir, you do legal podcasts, you're a former candidate for parliament, that the federal government does not have the jurisdictional authority to lift all mandates in Canada, right? Uh, federal mandates? Yes. Well, no. Um, the wording of the GoFundMe page was all mandates. I want to make sure we're on the same page that the best the federal government could do was lift federal mandates, right? Yeah, yeah we knew if the federal government lifted their mandates and the, pro the provinces would follow. And in fact, the opposite happened. The province dropped all their mandates and the federal government held on to it until last month. And sir, you didn't know that. That was something you hoped would happen, right? I think it was a good educated guess understanding how government works, yeah. But fair to say there was misunderstanding on the part of at least some participants about what the federal government could do with respect to all mandates. And there were times when you found yourself in the messaging ensuring that it didn't uh, give the impression that the Freedom Convoy was asking the federal government to do that, which it had no authority to do, right? <laughs> Ask that again. I'm yeah, sure, I'll break it down. Um, there was misunderstanding by at least some participants in the protests as to these, you know, notions of jurisdiction and what the federal government could or couldn't do. Oh, there's definitely people in society who need some uh, education in civics, there's no question. But in terms of people who are leading organizations and groups uh, within our board, we understood that 
It was the federal mandate because that's the mandate that were destroying truckers' careers, their businesses, and their jobs because they couldn't cross the border. And so I've seen in the documents, I don't have time to take you to them, that there were times where you had to ensure that the messaging was refined to not lead the impression that the Freedom Convoy was trying to get the federal government to revoke all mandates. Right? It, was to, it, was to, it was to remove the, the federal mandates for sure, and the federal mandates would lead to all mandates. That was our optimistic assumption, and I think evidenced by what happened on the provincial levels, that was probably a good assumption. And you um, were asked in that January 30th press conference that we talked about yeah. um, about whether there was any point to trying to get the federal government to lift the mandate on truckers crossing the border because there was a parallel restriction in place on the U.S. side. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, but the... <laughs> Sorry, I'm, before you go on, yep. um, I just want to clarify that you, you did in that press conference um, say, acknowledge that fact, but say that you understood that the U.S. restriction had been adopted at the request of the Canadians. The and Canadian it came government. here first, and the U.S. never enforced it. But that's what I want to make sure we're both clear on. The U.S. mandate was announced first, right? It was a, No, it was announced after. It was the Canadian mandates that were announced first, from what I remember. Okay, well, um, I think the evidence is different on that, but okay. I'll leave it there. Could be. Um, and so when you and the Freedom Convoy say, we are in this for the long Paul, you recall using that statement yeah. at times. Yeah. Um, you were not willing to leave until your demands were met. Fair? I was reflecting the um, I was reckon, reflecting the sentiment of the truckers that were coming here. It wasn't BJ's decided we're going to stay here. Uh, permanently. It's the truckers that assembled their convoys, and there were so many convoys we couldn't keep track. They all agreed, and that was their sentiment. I was trying to reflect the sentiment of them for the government so they would understand, which was odd that there are people in the city of Ottawa that said, oh, they're going to be here for two days. Okay. Um, and your understanding is that that group um, would not be prepared to leave Ottawa. They, these were committed, dedicated individuals to their cause, yes, as you understood it. And they were not going to leave Ottawa until they had accomplished their goals, right? Well, I think at least we start with somebody from the government who would hear them, because what this protest was, this was a cry for help. And they felt completely alienated and abandoned, and they were losing everything they had. And this was a, an act of desperation. Mr. Commissioner, I'm one minute over my 15 minutes. Could I have another five, please? In the circumstances, I'll give you another five. Thank you. And generally reasonable. Thank you. Um, and so we've heard you give some evidence about the agreement, the deal between Ms. Leach and Mayor Watson. Um, and uh, the, the tweets and your understanding of that series of events. And it, it, just to confirm, you, you did come to understand that there was an exchange of letters um, that set out an understanding at a minimum, a deal, as to what would happen for there to be a sit down between the mayor and representatives of the Freedom Convoy. You understand that, yes? From what I understand, there was attempts to communicate. I didn't know at the time, nobody told me, that people connected to Doug Ford's office were involved in that communication. Um, and you brought, you, you discussed Mr. Wilson's connections with those events this morning. Um, who did you understand Mr. Wilson's client or clients was in the course of these dealings? Well, Mr. Wilton told me it was that we were his client, but the retainer was with the JCCF. I didn't say anything because my mother is a paralegal, so I know some of the basics. I knew that retainer was not legitimate, but I didn't even bother uh, to pursue the matter because there were so many other things on our problem, and we needed, we were desperate for free legal advice, and that just became a nuanced argument that maybe we'll figure it out in the future. 
And um, did you ever see the letters that were exchanged between Ms. Leach and Mayor Watson? No. To this day, you've not seen those? Oh, no, now I have, yeah. Now you have, but not at the time. Yeah. Um, and so I gather you did not make any efforts yourself to try and get those who were parked in the residential areas of Ottawa to move their trucks in accordance with this with this exchange of letters. Yeah, no, that was my uh, understanding with Tom Ratso, where he said, I'm going to deal with the trucks. And I said, great, I'll deal with the messaging. <laughs> the next day, he's doing a press conference. But I, I didn't want, there's so many things I had to deal with. And I didn't want to step on other people's toes. That's what I was trying to do. And you never approved any sort of official written communication from the Freedom Convoy uh, to its group of followers saying, we need to leave the downtown residential core. There's a deal with the mayor that we need to make sure we comply with. No, no. If that anything came out under the Freedom Corp logo, I was completely circumvented in that and not told about it. Okay, thank you for the indulgence, Mr. Commissioner. Those are my questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is uh, are the convoy uh, organizers. <laughs> Mr. Dichter, uh, Brendan Miller, I'm counsel for Freedom Corp. I've been watching you for a few weeks. Nice to meet you. So just a couple of things. I want to get uh, some things clarified here. You haven't been very clear with dates about when things happen, so I want to get that hammered down. Is that okay? Sure. All right, I understand on February 4th, 2022, or maybe it was the 3rd, uh, you were in a car accident out in Kingston. You ended up in a ditch, is that right? I ended up in a, a ditch in a tree on February 3rd, yeah. and 45 minutes later, I was in Tim Hortons doing an interview on Stephen Crowder. Okay. And so uh, you were in Kingston, and then I take it you got in back oh, Kemp, to... Kempville. Kempville. Kempville, sorry. In Kempville, and then you got back to Ottawa uh, the evening of February 4th. Is that fair? Uh, no, February 3rd. February so 3rd. I, yeah, I was picked up by a friend who came to rescue me after the interview to get back into Ottawa. Right, and then was it the third or the fourth where you broke your leg? The fourth. The fourth, so February 4th. And after you broke your leg, I take it you were in the hospital for a, a brief period of time or were you? I got out of the hospital the next morning at seven o'clock in the morning. I don't remember much of that day because of Deloitte and all the medication, but midway through the day, I started at least to become aware and got back to slowly working through media and stuff like that. Okay, so February 5th, you get out of the hospital. Feb no, 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 I was out of the hospital on February, uh, yeah, sorry, February 5th. Yeah, the morning right. of February 5th. So right. morning February 5th. So you get out of the hospital and your leg's broken. I understand it was a pretty bad break, eh? Still hurts so much. Still hurts, right. And so you said just now you were on a bunch of medication, is that correct? Yep, for 24 hours. Yeah, and what was that? Uh, Deloitte. Okay. And I take it then after that, you would have still been on some form of pain medication, would you not? Oh, just Advil. Okay. Just Advil. And so after that time, so after February 4th, uh, you're pretty restricted mobile-wise. You stayed in your, essentially in your hotel room for most of the time, right? Yeah. Okay, so you weren't out on the street talking to anybody or anything like that? I tried to go out every Sunday, and I did, to when Pastor Hildebrand did his service. Uh, there was the Lubavitch Jewish community that wanted to see me for whatever reason. So I would go every Sunday. Uh, the pastors would give their service. And the, started the first weekend, me, Tamara, and Chris were on stage. And my idea was we have to be here every Sunday to thank everybody for coming out and supporting right. us and all okay. that, so I did that. But other than that, you were pretty much confined to your room, right? Uh, I was confined to the hotel. Uh, I did go manage to go to one meeting at the ARC, 
um, when my leg was broken. That was the meeting with all the road captains. There was like 40 of them in there. Um, one of the people working with me said it would be a good sentiment, even though right. you can't. So I did, yeah. Right. For sure. And you weren't a road captain, right? No, no. Right. Okay. And so it's fair to say that from February 4th onward, you weren't really on the street talking physically uh, in their presence to any of the truckers, right? Uh, no, but I had the person who was assisting me on messaging. She was going to the ARC Hotel and the Swiss Hotel meetings every morning, keeping me up to date. I was in communication with Tamara and the group over signal, so there was no lack of communication there. And then I had two friends that had come up, well, friends, one's a reporter and another friend, uh, who came up to Toronto, and she came up to Ottawa, were staying, uh, sleeping over in the adjacent suite, and they were going out to the groups, talking to people, bringing people back to the hotel, right, like that's right. how I managed So this individual you were saying was keeping you up to date, other than Tamara, you said you had somebody in communications working with you. Who was that? His name is Salman Sima. He is a, an activist from Iran. Okay, thank you. And uh, you'd said in your evidence in chief that uh, Ms. Litch uh, was constantly coming to your room every day and that was uh, happening all On, the time. There were a few days that she disappeared. I remember one day I couldn't get a hold of her all day and you had to see the stress that she was under. Uh, I, I really sympathized with her. Right. So she went to Quebec, for example, a day and she got back to me at six, seven o'clock. That happened a few times, but whenever she was in the hotel, uh, we would see each other fairly frequently. And I take it that frequency of seeing her, it declined after February 7th. Would you agree? Uh, no, I, don't, I wouldn't agree. Okay. I saw her at the, the, my promo video is me, her giving me a hug the day that I, she was arrested. I'm not, I'm not so, saying yeah. <laughs> that you didn't see her. I'm saying the frequency that you would see her from February 7th on declined. Would you agree? I, I don't remember it that way, but it could be okay. because so much was going on. Did you know that uh, basically everyone other than yourself and Chris Barber had checked out of the Sheraton on February 7th, 2023, and were staying at the Swiss? Uh, I know there was a lot of jockeying around with hotel rooms because we were getting death threats. We went to the Ark to the Sheraton, and I know she left. Uh, did she leave the Sheraton to Swiss? It might be, uh, but everybody was around. And I know Dagny was there with them every morning and telling me what's right. going on. But in you can agree then that uh, Miss Litch wasn't staying in the same hotel as you from February 7th onward. Can you agree with that? That could be. That could be. All right. It's also, remember, she had a hotel room. Uh, every, we had so many different hotel rooms. You know, I was in four or five hotel rooms that were Tamara's. I don't know if everybody knew which hotel room belonged to who. It was just a block of hotel rooms. It didn't really matter, okay. you know, whose room was whose. Right, but all. all of these folks, they had to basically come and see you because you were confined to your room. Uh, I would go to the other rooms when they were around. So there, there was also a boardroom on the 16th floor, if I remember, right. that I went up to for a couple of meetings. Um, so now, communication was there, like it wasn't, you right. know. So I want to take you to February 11th, uh, 2022. Okay. Uh, you knew about that meeting that was taking place between uh, the members of the board and Dean French and the mayor, or through the mayor. You knew about that on that day. I didn't know about that. You didn't? No. You're saying you didn't know about it? Though I heard Dean French's name in one of the, there was a, um, a news article. I didn't know the, the capacity at, it at the time. Now I do. Uh, I, <laughs> I didn't know the details of it. Again, everything was opaque. It was, Keith, we're going to go do a deal yeah. with the city. So and, uh, there was a, a, a board meeting that you couldn't attend around that time. Uh, you attended by phone conference because you were in your room. Do you remember that? No, I don't. You don't. Well, they had a meeting. You were in attendance, uh, according to our records, and this was all discussed. It was on phone or Zoom or You, you called in. Everyone else was there physically. It was at the Swiss. I don't and remember. And you called in. I don't remember. You don't remember? No. Okay. Well, that's going to be testified to, so I have to be fair to you. No, no, fair enough. Right. Yeah. And so all of this was discussed before the deal that was discussed with the mayor. Everybody knew about it, and you're saying you didn't. No. All right. So the deal, um, as I explained before, when Keith said we're going to reach out to the city, I questioned that strategy. 
and the board was willing to reach out to the city. I said, uh, I don't agree. And I got no specifics in terms of what they were going to do. Because a deal is what? Leaving? How is that a deal? So I, I don't understand. Me, it didn't make any sense. This. So the board, the majority of the board didn't agree with you. Fair? Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. And you were eventually removed from this board. Is this correct? Uh, this was quit? after. Yes. Yeah, well you, after. Right. And do, you want, do you want to know why? Well, I'm going to get into that. Okay. Um, and some of the animosity that arose was that the board had voted to do all these things, enter into these agreements. Then you broke into or went into Ms. Litch's twi Twitter or tweet account or whatever they're called. Broke into? Well, you went into it and pretending to be her. The entire you, time, right. as she asked me to. But you posted something that you knew was a lie. <laughs> no. You knew that no. they had done this deal you knew there's no uh, deal. No, Commissioner, I'm going to yeah. object. I think the questions are getting a little argumentative and accusing the witness of lying. I don't yeah. think that's the role. Yeah, I, I hear your objection, but I think this is cross examination, and I'll give some latitude. Yeah. So you're saying before you went in to her account, representing to the public at large, I didn't go into her account. I was using her account right. from the very beginning, <clears throat> and. The account is linked to her cell phone number. Right. If they didn't want me to be using it, which was never told to me, guess what? You could just tell me you don't want to use it, which was never so communicated no one, to no me. No one on the board and no one else told you to do that. You did that on your own initiative. No, Tamara told everybody in the board, all comms go through Benjamin. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not asking about that. I'm asking about the No, tweet. but this is an important but This is well, an important. I fact. understand. I would like you to answer She was question. telling me everything goes through him. Right. That's yeah. nice. And so that gave you the prerogative yeah. to go on to her Twitter and make something up and say that didn't this make is something up. Well, I, th I think this is so. just getting into argument. And I think he's answered the question. I'll move on. So after this deal goes through and some of the trucks did get moved, <laughs> you're aware of that? Then why did Keith tell me the deal's it not did, going well? Sorry. Right. <laughs> he asked you about. Right. Okay. Trucks were moved. So let's try and focus. You up. answer the question, and we'll get through right. this. And so you did get that email with the with the comms, essentially sheet that was supposed to go out to all the truckers about the deal. You did get that, and we've seen it up there. And you replied, "Looks good." It's just a it's a it's a comms piece, right? It's not a deal. It's communications. Piece. Right. So what was your expectation? Did you believe that the city of Ottawa was going to enter into a contract? Well, when I followed up after that, I was told there's no deal. That was the whole point. I was getting bombarded online. People were getting upset. Truckers were getting upset. I had to communicate something. That's why I reached out to them in those text messages. That's why I asked Keith, is there a deal? No. And he said, specifically in a text message, we haven't drafted anything. And, and Tamara as well told me, uh, there's nothing yet. I'll let you know if there's something. And it never was. Okay. And so again, you're communicating, you, the truckers are reaching out to you. And who were these truckers reaching out to you that were concerned? Oh, people online are getting bombarded with thousands right. of messages. But nobody from the board, from the board that you were on. Well, were the board you? wasn't getting angry. It's the, the people on the street that I didn't want them to get angry and, God forbid, get violent. So I needed to communicate at right. this point. There's okay. no deal. There's nothing. And so let's, let's talk about this. So yeah. you had said in your evidence that after uh, the police started taking enforcement action, yes. that a bunch of people came to talk to you because Tamara had been arrested, Chris Barber had been arrested, and they asked, what should we do? And you said, leave. You need to, you need to leave. No, no. Right. So what I said specifically and directly, I said, I'll support you whatever you want to do. If you want to ask my opinion, I think maybe it's time to leave, just to give them a little bit, because I, I thought they would attack me for it, to be entirely honest. And Bridget was the first one to say to pipe up and say, yeah, I think we should leave. Uh, Joe, I think, was the next one. They all said, uh -huh. yeah, it's getting violent. And I said, OK, if that's what you want to do, uh, I'll do my best to communicate that, call your lead. And we all started working. And right. And so the deal that, that was being negotiated, that I understand you say you didn't know about it, but the deal there was to get the same sort of thing done, but to move the trucks without any violence, right? Uh, no. the the deal 
was to consolidate trucks onto Wellington is what I've been hearing all this week. But get them that's out of not, the residential areas. No, that's, we were leaving Ottawa entirely. Okay. That's what I communicated. All right. Not consolidate them onto Wellington Street to make it easier to kettle the trucks. So you were not happy with Mr. Wilson and Ms. Chipiuk and the folks doing the negotiation uh, to try and end things peacefully, but you're okay with telling everybody to leave once violence has started. That's what you would rather have done. No, I was un uncomfortable with Keith Wilson and uh, uh, Eva because that's not the, the, the client-solicitor uh, relationship, them telling us what to do and going and doing off their own deals and coming and t dictating to the truckers what we have to do. But you're on a board. Do you understand how that works? Of course, I, so I was one board, of the few the, on the board that, that, right, that knew I, that. I understand that, but the board gave him instructions. It's not just what you want. Because what the board was doing to, what the, the JCCF was doing to them was scaring them. They offered them free legal advice. And if you don't listen to us, then we're going to pull your free legal advice. Everybody was scared. We had the class action suit. We didn't know what we were going to see potentially. And then we had all of this pressure coming from the JCCF regularly trying to dictate how the messaging should, or not the messaging, but how the, the convoy should operate, how the board should work, whatever. Right. It was really difficult. It really caused a lot of problems. And I also understand, again, that uh, you were making the decisions about what media outlets that uh, you would communicate through. Is that correct? Which Keith, with Keith, Keith supported. And right. he mentioned yesterday that, uh, anyways, yeah. I understand. So, but you specifically mentioned here today, Russian Today. Yes. Right. And I understand uh, that my clients had no input into you communicating with Russian Today. You just did that. Uh, yes, like all the other interviews. Right. And you're familiar that Russian Today is essentially a, a Russian propaganda outfit. You're aware of that. Yeah, they thought it was hysterical as well because because the CBC... So you, uh, you went I'll, to I'll a Russian propaganda outfit if I can in explain. order to portray what you believed was the message that you wanted to portray? Is he, uh, is, uh, Mr. Commissioner, is he asking the question or answering the he, question on behalf of the witness? He's, he's asking the question. The witness will get a chance to answer. Yeah. Okay. So you went to Russian Today on your own accord, which you know is a Russian propaganda outfit, and thought that that would be a good communication strategy? It's funny how back then they supported me because there was a reason I did that. The reason I did that is because the CBC started disseminating some more uh, narrative that maybe the convoy is a Russian operation. And I wanted to bait the CBC into building that narrative. That's how alternative media works. And they didn't take the bait, but it was great. It was, it but was, you weren't instructed to do that. That was just on your own initiative. Uh, no, I was instructed with my team to do all the communications. That's what I was told to do. But never specifically contacting a Russian propaganda outfit. That's a wonderful narrative, but they loved it when I did it, and everybody's it changing just, their minds. It just, I think it was yep. a question. All right. Okay. Next, uh, we have the uh, Ottawa Police Service. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Mr. Dictor. My name is David Mijakovsky, and I appear as counsel to the Ottawa Police Service. Um, am I correct, Mr. Dictor, um, that when you came to Ottawa, <coughs> uh, it was not your intention to disrupt the lives of residents? Uh, no, no. The people who live here, no. Your beef was with the government. That's right. And so there would have been no reason that the police would expect that when you got here, you or other members of the convoy would engage in harassment or honking or engage in antisocial behavior with the residents? Uh, I didn't see any harassment or antisocial behavior myself for the first few days that I was walking around or when I went on the stage any of the days. I've heard a lot of claims, uh, swastikas, for example. And the woman I spoke to had a swastika on her sign. She said, yeah, because I'm a religious Jew 
And what the government is doing to me is exactly what they did to us in Germany in the 30s. I don't consider that anti-social behavior. So people were just uh, activists. They're sorry. just protesters. Perhaps my question wasn't clear. Yeah. My, my question was with respect to the information um, that was planned by members of the convoy yeah. before they arrived in Ottawa. They did not plan to do anything illegal or uh, harass people or engage in antisocial behavior. Is that I don't fair? think anybody does. And the Ottawa police had a great relationship. I just get, oh, sorry. listen to the question. It was a pretty simple question. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. So you would agree with me, correct? That wasn't the intention <laughs> when you came. Okay. And um, you indicated, therefore, I guess that you would agree with me, that the police would therefore not expect that there would be antisocial behavior or, in a, or breaching bylaws or anything like that based on what was being talked about before the convoy got here. This is a silly question. I don't know what antisocial behavior means. Okay. I, I um, you would expect that the police uh, would not have anticipated that the protesters would park their vehicles wherever they want or honk their horns or harass people wearing masks or engage in racist or misogynistic behavior. That wasn't your plan, so therefore you wouldn't expect the police to anticipate. Well, that, and parking you? the trucks is where the park trucks were parked where the Ottawa police told us right. to park them. Yeah. Okay, so my question to you again, perhaps I wasn't clear, yeah. um, and I'll, I'll break it down. No, no, I, no, that was not in our, our intention, of course right. not. Yeah, of course and not. so therefore the police wouldn't expect that either. They would expect what you were promoting was a peaceful uh, demonstration with love and where people got along, correct? Yes, but you know, my brother's a police sergeant, and I know they they have protocols for everything. They always anticipate that there could be problem uh, people in every protest, in every organization, right? That's just the way it is. You get enough people together. Right. There's always going to be somebody who may cause issues. Right, and so it, you're aware that the police had public order units on standby in case that was necessary the first weekend, correct? Yeah. Right. Uh, but you didn't anticipate it being a problem, fair? No. no. And certainly what you were reading on social media before you got here, it wasn't anticipated that this was going to be a problem. What was anticipated was a peaceful protest. Yeah, just a very large one. Okay. <laughs> um, in spite of what you anticipated, however, uh, subsequently when you got here, um, there was honking of horns? For the first day and a half, yeah. And there were residents and businesses who complained about the behavior engaged in by at least some of the people. All the businesses that I dealt with were supporting us and thought it was amazing. Many of the businesses were closed downtown, correct? Well, they were closed after. So Rideau Center was open initially. All the businesses were open and then um, the city brought in some emergency thing that made it, one of the owners of the business told me, it's a $150 penalty a day if I open today, but we're going to support you. But that's why, why that happened, from what I understand. Um, and so ultimately, there was an injunction issued by a judge about the honking, correct? Yep. And then understand. there was a further injunction that the city got. And so at least uh, a couple judges found that conduct had been engaged in that was interfering with the residents of um, the businesses of Ottawa, correct? Uh, I don't know what evidence was pro provided to him because I was not in that case. I don't know if it was just claims of this and it was not substantiated and the judge just ruled that if this is happening, it can't because uh, I, uh, I was not a participant in those uh, those right. proceedings. But you would assume that our justice system works where there's evidence and judges make decisions based on that evidence. Of course, but you know, judges have different leeway. You know, everybody's different in what they accept. Um, treason is a very serious crime, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I would say so, yeah. Okay, and so one of the things you did um, is if we could please turn up JBA 0080. That's a triple uh, fours. Uh, that's something that 
Mr. Botter put out. Do you, do you subscribe to the views of Mr. Botter? <laughs> no. Okay, so uh, you can take it off. That's fine. So um, I, I take it um, then that you so you don't subscribe to the views of Mr. Botter, and it sounds to me from your evidence that you've had some disagreements with some of the me other members of the convoy as well. Correct? Yes. I, do you want me to expand on the MOU? Uh, no. no, no, no. I'm, ju I'm just asking you. You've had conflict with uh, the views of some of the other members of the convoy of the Freedom uh, Convoy as well. Correct? We were all really good. We were all really tight, and we could resolve our issues in the very beginning until the fourth of uh, or the yeah the fourth of February, when I first met people from the JCCF, and that's when all of a sudden uh, the distrust started. And I think some of the people who wanted to be on the board got very upset. But initially things were great. Uh, for the first couple of weeks working with Tamara, everything was awesome. Right. And so things, however, fell apart and there wasn't cohesion within the group anymore. On certain issues, you know, when I broke my ankle, I told that story when I was on the couch. Everybody came and coalesced around me. They're all very supportive. And we're, yeah, we have some differences, but we'll work. it was a, an amazing moment. So it's we not, were able to resolve uh, conflicts when we didn't have people that were, uh, you know, fueling some division, in my opinion. I, I've listened to the testimony from uh, convoy protesters all week. Yep. And, it sound, and have you as well? Yes, I have. And it sounds like there's a lot of disagreements. Well, I think the only board member was uh, was uh, Chris Barber, right? He was the only board member who testified. Okay, so it sounds like there was a lot of disagreement among your views, Tamara Leach's views. Uh, no, no. Tam Tamara and I were in sync the entire time. At least, you know, that was my impression. We were messaging, calling, texting, like everything was great. Right, and so as I understand it, uh, you were of the view um, that Keith Wilson wasn't honest when he told you that there was no deal. Say that again. What? What? Keith Wilson? Yeah. He wasn't honest when he told you there was no deal. Uh, it, it seems to be that's the case. Right, but... and he was the lawyer representing some of the group, correct? He was representing the JCCF. Right, so there was some disagreement there. And then I believe uh, Ms. Leach didn't tell you about the negotiations with the, mem with the mayor, correct? That's right, I didn't know she so there, met with the mayor. So there was um, some withholding of information there. It was opaque for sure. Yeah, and so when you got the letter that she wrote, that Freedom Manifest, you didn't interpret that as telling truckers to leave, right? No. Sorry, no. no. Um, uh, just, uh, I just want to have you identify a couple of pictures. Sure. I just want to move on uh, to two sort of final minor points. Okay. And so if I could ask you, please, uh, Mr. Clerk, to turn up JBA uh, 40002. And so um, these are some pictures, I take it, that you took um, on the day that um, enforcement action was being taken, correct? No, I didn't took it. I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't get out, go out in the snow. I didn't take that picture. Okay, um, but you've seen these pictures, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's Metro Toronto Police, no? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I, I, uh, well, I'm saying... In fact, we can see some uh, indications on the picture of some badges of some officers. Then we can see on the back, on the yellow vest, we can see other officers identified by A12. Hmm. Correct? Yep. Right. So you could see th where the various police were coming from, correct? Uh, I, I wasn't on the ground. So when I was in the hotel, for example, my friend Salman, who's been in many protests in Iran, uh, he was running out and coming back to me and predicting everything, saying, this is what they're going to do. This is how they're blockading everybody off. And he said to me, who put all the trucks in one area? I'm like, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. Um, so that was my, but I was, I was in a wheelchair. It was snowy that day, so I couldn't even get out if I wanted to. Okay, um, let me move on just yeah. to um, address my final point. Um, you can take that 
picture off, please. Uh, if I could ask you, Mr. Clerk, to put up um, JBA0020. So four zeros, Mr. zero, 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 two A. For the record, uh, I thought the parties, per the rules, were to provide the witness with at least three days of the evidence they were going to call. So I'm just, uh, for the record, uh, the next piece of evidence. <laughs> Je croyais que normalement les témoins recevaient euh, les documents que vous alliez présenter. Oui, là, je ne veux simplement présenter que euh, ce qu'il a déjà mentionné lui-même, mais euh, ces documents-là étaient des documents que M. Victor avait affichés. Donc, euh, cela existait. Je ne vérifie pas systématiquement si la base de données est là, mais euh, je ne fais que référer aux documents auxquels il a fait référence lui-même. Bon, ben, continuez. On va voir ce que ça donne. Vous avez fait référence à une conversation, à savoir que la police vous a dit où mettre les véhicules. Euh, pas, pas moi, c'est un de mes collègues. Bonjour, Jason. Et voici donc les cartes de la ville. Et vous aviez demandé à voir les cartes pour midi. Voici donc, euh, euh, ce sont des zones euh, euh, qui ont une certaine infrastructure. On ne peut pas avoir... I'll pass that along when I get it. Correct? Okay. And so you understood that was information the police were giving to the convoy participants as to where they could stage their vehicles, correct? Yeah, th this is one of the reasons I was surprised Chris Guerra was not called as a witness here because he was here for a week, so he could clearly uh, comment on these issues. I just spoke to him on the phone a few times during the week just to make sure he's okay, And uh, but that was his area in his department, right? Right. And just the final one in that one is JBA uh, 400068. And again, so that is um, giving some of the uh, information for truckers as to where they can and cannot go, correct? Yeah. So that was the information you're referring to. So they were told to leave space for vehicles. They were told where there would no, uh, not be convoy access. And you understood coming into the city. Uh, did you come in on what day? Um, I've been uh, your way over time. I thought you were just going to put a document to him, and now you're going into a... So uh, sure, you're you're going to have to wrap my, uh, up. Um, sure. Just to finish that up, what day did you come in? The 28th. So that'd be the Friday? Yes. And on Saturday, you saw that a number of uh, entrances to downtown were uh, closed off. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the, the team that was at the uh, Swiss Hotel was uh, just in dealing with volume. That was the problem. Nobody anticipated, you know, the largest, longest convoy in history. So that's what really caused it. And I know they were working with police, from what I understand, to clear up and make sure that the emergency laneways were opened up. And that was their primary concern. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, you. thank you for your indulgence. Okay, next is the uh, Ontario Provincial Police. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Commissioner. It's Christine Johnson for the Ottawa Residents and Businesses. Um, I'm just not sure if we were perhaps uh, missed there in the lineup. I believe we have 15 minutes with Mr. Dichter, and I know it normally goes from uh, most time to least time. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. you Council with the Ottawa Residents and yep. Businesses. Yep. Just checking, I'm not sure if we were perhaps missed in the lineup. I believe we have 15 minutes with Mr. Dichter, and I know that it normally goes from most time to least time. You're absolutely correct. Uh, and I, you're not the first person I've skipped in error. So uh, maybe you want to go next. 
Sure, and I'm in your hands, of course, knowing that we normally take the lunch break around one o'clock. If, if you would prefer to have us start or perhaps a party uh, who has less time take us the lunch break, I'm in your hands. I'd say get started. We're going to be running late today, so. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Dichter. Good afternoon. As you would have just heard, my name is Christine Johnson. Yep. I'm one of the co-counsel representing the Ottawa Residents and Businesses Coalition. Okay. Uh, I just have a couple of areas of questioning for you today. Okay. Um, it might come as no surprise that my, my first area of questioning for you, sir, is going to be about the honking uh, that uh, residents and businesses observed during the convoy protest. Yeah. So you told us this morning, Mr. Dichter, that on the evening that you fell and slipped on the ice and broke your leg, that you didn't hear any honking at all. It, it was silent. Is that... It was eerily silent. It was really weird. Yeah. But you would agree that there was loud, prolonged, frequent honking day and night throughout much of the convoy protests in Ottawa. No, I wouldn't agree with that. I would agree for the first couple of days. Uh, but... I was living down here too in a hotel and uh, we all had to sleep. Truckers who had their kids in their cabs, they needed to sleep. Uh, so I don't know where this, is, th this narrative is coming from. I didn't witness that. You witnessed no loud prolonged honking? For the first couple of days, for sure. Uh, when, 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 Cause you had multiple convoys coming in all through the night, different times of the day. People were moving things around. Uh, when they had the dance parties um, or during the day, like it, so many kids you know, <laughs> would do this, go up to the trucks, honk, uh, because it was that sort of vibe. It was amazing. So there was honking throughout the day continuing beyond the first few days? No, because I was only on my feet, remember, until the fourth. So for the first couple of days, uh, I will say there, were, there was honking for the first couple of days as everybody came in, but it was not sustained for weeks. <laughs> I was here all three weeks. And we heard that uh, after your fall on the ice and break of your leg, yeah. you were confined to the hotel most of the time. Is that most right? Most of the time. I got out at least once a week, and there was that meeting I went to at the Ark with the road captains. There might have been one other. I, I remember some other reason I was in the lobby, went in and out. I just can't remember what it was. But yeah. So you wouldn't have heard the honking uh, directly on the street because you weren't on the street for a good period of time. Well, I was in a hotel in downtown, uh, downtown Ottawa, two blocks away from Parliament Hill. Uh, there were trucks, a couple of trucks parked on the street in front of the hotel. Those weren't honking. The adjacent street, they weren't honking. Uh, if I'm staying in downtown Ottawa, right in the core of all of it, and I'm not hearing honking, uh, I don't know where the honking's coming from. But you're aware that many residents were expressing concerns that they were hearing frequent loud honking and they were disturbed by that honking. I don't want to project motives onto people. Uh, I would just say that I disagree and uh, perhaps there's other motives for it. I don't know. Um, I just know my experience and what I saw, both when I was on foot for the co first couple of days, which was that amazing moment where everybody came from Quebec uh, to meet with the Western Canadians. Yeah, there was honking then. Um, oh, and I will admit as well, during the, uh, the speeches on the Sundays, that when the pastor would give his speech, when somebody would finish, the trucks were there, would, people would applaud, and the trucks that were there, the six trucks on either side, uh, they would honk in applause. But that's all I saw. But you are aware that Ottawa residents ultimately brought an application for an injunction against the honking, and the court, in fact, granted that motion. That's right. That's what I mentioned before. And I, it, I may have caught you wrong, but I believe that you, you just told uh, one of my friends that you weren't a participant in that proceeding at all, in that motion to obtain an injunction proceeding. No, that was handled by the lawyers that were representing us. And, and so you don't recall the fact that you swore an affidavit that was submitted into evidence on use for use on that motion on February 7th. What did it say? What specifically? 
it, uh, I believe it, uh, it attested to the fact that you were in Ottawa as part of the protest and you did not own a truck. That's right. So you no, were I own aware. a truck. The truck wasn't in uh, in Ottawa. But you affirmed that affidavit for use in the motion injunction. I'm getting lost. Can you simplify that? I, I, I Sir, you you told us earlier that you were not involved whatsoever yes. in the motion for an injunction on February seventh against the horn honking. When yeah, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't there. I didn't, uh, I didn't attend the the proceeding. Okay, you didn't attend the proceeding, but yeah. you did in fact supply an affidavit for use in that proceeding. I signed an affidavit from my uh, lawyers. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And again, you're aware that that motion was successful and that the court was convinced on the evidence that there was honking and it would cause irreparable harm if the honking were to continue. Uh, okay, Irreparable, is that how they worded it, irreparable harm? Okay. Uh, were you ever provided a, a, a copy of the court's decision? I was provided with court decisions later on, like they would show us, but it was so busy. There were so many things going on and I kind of, we all left the legal stuff in the hands of legal. I dealt with messaging, certain people dealt with trucks, other security, that sort of thing. So it was, so many things came in and out, right? So the lawyers for the JCCF never provided you with a copy of that court order at the time it was obtained? It might've been within the, the couple of days they would have sent an email. And just because I was busy. And were you aware that pursuant to that court order, you were required to communicate the terms of the order on your personal social media? No, nobody told me that. Okay. And in fact, you, you never did communicate the terms of the order on your social media. I don't believe so. I'm trying to think. I don't believe so. Okay. Could be wrong, but I don't, I, there were so many thousands of messages that I put out there. I'm trying to think if I was told community, but I, I don't, I don't recall that. I don't recall that. Okay. So you've told us that uh, you didn't hear a lot of honking. You didn't think it was a key feature of this protest at all. Is that fair? That's right. Uh, so I want to ask you about um, your, your, your personality on social media. You have a Twitter account, <laughs> Mr. Dictor, that has honk in your name on Twitter, correct? Yes. And what is the significance of that? Why did you include honk in your Twitter name? Oh, it's just um, humor. Uh, the idea that uh, when we came here, I mean, it's both humor and a cry for help from the government. Like the little bit of honking that you saw, it wasn't, um, it wasn't to be aggressive. It's, you have to understand what these people's lives were going through and they were just completely desperate. And I know some of them, one particular driver, a Ukrainian driver, uh, he was very passionate in the beginning for honking because he said, they, they don't listen to me. What do I have to do? I have to honk or something. And we're like, well, let's tone it down a little bit. That was in the first couple of days. So some drivers, some truckers did communicate to you that they felt as though the honking was a way to get their message across, get their voices heard. Yeah, but again, it was just for the first couple of days. And that's when we all, uh, I believe that's when we changed, I changed my social media tag to put that. Okay, so that was going to be my next question was, when did you insert honk into your name? I believe it was, it was in the early days, but so many things going on so many days, it's hard to keep track, okay. right? And uh, one of my friends has already asked you about uh, a forthcoming book that you'll be publishing yes. about your experience in the convoy. And yeah. I understand that the title of that book is Honking for Freedom. Yes. And again, if, if honking was not a central feature of this protest, why would your book be named Honking for Freedom? Because there's so much social media uh, tags around the word honk and around this protest because it came, became such a divisive issue. And Cry for Freedom didn't really have the same uh, you know, element in communicating what was going on. And honk was just a natural uh, title for it. Okay. Um, Mr. Clerk, I'm going to just uh, have this witness um, look at a couple of documents. Um, the first is HRF 6042. And while this is coming up on the screen, Mr. Dictor, yeah. um, you've already been asked about those uh, daily event and safety reports that were uh, put out for convoy participants. Yes. I believe you've told us that you didn't have uh, direct involvement in these. They were put out by Tom Quiggin. Yeah, I'm not an intelligence analyst, and right. I figured he would be the best person to do that. And I think everybody agreed. 
And Tom Quiggin uh, was the host of the Quiggin Report, hosted on your podcast, correct? Uh, yeah. He also has worked for the RCMP, the Bank of Canada, military. Uh, he's got a very impressive CV in terms of uh, his career working for the government. Okay. Uh, do you recall seeing some of these daily event? I saw a couple of them, but I just got so overloaded with stuff uh, that I couldn't make this uh, my focus. But he was posting them, and he also has a social media account. So I believe he was posting them on his as well. So this looks to be the report from February 12th. We'll see that at the top of the report. Uh, and Mr. Clerk, I'll just have you scroll down to the very bottom. <laughs> so we have a daily humor and meme warfare section. Uh, from looking through a few of these reports, it seems like it was common to have a, a daily humor or joke section at the bottom of them. Lighten the load. It's okay. the, the sort of thing Elon Musk does. And so this uh, meme or, or humor section uh, has a caricature of someone labeled the honker. And it has uh, a variety of descriptors around uh, this caricature. It says, doesn't vandalize, just honks, uh, uses meme warfare in real life, creates a schedule of the honk for maximum freedom enhancing effects, disrupts the status quo by not letting people sleep in tyranny, withholds the soy from, the reach, from reaching the soy jack until freedom improves, uses the power of vibrating air to chase the prime minister out of the country, just straight up says to the crying soy jack, the honking will continue until freedom improves. <laughs> Train horn, not enough, we need a ship horn. And there are a variety of caricatures at the bottom uh, looking to have tears pouring out of their eyes, N their hands and their face. They're called NPCs in internet culture. And, and can you explain that to us, sir? A non-playable character is yeah. the term what it means, yeah. Uh, and, and we see the reference to the term soy jack. Do you, can you illuminate us on what the yeah. term soy jack refers to? <laughs> they, they were, you have to really, this is going down the rabbit hole of internet humor culture. Like it's a joke, right? It, it may not lend itself to legal proceedings, but this is, you know, I mentioned Elon Musk. This is the sort of thing that he would put out frequently. He's probably the most popular to do it. And also we knew there was a honking injunction so people would go out on social media and they would put hashtag honk honk. It wasn't people actually going outside and honking. It was their way to, to show their support for the convoy. But you would agree with me that this type of humor, whether it's in jest or not, is perhaps not getting the message across to convoy participants to lay off the horns in light of the injunction. Uh, no, I think it's, it's good to get people to have something that it might not be your type of humor, but for the people who were freezing in their trucks for three weeks, uh, they need something. They need some sort of pick-me-up. And I think for them, it's a, a way for people to vent, right? That's why we have free speech, for conflict resolution. And that's, the pow that's why humor was very important. And there's so many memes going around uh, the Internet for, through all, all, all of this. Some of it was, look, for me, some of it was too extreme and distasteful. I get it, but I'm not going to dictate what people should say, just, okay, that's not, that, that's not my thing. But then other, other stuff was great. It was, you know, you have a whole range of different worldviews and opinions because with people from all over the world that were supporting us. When I was in Colombia, there were people there who wanted to meet me because they were supporting. When I was in Miami, there were people who recognized me as Uber drivers that were supporting us. So you have a and, whole range of people with different worldviews. And in the interest of time, I won't take you to the second daily report of this nature, but okay. for the record, HRF 6043 uh, is a February 13th daily report okay. uh, that has a humor section along these lines as well. And I don't know if you re recall it off the top of your head, but there is a daily humor section at the bottom that says the supreme art of war is to tire the enemy with honking. <laughs> so something that you find equally funny along these lines, I take it. Well, it's not literally honking in your truck. Again, you'll, you'll probably see those memes were grabbed from the internet where people were putting memes up with the hashtag honk honk. That's where it all comes from. And lastly, sir, I'll just ask you a couple of other questions about sure. the impact, uh, just very briefly, on Ottawa residents and businesses. We heard you say this morning um, that you, uh, it was your understanding the Rideau Centre was open initially. 
Uh, yes, I was in there. I got coffee at uh, Tim Hortons. And and but you were aware it was only that first weekend that it was open. It closed very soon on that first weekend of protest and actually remained closed for the duration. You might understand that that came from the city that uh, they demanded that all the businesses <laughs> closed and the Rideau Center as well was one of them, which didn't make sense to us because the businesses we uh, we were attending they'd never been so busy. Like they were so happy. We had so many businesses tell us that they made record profits. Right? Yeah. So, sir, I'll, I would tell you that your information on that sounds to be inaccurate from uh, from our discussions with our, our BIA and uh, clients. <laughs> yeah. um, so who was it who told you the businesses were forced to close because of the city? Um, well, I think it was the Iconic Cafe was one of them. Uh, one of the shawarma places that stayed open. Uh, there's a number of videos online. One that just came out last week from somebody who works in uh, one of the restaurants and she said if uh, if i they, they were coming around to our restaurant the media was coming around telling us these people are dangerous you should close and she said if i wasn't there to see the media trying to coerce us to make us think the truckers were dangerous i might have believed it but she i was here i saw it i saw everybody was peaceful uh, we served you and it was great. So I think there was a little bit of some uh, narrative and politics going on there. Well, I, are I you know. are you aware, sir, that businesses, many businesses were forced to close because of maskless protesters and their concern about the fines that they as businesses might face if they were to stay open and have maskless patrons? I don't know. Uh, I, I can't comment to that. That might be the case. But I do know when my business was in downtown Toronto, uh, I would try to stay, po stay open every day of the week, especially when uh, university st students were in, in town. And if I had something like this, it would have been amazing. I, I, w I wished I would have had an event like this when I had my business in Toronto. Notwithstanding any concerns that, you know, young employees might face harassment or anything like that. You wouldn't have had concerns when you were running your business of those sorts of things. Truckers are very... You're well uh, over your time, uh, and I'm not sure this is getting anywhere. Um, so uh, the next uh, is uh, now is the Ontario Provincial Police. Yes, good afternoon, Commissioner. I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, the uh, I just let me just find out if we're going to have much more than I think I'll take the lunch break. Um, uh, will you have some questions uh, uh, for the uh, the witness, Mr. Uh, uh Yes, I will. Okay, Mr. and. Uh, Democracy Fund, JCCF, will you have questions? Not have any questions for this witness, no. no. And counsel for Mr. Slowly, will you have any? We'll have five minutes. Five minutes. And re-examination? Not, not at this time. Okay, so let's try and get through it then. Um, counsel for uh, former Chief Slowly, if you could go ahead. I'm uh, Nicholas DiStefano for former Chief Slowly. Hi, Mr. Dichter. Hi, Nicholas. Um, so we heard a lot about how you were part of a, a group, a corporation that represented sort of certain protesters, correct? Uh, yes. Um, but there were also other groups that were present in Ottawa protesting, correct? There were so many groups, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you stated earlier that there were more protesters than you expected there would be? I think, I, I think we all agree <laughs> to that. <laughs> right. Um, the, the events were just on a scale that you yourself and sort of members of your group just did not expect, correct? Uh, yes. And within your group, you testified that you sort of had people at the Sheraton that were responsible for messaging. Um, some of you were at the Arc Hotel responsible for logistics and others were at the Swiss Hotel sort of speaking with the police and dealing with the police, correct? Yep. Um, did you yourself interact with any of the PLT members from the OPS? Uh, no, I didn't. Can you, can you remind me who from your group was responsible for that? I don't know. I found out um, 
about uh, like I didn't realize that all the road captains, I don't know which ones had PLT and which ones didn't. Uh, it just seemed to be random. And maybe I understand the PLT is part time. That might have had something to do with it, because I do know there were occasions where some uh, drivers, captains, whatever, were trying to get in touch with PLT members and they couldn't. So but that's my I wasn't there <coughs> with a truck wasn't on the ground so there really was really no need for me to interact uh, with PLTs with the exception of the day that we left when I told all the truckers when I told all the truckers sorry I didn't tell them I said do you want to leave um, and I suggested call all your uh, your liaison officers and I'll meet you upstairs in a board meeting after in the boardroom afterwards and I walk up and Bridget is yelling and arguing with the PLT I'm like, just say you'll do whatever you want. You got to go home. You got to leave. Um, but I personally uh, didn't. So we heard some evidence uh, that Mr. Morazzo had been in contact with the PLT. I, I yes, correct. that's and true. You didn't know about that at the time? At the time, I didn't know. And, and you would have had no input into any of those discussions? Uh, no, because they seem to be running their own show. Right. And we also heard from you that when Mr. Morazzo um, or, sorry, we heard from you that when members of your group did indeed... Um, reach an agreement or a purport to reach an agreement about the movement of trucks that you did not agree with the outcome of that agreement, correct? Well, the whole idea of, I was told repeatedly that there's, uh, it's not going well. I didn't assume uh, not going well means there's a deal. So, and I don't know send the deal. We're not getting, a deal is two way, right? Just capitulating and saying we're leaving. Like if we told that to the trucker, truckers, they would lose their minds, get so angry. Right, and I'm not going to put the text message back up on the screen, yeah, yeah. but we, we saw a text message earlier uh, where you referred to thousands, thousands of protesters scolding you about the purported agreement. No, not, well, some were protesters, many of them were protesters, but we had so much online support, that's what was driving a lot of it. So a lot of it was people within Canada that were supporting, people that were in Ottawa that were supporting. So you had a whole mixed bag, and that was going on all the time, regularly. Like, there were people that were streaming in Twitter spaces, that's like a, a communal group, that they would be in a group that was live, meaning active people talking for 24, 36 hours straight with hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people. And on February 6th, you gave a press conference and you mentioned, uh, there's a transcription of this, I'm not gonna put it up on the screen, yeah. but, but you mentioned that um, in Ottawa, there were certain rabble rousers who were trying to make this about them and they were sort of outside of your group and outside of your entourage. You remember that? Uh, yeah. So we always had those other, there was the, our, you know, freedom court, what, you know, aligned with, let's say the, the GoFundMe where the money was being raised and there were all these other little groups for sure. And, and you stated that you couldn't police those people and you agree with that still? Uh, well, that's why I explained our uh, moral persuasion that we uh, definitely had influence with them and could communicate to them. And one of the things, by the way, we did communicate, uh, we're relieved with um, Chief Slowly when he said I, on February 3rd, I don't remember the date, when he said this requires a political solution. This is not a, not a, a policing solution because it's peaceful. And we were like, great, finally, there's a police chief that's not going to politicize everything. It was such a, it was a moment of hope for us. But you, you, you agreed that members of the protest that weren't part of your entourage were sort of independent operators, they were sort of free, th free thinkers, and you couldn't force them to do something that they wouldn't do, right? Like, for example, um, you're aware that Pat King was asked not to come to Ottawa at a certain point, and then he did indeed come, right? You, could, you couldn't force them to do something they didn't want to do. Which is what I understand uh, Tamara was trying to mitigate that, realizing that he's not going to, uh, he's going to, I don't want to latch on. But he's going to be like many other people. He's just going to come along. And I guess um, my understanding is the uh, strategy was just keep him under control. I keep him out of the limelight. And uh, but I had like I never met him. I've never talked to him. Don't know him. And, and just one last question, Mr. Commissioner. Um, and so you would agree with me then that even if your group was able to make some sort of agreement with the police, and that there was some sort of buy-in to that agreement and that it was mobilized, whether it be to stop honking or to move trucks somewhere, some of those rabble-rousers could have moved in and 
park their trucks in the exact same spot that they were moved out of or just simply not abided by it because you had no control over them. No, I disagree. Uh, and I disagree because people in the trucking industry, uh, it's a very regulated industry. We know rules, PARs, documents going across the border. Uh, it, you know, it's not the central casting uh, description of what a trucker is. It's, uh, it's far more corporate than people realize. So I was not terribly worried that, but there are people that are very passionate about it. Sometimes you need people that they need to have a little bit more hand-holding and talking and coming to consensus. And other people are just, no, I'm bored. Yeah, we'll do it. It just, it comes down to the individual. It's not truckers. It's individual people that you got to reach out to. Understood. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So the only remaining then is uh, Mr. Uh, Karalius. I may be pronouncing it wrong, but. Uh, Mr. Dichter, what can you tell the Commission about Twitter passwords? Uh, Twitter passwords can be easily changed if you have email and telephone access to your Twitter account. Um, who were the first seven members of the Freedom Corporation, if I can call it that, you gave the name earlier? Do you remember the names of the first seven directors of the corporation? Myself, Tamara Leach, Chris Barber, Chris Guerra, um, who am I forgetting? Chris Barber, Chris Guerra, Miranda, and somebody else. Sean Thiessen. What's your relationship with uh, Sean Thiessen? Uh, it was actually quite uh, quite good. You know, Sean and I actually connected better than uh, everybody. Like we really, I mean, maybe with the exception of Tamara, uh, seemed to be a pretty reasonable guy. And kept in touch with him. Well, when was the last time you spoke to Sean Thiessen? A few months ago. Uh, maybe it's now four or five months ago. No, I don't that long. A few months ago. Uh, can you share with the commission your conversation with Sean Thiessen at that time? Uh, yeah, Sean Thiessen explained to me that um, they were really upset with a tweet that you made, and they're going to try to pin this all on you, and they're going to make some narrative that it's your fault. And I remember thinking, like, I don't know how they're going to do that. And... Um, and I said, well, what's the rest of the board thinking? And he said, they're all really scared. Uh, Tamara and Chris have both criminal and civil charges. None of them have any experience in law. And uh, they feel like they're being held hostage um, to uh, the JCCF for free legal uh, advice and legal counsel because they don't have any money to, um, to fight a multi-million dollar class action suit. And he was very... Uh, he was very direct about that. Um, earlier, my friend from the convoy organizers asked you, um, um, asked you about your membership or your position in the uh, convoy organization. Um, are you still a member of the convoy organization? Apparently, I am. Uh, there's been some dispute in the questions as to who was retained by the Corporation, so I'm not going to get into the details of uh, whether JCCF was retained or Mr. Wilson, but can you just tell me in your experience dealing with uh, lawyers, um, I think you testified that your uh, mom was a paralegal. What do lawyers get retained to do? Uh, get retain I'm, I'm not sure how where this is going. I'm, uh, I'm not sure that's evidence that is uh, relevant to the case, uh, but... Uh, Maybe you can explain it to me. Uh, sure. He was, um, my friend from the convoy organizers was asking Mr. Dichter uh, about the relationship with uh, counsel. And uh, I don't think that evidence has been provided accurately. Mr. Dichter has his, uh, an opportunity here to answer the question, what his uh, perspective as a member of director of the convoy organization, what they hired lawyers to do, what the job of those lawyers uh, was to do and what they were uh, doing on behalf of uh, the board. That's what I'm trying to get at. You have a submission? Yes, sir. Uh, first, my friend is getting into something that may in fact be privileged and the board has not waived that privilege as a whole. Uh, second, uh, I don't understand what the relevance and materiality of any of this is to whether or not the Emergencies Act should have been invoked. Okay. I think certainly what he, uh, I don't believe your client can waive the privilege. I think that's fundamental. 
So I'm not sure, again, what this is relevant to. Um, okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a couple other questions, and I'll see if okay. uh, I can reframe it. Okay. Um, you're a defendant in the class action uh, that came up earlier. Um, after the uh, injunction on the horn honking took place, um, are you aware, aware of anyone uh, in Ottawa that faced uh, any charges or any other legal ramifications after the injunction to stop uh, honking uh, uh, was, was put in place by the court? Uh, charges relating to honking? No. Uh, you're aware in that same proceeding, um, there was a series of Mareva injunctions and escrow orders. Yes. Uh, can you tell the commission your experience with uh, as a defendant in that proceeding, uh, uh, your experience with those Mareva injunctions and escrow orders? Well, I was receiving privileged emails from Keith Wilson and his agent with regards to the Mariva injunction up until, I believe, May of this year. So uh, my understanding was they were still representing me. And what were you asked to do as part of the those court orders? Oh, I was to surrender um, the seed phrase of the Bitcoin, which is a combination, to uh, the Bitcoin app, of which there were five codes or five seed phrases, and I had one of them. And and what did you do with that uh, seed phrase and the, and the code? I submitted it to Keith Wilson via his agent, um, Norm Groot, who was representing me in the, uh, uh, in the Mariva agent, and my understanding is that went to the bankruptcy trustee or whoever deals with it. Uh, you, you testified uh, earlier with my friends from the... Um, Ottawa Neighborhood Association, apologies if I'm not uh, identifying the party correctly, uh, that the term honking uh, uh, became uh, popular as a tag. What was the incident during the protests that led to um, honking becoming uh, something that would get traction on social media online? Uh, the particular incident? Uh there was um, a number of things uh, there, particularly when they, the, the tenor of the protest changed, um, when those first videos came out. Um, but then you start to see a lot of uh, people getting on board. It became popular. There was a, a Bitcoin drive. It just became like a, a meme. Uh, and a cultural significantly event online with uh, on, t on Twitter and social media in general. Was the hashtag honking or honk more popular after the horn injunction or less popular? Uh, it was more popular because they couldn't honk. It was the only thing they could do is type uh, hashtag honk. Are you suggesting that the hashtag honk replaced actual honking on yeah, the street? exactly. Um, if I can ask the clerk to bring up HRF 1291, page 55, it's a long PDF. I apologize. Uh, there's a series of text messages between uh, Dean French and Mr. Wilson. So what page did you say? Page 55 of the PDF. Okay. Mr. Dictor, do you see that? Uh, it's fuzzy, but I can see it. Yes. Can you read it? Uh, yes, he's excited to get your call. Please remind your board, I never once spoke to Premier Ford about this or Katie Telford, uh, Journo's chief, and then he corrected as Trudeau. Who's Katie Telford? Uh, that's the chief of staff of the prime minister. Is, the, is, there, is there? Can you tell us about the significance of this text message from Mr. French to Mr. Wilson? Well, this would indicate that, firstly, he has the ability to reach out to the Premier and the Prime Minister um, if he wanted, and he's clearly uh, a significant, significantly politically connected uh, figure. And in your time providing messaging on behalf of uh, uh, the protests or the corporation, did anyone from the Premier's office or the Prime Minister's office approach you for a discussion to get to a peaceful resolution? No, never, not once.
just uh, one second, Mr. Commissioner. HRF 1325, please, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Dichter, you uh, identified the members, the directors of the corporation. Um, you see this uh, document seems to be meeting notes from a meeting at City Hall. Yeah. Yep. What directors from the corporation were at this meeting? Uh, looks like Chris Barber, and that's all. Can you say that again, please? Uh, Chris, Chris Barber and no one else. These are not board members. Okay, your time is up. Do you, uh, is there uh, anything that you need to deal with or can we wrap this up? I think we are close to wrapping it up. If you can just give me 15 seconds, Mr. Commissioner. That's perfect. There is an, uh, an email in evidence, and I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to look for the number. And at the, uh, it's an email from Mr. Wilson to you. And the third line of the email says, Trudeau will be pissed. Can you tell us uh, your opinion on that line from Mr. Wilson to you? Okay. Trudeau will be pissed. I've I just wait a minute. There's an objection, Sorry. sir. Um, this witness is being asked to interpret a document not authored by him and give his opinion of it. And I don't again see how any of this is relevant. It was an email from Mr. Wilson to Mr. Dichter, submitted in evidence. Um, uh, and I'd like Mr. Dichter to share his thoughts on uh, what he thought of an email concluding with Trudeau will be pissed meant from Mr. Wilson. We don't have context. I don't even know what he's referring to, sir. And okay, I, don't I can see take the a few minutes. I'll find you the document. I just thought for the, I think it I wasn't think, a, a document I, submitted by Mr. Dichter. I assume the other parties knew the document. Yeah, if you're going to refer to the document, I think we have to have it brought up so that. We'll, we'll try to identify it. Just give us a moment. Okay. So do you have a reference for the number or a reference number? I'm trying to find it, Mr. Commissioner. I apologize. Uh, for counsel, do you have the date uh, at all of this uh, potential email? Do you have the date for it? Um, HRF Can you read the email to yourself, Mr. Dick? Do you see the last line I'm telling you about? Yes. Um, when you read a line from Mr. Wilson and at the time Trudeau is going to be pissed, uh, can you tell us, um, uh, can you give commission such, shed some light to the commission on uh, what you're reading there? I was quite shocked. Uh, I produce a podcast with lawyers. My mother's a paralegal. I've been around lawyers my whole life. I've never, I've never seen lawyers speak like that. I thought we were getting professional counsel. Yeah. We got Pat King in a suit. Okay. Sir, yes. I don't understand this, and I would note that my friend has just put up evidence proving that this individual knew about the deal. But other than that, I don't think it's appropriate for him to comment on Trudeau is going to be pissed and his view of what is appropriate language and what is not. And we, I don't want to get into the case law about what that is and how lawyers are allowed to communicate, and I don't need to, I don't think, the Groya decision, et cetera. But, uh, sir, this is not relevant. Yeah, I, okay. I disagree. It goes to the motivation of the individual sending the email to Mr. Dichter. And, well, um, I, I think you've put the question. It's been answered. If the document's there, we'll have to deal with it. So thank, thank you, you. Commissioner. Okay, any re-examination? No, Mr. Commissioner. No. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so that you're now free to uh, to go. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. We're going to.
No, 55 minutes. We're going to take a little bit shorter today and come back uh, at uh, 2.30. The commission is in recess until 2.30. The commission is elevated to 14 hours 30. Freedom in 2022 is certainly about being able to make free choices for ourselves and for our family, who we believe are the best. We have seen so much suffering over the last two years. People who die alone in terrible conditions, people losing dream jobs, polarized families, and a society that insult and yell at each other for making a different medical choice. But people have risen, and it will be through them that the future will have an important meaning for all of you, but especially for the next generation. Ruben News has been present at every step of this great challenge, but so many other pioneers whom you could meet and hear at our great conference about freedom for our beautiful country, which is Canada. This conference, which will be held in Calgary and Toronto, will show you the faces of the influence of freedom that you have seen over the past two years. You don't want to miss this. So get your ticket now at ribbonnewslive.com. And it will be a pleasure to see you there and meet you in large numbers. It's time to drop these masks and let the truth shine. Hello everyone, good evening everyone, good uh, afternoon. I am joined here by Celine Gallas, a Rebel News reporter from Alberta. Celine, how are you doing? I'm doing really fantastic. I left this morning in a blizzard and I came to Ottawa and it's like plus 15 degrees. So that's great. one great, good thing in Ottawa right now. The great corrupt liberal city of Ottawa. You know, the architecture <laughs> is beautiful here, but the people not quite the same. If you want to let us know your thoughts throughout the live stream, you can always go on Rumble or Odyssey, send us paid chats, and we'll do our best to read it on air at the end of the live stream. Later on, we will have Freedom Convoy volunteer, not quite organizer, participant, public persona, Tom Razzo coming on. And we'll also have leader of the Ontario Party here in Ontario, Derek Sloan, come on as well to discuss the Emergencies Act inquiry and everything that has happened today. Uh, also, just so that you guys know, on November 19th and November 25th, we will have Rebel News Live events in both Toronto and Calgary. Um, and in the Toronto event, I believe that we will have Tamara Leash participant, uh, participate as a speaker. So you will be able to hear from uh, the great Tamara Leash, convoy organizer Tamara Leash as well. So Celine, this was your first day in Ottawa. What was your main takeaway from today? 
Um, well, again, besides the weather, it's just really interesting to see. There's some protesters that have started to show up um, outside of where the emergency commission is being held here in Ottawa. Um, I can only imagine that where there are one, there will be many more to follow. So that'll be interesting. Um, I really thought that it was very interesting what uh, Tom Razzo screamed for all the people in the back, what we we're thinking uh, for the last three years. But when he actually refused to talk to mainstream media, um, that was really interesting. I believe we have one of those clips as well. But um, again, that's something that a lot of people have been saying. And it's nice to have people publicly refuting or refusing to speak with mainstream media. Yeah, I think we've heard both Chris Barber, one of the organizers of the Freedom Convoy, and Tom Marazzo as well, in both of their testimony, discuss um, the way that they see mainstream media has manipulated the narrative, has vilified yes. the Freedom yeah. Convoy. I think that's the reason why people were so upset in mainstream media, because they weren't giving them a fair they share. They were portrayed correctly. Well, yeah. exactly. They were vilifying the people participating in the Freedom Convoy. We can see on the screen right here, Tom Marazzo refusing to take a question from one of the mainstream media reporters earlier today. So today, just a reminder, we had a Freedom Convoy lawyer, Keith Wilson, mm -hmm testify in front of the commission. We also had Freedom Convoyer Tom Morato testify as well. And we had Pat King who ended the day. I think he might still be giving his testimony, yeah. uh, King, yeah. at the moment. That is, that is very possible. Um, so Celine, you've been following also, I, I think that you've been following the con, not the convoy, the emergency second inquiry for the past weeks as well, for the past yeah, three weeks. I agree. That's right. It's been a long three weeks. Um, we always talk about what we're seeing throughout the inquiry. We also talk, uh, talk about our takeaway from the inquiry. What was your takeaway from the past three weeks? Well, um, as some of you might know, I was actually there when the convoy first arrived in Ottawa. I showed up the night, the same, the same night that the truck started to pile in um, around the parliament building and down Wellington. And um, from that point onward until the police came and crashed it, it was peaceful. Mm -hmm. So my main takeaway from the Emergencies Act inquiry is that, uh, again, there's a lot of discussion around even what they're calling the protesters, if they're protesters, you know, if they're if they're racist, if they're misogynist, if, if they're sexist, then the narratives just keeps on changing. And when you see so many inconsistencies with stuff like this, um, I think it's fairly obvious that it's it's a cover up that's going on. That's my opinion, at least that I believe that it's a cover up. And there is no way that you can actually with all of the, mm -hmm. the proof, all the videos from the very beginning since those trucks got there um, to the very end. No one can tell me that they were anything except peaceful. 100%. You were also part of the Freedom Convoy. Um, and you, we heard, as you just mentioned, Paul Champ, lawyer, that's, that keeps arguing um, about how non-peaceful, about how threatening the Freedom Convoy people were. Uh, we heard Zexy Lee say that the people, the people that were part of the Freedom Convoy were harassing citizens, even though we learned that the whole, the own citizens of Ottawa who were opposing the Freedom Convoy were throwing eggs. Eggs are egging them, the exactly. Protesters. Yeah. They were egging the protesters. Yeah. Is what you're hearing right now from the testimonies of these anti-convoy people what you, the same thing as you've witnessed as a journalist in Ottawa? Um, no, <laughs> like absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, I left before things, um, before the police started to really like pile in there and like crack down on the peaceful protesters. So I just saw the very beginning where everyone was still in very much in a state of awe. And um, it was the first time that you saw so many people smiling together, laughing, being merry, cheering. That was kind of, that was the norm that people were looking for. Mm -hmm. So when you have people like Zexy Lee who are testifying and trying to validate throwing eggs at trucks and at protesters because there was honking or like microaggressions and people were being offended. Um, it's very interesting. Like, how can you validate something like that? What do you think? Yeah, well, it, it's so crazy. And we've seen there's there's a single counter protester. Well, a protester actually that been, that's been here for the past for the past few days in front of the commission building that's been calling the truckers, the Freedom Convoy people, terrorists, that's been calling them racist, that's been calling them far-right lunatics. We see her right <laughs> here. Really... And not a single supporter of the Freedom Convoy has laid a finger on her. I think yeah. they were re-terrorists. Something like that would have happened. And we have yet to see any violence that's been yeah. inflicted that's been put on this woman yes. for protesting Tamara Leach, protesting Tom Marazzo, protesting yeah. the Freedom Convoy people. Yeah. Well, especially like think about how Antifa was brought into yeah. this as well, right? So you had aggressors in the crowd that were trying to pretend that they were part of the, the freedom movement um, as these, pre these peaceful protesters. And 
you could see even I remember being there um, when so many people would take interviews from Mocha and myself or Alexa Lavoie or Lincoln J, um, anyone from Rebel or actual independent media. But you had people with huge cameras going and standing behind like police lines, casting this right. very ominous shadow over this crowd, making it look very dangerous. And that is not a part of the narrative um, that the people there mm-hmm. like actually saw, listened to. That's not what what they're portrayed as because the mainstream media is very, very good at uh, taking those angles and making sure that uh, the truth is smooth. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why Tom Morazzo refused to answer questions from, from the mainstream media. I think that's the I reason so. why. I would think um, so. No, we've got some great, great guests that are about to come on in a few minutes. So just tell us a bit more, one last thing, tell us a bit more about what you're going to do here in Ottawa, what you plan on doing for the next three weeks. Yeah. So I'm going to be here to live tweet the court proceedings, just as you've seen many of the, the rebel journalists have been doing. Um, and beyond that, I'll be here to um, scrum mm-hmm. some of the people that are testifying as well, alongside William here. I know he's, he's really, he's really got a hold on that, but I definitely want a piece of the action and um, also grant a little bit of a Western perspective because um, someone obviously born and raised in the West and from so many people of the like seeing so many members of the the freedom movement, the convoy come up from the West coast all the way to the East mm-hmm. to be a part of this. I think that's a really interesting perspective to hold those compare those uh, comparisons. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a big movement. Well, thanks for coming on. And I truly look forward to be working with you in the next, next few days, next few weeks. Absolutely. Thanks all right. Let's take a good. short break. And then when we come on, we will have Tom Morazzo join us to talk about his testimony. <laughs> Freedom in 2022 is not sitting idly by while health diktats with no skin in the game make up all the rules. If you're like me and want to play an active role in upholding civil liberties and freedoms for all Canadians, for our children and eventually our grandchildren, then come out to our Rebel Live event and get to know us in person while hearing from some of the most influential leaders in the freedom movement. We have events in Toronto on November the 19th and in Calgary on Saturday, November 26th. Tickets are on sale now at rebelnewslive.com. Come out, have lunch, get some Rebel swag, meet the Rebels and more. You don't want to miss this event. Check it out, rebelnewslive.com. everyone, William Diaz here with Rebel News, currently at the Library and Archives building uh, in Ottawa for the Emergencies Act inquiry, the inquiry that is happening because Justin Trudeau used a never seen before anti-terrorism law on peaceful protesters in February back when the convoy was here in town to basically euthanize weeks of peaceful protests against COVID-19 mandates. And this morning, Freedom Convoy lawyer Keith Wilson was testifying in front of the committee. He spoke about hate speech. He spoke about organizational issues that the convoy organizers face while trying to plan the whole convoy and difficulties they were facing throughout the duration of the protest. So as he was coming out of the room, we were able to ask him a few questions. Here's what uh, Wilson had to say. Just, you said that your, your wife's assessment of the government overreach during the COVID-19 pandemic was what pushed you to you know, work with the convoy. Were you? Would you say, just out of curiosity, that you were an apolitical person before that? Or less concerned with the civil liberties and everything? Uh, was I? Yeah. Well, I can assure you this. My wife was. Um, she was extremely apolitical and busy with uh, uh, her own activities and uh, caring for our elderly parents and doing work with her church. But her medical training was such that she observed the advice that was starting to come from the public health officials and doing her own research. And she said, this doesn't add up anymore. Um, And she became very concerned about the direction of the country, the level of overreach, uh, the mandates, the harm that they were causing to children in schooling, playgrounds, um, normal activities that she said, you got to get involved. Yeah. You know, we heard the Government of Canada Council talk about hate speech. What are your views on hate speech and hate speech laws uh, by the federal government? Well, my view is that in any other modern democracy, for a prime minister to call 
six million Canadians, racist misogynists, and say, how do we deal with these people? And should we tolerate these people? Would result in such a level of reaction that that prime minister would be forced to resign and apologize. And the fact that this prime minister deliberately divided and created hate, engaged in the process of othering people, mm -hmm. and so far has suffered no political consequences, absolutely remarkable. Do you think? Do you think if the prime minister has spoken with the protesters, you guys would have been here for less long, or the situation would have been resolved quicker than it was? You know, it's amazing that none of the protesters and the leadership and otherwise wanted to meet with the prime minister. It's not an individual they hold in high regard. It's a it's an individual that they believe has done unbelievable harm to our country, to its social fabric, and to our economy, and so on and is engaged in uh, uh, reprehensible conduct in terms of uh, his hate speech. Uh, there was a strong desire and numerous requests to sit down with some of the federal ministers and have a substantive discussion about the policy foundations of the mandates. Because remember, the other G7 countries were not doing this. A lot of Canadians don't realize that, that we were a significant anomaly. They were not restricting their citizens who were unvaccinated from traveling within their country, from getting on airplanes and trains. The Americans didn't even do it, and they're a bit of an anomaly too in terms of the extreme measures they took. So, um, you know, is the science different? No. Are, are aircraft different from, one of, from, from Europe to here? No. Um, is the virus different? No. So it was purely a political exercise. There was a hope that if we could establish a dialogue, and put the scientific evidence forward um, that the government may take a reasoned approach and follow the lead of all the other G7 countries that weren't imposing these extremely restrictive mandates um, and, and would lift them. So do you think that the convoy deserved a policing response or something else? What, what, what nature were the police leaks uh, about? Sorry. The, the police uh, leaks that you were talking about? Of what nature were they? Uh, constant and extensive. So do you think, do you think the convoy operations, what operational, uh, who was going to do what, when, and where? At so do you know exactly how the police were going to act on a day-to-day -day basis. That's correct. Hour by hour. When you when you when you take, you know, I don't, you know, twenty percent of your force, mm -hmm. and say because you're not going to take an experimental injection, you're going to lose your job, and you force them out. Um, or you say um, the only way you're going to keep your job and make your mortgage payment and provide for your family is if you take it, and you do take it, uh, you know, uh, there, there was a lot of police officers then and now that believed that what the government did was absolutely wrong. So, so do you think that the convoy... Did they communicate with, to you or to other people? Uh, from they the communicated extensively with individuals... Um, involved in the, the convoy protest um, regularly. Police and with not, not with me personally. Which uh, services which, uh, that were leaking? All of them. Ex military? RCMP as well? as well? Yes. Military? Active well? RCMP officers leaked to uh, the convoy? Yes. OPP, uh, Ottawa Police? Yes. Uh, uh, STRS? Uh, no, uh, CSIS. CSIS. Yes. Yes, awesome. CSIS, yeah. The, uh, not military, because the only information we got from the military was the military was not going to get involved. The Active agent asked from the you CSIS. at the end of your uh, testimony and cross-examination today about whether police had offered any zone to protest in. And he's asked this of a couple of other witnesses as well. Mm. Where do you think that question's coming from? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's an important question from the commissioner because it illustrates one of the ways in, this, in which this could be de-escalated de and managed. And I believe it's becoming more and more clear from the evidence that that's not what the Prime Minister was interested in. He was interested in escalation. He was interested in confrontation. And by the Commissioner asking and exploring this topic so thoroughly about alternative options to um, uh, de-escalate things indicates to me that he wants to ensure when he reaches his conclusion, 
Is it the case that all these other alternatives were in fact not pursued? If what police had been? offered uh, an option where you could continue to protest as individuals, but no trucks, no vehicles allowed, would that have been something you would have recommended protesters accept? I think that would have been a natural progression. You could see how we were already on a trajectory of significantly lessening the footprint and converting it into a more traditional protest. So I think the progress progression that we were on was to consolidate Wellington, 75% of the vehicles leave to the remote locations with half of those going home, people being shuttle bussed in, the mayor talked about that. And then I could have seen them saying, all right, maybe we put up barricades like they have now on Wellington Street at this very moment that the government put up and, and turn it into a pedestrian protest. I could have seen that a progression. That's what we were working towards. This, this idea that you can snap your fingers and resolve this, is not, it was a complex problem, as I testified, required a, a complex solution with phases to it. We were on our way to implementing those and we got stopped. At which point did it become illegal, you think? At which point did it become illegal, you think? At no point did it become illegal. At no point was the Riot Act read as required under the criminal code. At no point was, was any of the legal criteria that are necessary to declare a protest to be unlawful were met. There's no evidence of it. And in fact, um, uh, counsel for the barrister, Mr. Brendan Miller, has a asked a, a number of police officials and they have acknowledged they took none of the steps and the criteria for it to be an illegal protest were never met. So uh, this is, this is a, a term of art that's creeped into the discussion. And I've always questioned at what point in time uh, does the person believe that it was illegal and on what legal basis? And if you ask them that question, they just go, oh, well, I just thought that many people being around is illegal. No, that's not how the law works. It requires more precision. You Mr. Said, Wilson, said, the military intelligence reports that you received internally talked a lot about Antifa. Did it talk about the concerns over sovereign citizens uh, as well as QAnon? Did any of those internal intelligence reports by uh, Tom Quick address those issues? Um, Can you go to the camera, please? The, they were they were daily. Are you with her? Okay. Uh, we were. They were daily reports. However, I they were not something that was mission critical for me, so I rarely read them. You called them weirdos, though. Like some of the you were saying there was uh, seances happening in hotels. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, there was uh, diverse Canadians with um, um, uh, some. Uh, uh, various strange following practices that showed up. I think that's clear. You've got, there was that one cult uh, that showed up that uh, was difficult for mani to, to manage for the police and for the protesters. You, you said before that, that you didn't control all the different convoy elements, that no one controlled all the different convoy that's elements. That's right. I'm wondering, given that, how confident you are that if the government had offered a different solution, a different site of protest or something like that, that you would have been able to get people to, to move to it? My simple answer to that is, look what happened on the Monday. Despite all the problems that the police admitted to, blocking, blocking the, the movement of the trucks, over 100 vehicles were moved, most of which left downtown, and only 23 went up to Wellington. That's proof of the plan having um, uh, the ability to be successful. It's proof that the um, moral suasion that some of the symbolic leaders of the protest had, um, it illustrates that there were many involved who needed to find a way to gracefully and respectfully leave and, and, and bring this to an end and return home. We were alive to all those dynamics and the plan that we started to implement was working until it was stopped by the police. The police notes in evidence the testimony under oath from the police have confirmed that they were the ones that blocked the deal from being completed. Had they supported it, and we would have had the entire downtown but for Wellington opened up and cleared out by the Wednesday, whereas bringing in the Emergencies Act and use of force against peaceful Canadians didn't get completed until the Saturday and the Sunday. So do you think that the convoy deserved a policing solution or a political solution? I think it clearly required a political solution. Um, and the fact that when progress was made, it was through political dialogue. That's how we used to do things in Canada. 
we would have discussions and we would be respectful and listen to diff different views. It hasn't been our history to unleash riot police on a scale never occurred before on nonviolent, unarmed, peaceful Canadians holding on to a copy of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And Just how was the relationship with the LRT the during the during the convoy, the PLT, sorry, the police liaison team throughout the convoy? It ebbed and flowed. The frustration was we didn't know what we now know with all the testimony and the infighting that was occurring and the power struggles with the police. But what we we sensed at the time, because I was in all those negotiations, is they didn't have power. You know, they couldn't follow through. Um, so that's why Mr. Morazzo early on um, requested an inspector level. I really believe that if we would have had um, uh, some police from the OPP and the Ottawa City Police that were further up the chain of command, this would have been resolved peacefully and de-escalated many days sooner. Just, so just about the the organizers. You were talking about. Could you turn the, to the just, camera, please? So, <laughs> about the uh, you know the group the Farfada. Okay, so um, they're everywhere in the police uh, reports, and uh, apparently they were aggressive and they wouldn't move and they were. Um, since you were on the ground, so what? How? What do you know about them? Uh, is it true that they were uh, dangerous, as the police uh, seem to be saying in their reports? Uh, what do you know about that? Well, the first time I heard that expression was here in the inquiry. None of the key people that were involved with the Freedom Convoy and working to negotiate and uh, seek clearing of intersections and so on had ever heard of the term before either. Um, um, the, the, the protesters who were at the intersection of Rideau and Sussex were comprised of uh, some people from, from Quebec who had some very strong views, some of whom had lost custody of children and lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods. But it was also comprised, interestingly, of your, uh, immigrants from, recent immigrants from Eastern Europe, as well as immigrants from Cuba. And they had seen the tyranny, they had seen how authoritarian uh, governments evolve, and they were deeply concerned about what they were seeing here in Canada with the COVID mandates and the restrictions on rights and freedoms. So they were very, very motivated. So the threats posed apparently by the Fafada are what, overblown? What are you? Absolutely overblown. You could see in the testimony yesterday, they thought uh, Mr. Charland was the head of the group at uh, Rideau in Sussex. Mm. We all looked him up because we didn't know his name. Uh, we looked up his pictures. He, we didn't recognize him. And he testified that the only time he was at Rideau in Sussex was when he walked through as he was walking through the downtown like anybody else. So uh, I don't know where the police got their intelligence on him, but you can see how badly off it was. Given that uh, the authorities were so concerned about these elements of like Farfada, like the sovereign citizens, like QAnon, do you think that your organization, the, the organizers that you represented, could have distanced themselves from these groups earlier on? Um, well, the group... The, the, camera, please? the first time the group uh, Farfada was mentioned for anybody with the Freedom Convoy was here at the at the inquiry um, so there was no known group to distance from sovereign citizens uh, some of the uh, the Nazi flags that were displayed that first weekend some of the uh, extreme right-wing groups that were present do you think that the freedom convoy organizers could have distanced themselves early on you distanced yourselves from Pat King could you have made a statement earlier on given the fact that the federal government police authorities seem more most concerned about these elements is that a strategy that you would want to revisit in retrospect the protesters were very clear that they wanted government overreach to stop, that they wanted the Charter of Rights and Freedoms respected for all Canadians of all ethnic backgrounds, um, that they wanted the rule of law adhered to, and the fact that so many of the protesters were from Canadians and immigrants of all ethnic and religious backgrounds, um, uh, it, it, to any honest observer would conclude that uh, this was not some right-wing extremist movement uh, at all. We know that at Coventry Road, there were sovereign citizens deputizing themselves. Like, do you denounce that? Do you think that's a legitimate response to protest? What do you make of those, those elements? 
Uh, I remember getting a phone call from an urgent phone call from one of the PLTs who advised that uh, some sovereign citizens had arrived at Coventry and they were seeking to deputize some of the truckers. Um, uh, I called that in and uh, a number of uh, representatives with a law enforcement background who were with the truckers immediately went over there and explained to the truckers that it was nonsense and told the sovereign citizen types to leave. You know, we're three weeks into the inquiry. Would, have, would you have done anything differently in the convoy knowing everything that we know right now? Just repeat your question. Would you have acted any differently during the convoy? We're three weeks into the inquiry. Would you have done anything differently uh, now we're three weeks within the inquiry? Uh, with respect to the inquiry? To the convoy, like the organization of the convoy, everything related to the convoy. Would you have done anything differently? Not that I can think of. I mean, everybody was trying to make the best decisions we could at the time. It was a very, very dynamic environment with lots of moving parts, lots of uncertainty. Um, I was impressed continually by the repeated message of peacefulness of not engaging with the police, not engaging when it, with Antifa when they would come and vandalize the trucks, but instead turn those people over to the police for arrest. Um, uh, that would be my answer. Just last thing for me, could you talk to us a little bit about Tamara Leach's bail condition, Chris Barber's bail condition? I think Chris Barber also has bail conditions. So can you tell us more about those? Yeah, the frustrating thing for Tamara Leach is that she's effectively under a gag order and that's why she's not able to speak to the media. She would love to speak to the media, but she doesn't want to go back to jail. And um, so unless the media wants to interview her about how she learned to play the guitar and what it's like to be a grandmother, uh, she can't do media interviews. She'd love to, but she can't. That's why she's excited about this opportunity to testify, because this is going to be her first chance to be able to tell her story and send her message uh, and her views share them with others without risking going to jail. And Chris? Uh, Chris, uh, his bail conditions aren't as restrictive. Um, a lot of them relate to contact with others and, uh, and other, other matters, but because the bail conditions are drafted in such a vague way, and the Crown prosecutor on this case has demonstrated such repeated passion, using his own word, um, uh, and over uh, given enlarged interpretation to the vague language uh, as as part of the legal team we've had to be ultra cautious in um, ensuring that we don't misstep and they inadvertently don't breach their bail conditions so there you have it everyone here's what keith wilson lawyer for the freedom convoy for tamara leash for tom morazzo had to say to our questions thank you for watching this is william diaz here with rebel news to stay up to date with what is going on here in Ottawa throughout the Emergencies Act inquiry for a whole six weeks and support our independent journalism of the inquiry, make sure to visit truckercommission.com. Freedom in 2022 is your right to disagree with me anytime on anything in your heart, online or in the public square. Freedom in 2022 is also your right to live your life however you see fit without hurting me or for that matter being bothered by me. But freedom in 2022 is in very real danger under constant attack by Justin Trudeau through his censorship bills, his attacks on gun rights, his attacks on farmers, and his attacks on peaceful protesters. These people have even tried to denormalize our flag. At Rebel News, we're not afraid to have dangerous discussions that Justin Trudeau, the media, and big tech censors say we're not allowed to have. And we want to have them with you at our upcoming Rebel Live events, first in Toronto, November 19th, and again in Calgary, Saturday, November 26th. I'll be there with dozens of other rebels and rebel adjacent free thinkers, and I hope that you'll join us. Just go to rebelnewslive.com to get your tickets today, but do not sleep on this because these tickets are going fast. See you soon.
It's great to have you on, Tom. How are you doing? I'm good. I feel like I've just uh, written my final exams for the, the school year. <laughs> so Tom Rosso was one of the witnesses testified earlier to, during the commission. And I think it's been probably five live streams since we didn't have you on. So can you explain your, okay, can you explain who you are? Can you tell our viewers uh, a little bit about your background, who, who you are, what you're doing here in Ottawa? Well, I only have 40 minutes. So yeah, no. <laughs> um, yeah so I've been here. Uh, I did participate in the convoy in January and February. And uh, I was summoned or subpoenaed to come here and testify at the Public Order Emergency Commission, uh, which is where I've been for the last couple of weeks since it started. We're on, I think, day 15 of the uh, all the testimony. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just here with the lawyers and some of the other witnesses, Tamara Leach, or Leach sorry, and uh, Chris Barber. And uh, we're, we're just assisting the legal team with a lot of the fine detail uh for when other people testify we can fill in a lot of the the blanks that maybe the, the our lawyers don't have mm -hmm. so and then my part-time gig is i come on here uh most nights yeah. <laughs> and usually i'm the one that's better no, dressed between I both of us but say you're yeah. the one who's uh i would have been upset if you didn't mention at least the tie with a proper shirt yeah, exactly. You don't have the puppy though, but you have yeah. a tie, you have a suit. I've been telling you for yeah. for a few weeks now, wear a tie, wear a tie. I know, I know. First time you wear it, I'm, I'm not even wearing it myself. I know. So, you know, the clip that we saw earlier, the first clip that we looked mm -hmm. at right before you came on mm -hmm. was a clip from the scrum that you did after the commission, right after the commission, after yeah. your testimony yeah. uh, with the media that were there. Well, not every media as we see. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to that a little bit later, but there's so much to unpack from both yeah. your testimony, Keith's testimony. Mm -hmm what we saw today let's let's throw one of the clips from um tom's testimony from from today i guess i'll take just just a second sure we, we can take a look at the first one mm -hmm. noticed things that i never before believed that i would see in in canada related to the way the police and bylaw and the government were going after Canadians. And for the first time in my life, I was, you know, actually afraid of police. And I have several friends that are police officers. And I had a phone call with uh, Randy Hillier one day, and Randy didn't know who I was. This was, uh, I sent an email to him and Roman Babber and other people, and months later, his office had returned the call. And Randy doesn't even recall the, the conversation. And they said, you know, I spent 25 years in my, of my life in the military, and for the first time, I'm actually afraid in my own country. And he said, you know, never be afraid. Like, you can't be afraid of the police or the government. They're, they're here to serve us. And I think for me, that kind of flipped a, a switch, uh, where I was like, I, I, I went from thinking, I'm afraid to get uh, arrested or beaten by the police, or getting an $880 fine to, you know what, now I want the fine. I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to hide from these people anymore. Um, and so that started to mentally transition the way I thought. And then we came to a point where I thought, well, at some point, the, the lawyers are going to step in and intervene and, and start protecting the public. And, and they didn't, except for a few. Then when the COVID, the vaccine came out, I thought, well, the medical community is going to stand up. And, and put a stop to this because of informed consent. And they, and they didn't, uh, except for a few. And it was the truckers that gave me an opportunity to actually get into, you know, fighting for, for my kids' rights. Well, first of all, I think that she did extremely well during the testimony. It was really great to watch both you and Keith. I think both of you did a great job. Um, I think the clip that we just saw right here, a lot of Canadians are feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. I believe at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of Canadians were willing to comply with the rules, were willing to go along with the authoritarian mandates that were placed to them. And I think through the pandemic, when they saw the government actually overreaching a lot, and we even saw Keith talk about it, that's the yeah. reason why he became involved with GCCF, became involved with the Freedom Convoy. I think that's how a lot of Canadians are feeling. What did you think of that? Yeah, I like I learned a lot about uh, how Canadians felt when I was campaigning with the Ontario Party. Mm -hmm. uh, every day we would go out to an event and we would talk to ordinary Canadians and the level of fear and anxiety that people felt in this country uh, you know, like you saw in the video, it, there are things that I never ever thought that I would experience in Canada. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, unfortunately, we did. And in the horror stories that I heard uh, over and over and over while campaigning were very reflective of the things that I was seeing. In fact, I was watching Rebel Media um, long before uh, I was involved in the convoy. My my actual source of of good unedited information was coming from rebel and and a few other alternative media sources i i knew i couldn't trust the mainstream media but mm -hmm. what i was seeing was uh how i was feeling and um you know it just it's it's really heartbreaking to to acknowledge that that is the reality in this country mm -hmm. and that is all thanks to both uh the the legacy media and the government of Canada and every political party, uh, every, every level of government in this country. As, as someone who served the army, is that something that you were expecting to, to, to see from your government? I don't think. No, absolutely not. Uh, if, if you actually, a lot of people bring up the oath all the time, you know, you're forgetting your oath. If you actually look at the oath for there, there are a couple of different ones that police give, but for the military, you don't swear an oath to the, the people of Canada or the constitution. You actually swear an oath at the time to the queen of England, her heirs and mm. successors. Right. Um, and so, you know, you, you have to be clear on why you're joining the, the military, obviously. Uh, I know what was in my heart when I joined the military and it, uh, it had nothing to do with upholding a, a, a tyrannical regime. Mm -hmm. And, and as far as I was concerned, I, I still am concerned. That's what we have right now in this country. Yeah. Is, is that one of the reasons why you decided to join James Stop and the group Veterans for Freedom and work alongside uh -huh. All these people, yeah, I, and I, and I think, I think that when the veterans or the police take a stand of this magnitude or the, mm -hmm. this importance, I think it is a. Uh, I think the public takes special notice of that. Mm -hmm. um, it is the the role of a of a soldier to uh, fight if called and mm -hmm. and there's something called informed consent where uh or sorry not informed consent uh uh unlimited liability that okay. is exclusive to to being a a, a military a, a soldier mm -hmm. and when you live by unlimited liability that means that you could be ordered to your certain death mm -hmm. uh, in combat so when the people that are willing to lay down their lives literally Mm -hmm. uh, are stepping out of the norms and speaking up. I think the public should take notice of that. But unfortunately, because of the mainstream media, what we often get called is um, traitors yeah. and insurrectionists. And I think it's unfair. I think it doesn't show a lot of uh, evolved thinking on the part of the Canadian public overall. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the police and the military both stand up and say, hey, uh, there's a problem here. I think the public should take note of that and stop listening to the anchor man. You know, yeah, that's you're one hundred percent right. Yeah, you yeah. know, we've heard a lot of people call James Stop a traitor, call yeah. yourself a traitor. To I got called a traitor on the way walking here. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Was, was it by the same lady who's the been same here lady out front of the commission? Traitor. Yeah. You know, I, I always find it so incomprehensible how mm -hmm. someone who can stand up to the rights of Canadians, which is mm -hmm. literally his job. In a certain way, which is his, what he has to do as a as a yeah. trainee, as a as a as a as an army man. Well, the the irony like is be called the traitor. Yeah, the irony is this: is that uh, every soldier knows that they could end up sacrificing their their life mm -hmm. on behalf of people that hate them. Yeah, you know, I could have I could have been killed in combat so that she had the right to go out there, that lady there with the uh, the and call you a terrorist. The, <laughs> yeah, and call me a terrorist and, and yeah. scream vile things at me. You know, and that's something that as a soldier, you accept the fact that people will have the right to uh, say certain disgusting things right to your face, no matter what. Well, that's freedom of speech. That's the foundation of it Western is. civilization. Yeah. Another another interesting thing that you also touched on during your testimony, and we can see this on the clip mm -hmm. 10, was your, your personal experience in regards to government freezing bank accounts of yeah. Canadians. Can we show that clip? It's the 10th clip in the list. And were you given any information, uh, e either from the bank or from the police, as to how you, how you, your bank accounts could be reopened? I was never notified that my bank accounts had been frozen, and I was never notified that they would be, and I was never notified 
um, that they were uh, reinstated at no time. So, so did you just find out that they were frozen because you could no longer use your could no longer your yeah, cards could no longer access any uh, of our financial uh, assets at all. And I think in addition to this clip, there's also part of your testimony when you talk about your family having their bank account frozen mm -hmm. de deeper length. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think the lesson here for everybody is, uh, what's the phrase? Cash is king. Um, <laughs> credit cards. Yeah, yeah, that we now live in a society where if you step in line with what the federal government believes, they will just shut you off yeah you know and and derek sloan and i and um uh you know when when we were campaigning actually and, and I, i'm bringing this up because i know derek is on after and he can speak to this as well but we were adamantly against um that's right uh the uh, uh digital society. id yeah. and uh a cashless society for for exactly these reasons because when my bank accounts were frozen my credit card that was on file with my son's drugstore Mm -hmm. uh, we could not get his heart medication, right? Mm -hmm. What did my son do that, that now put his life in jeopardy? He didn't do anything. And in the government of Canada, mm -hmm. without any consideration to the second and third order effects of people's lives, you know, we heard other testimony, I think from Bridget, um, that she struggled. She couldn't get her husband's, um, diabetes medication if, oh, I, if i'm right. remembering that correctly so you know they, they didn't give any consideration to the second third order effects of what they were doing they just did it because uh they could yeah and then you see Christian freeland just giggling away like philip the goat from uh diagonal uh you know when she's she's talking about how she's freezing financial assets. She mm -hmm. thought it was funny. Freedom in 2022 is certainly about being able to make free choices for ourselves and for our family, who we believe are the best. We have seen so much suffering over the last two years. People who die alone in terrible condition, people losing dream jobs, polarized families, and a society that insult and yell at each other for making a different medical choice. But people have risen, and it will be through them that the future will have an important meaning for all of you, but especially for the next generation. Ruben News has been present at every step of this great challenge, but so many other pioneers whom you could meet and hear at our great conference about freedom for our beautiful country, which is Canada. This conference, which will be held in Calgary and Toronto, will show you the faces of the influence of freedom that you have seen over the past two years. You don't want to miss this. So get your ticket now at ribbonnewslive.com. And it will be a pleasure to see you there and meet you in large numbers. It's time to drop these masks and let the truth shine. All right, mainstream media. That was that was one of the main parts of your testimony as well. We heard you talk a lot about them. Um, you know, before we start, why don't we throw to one of your clips, clip number eight, mm -hmm. where we can see you in the inquiry talk about uh, your views you, in regards uh, to mainstream media. Sure. Let's take a look. Did you take any steps to uh, clarify what you meant with the media outlets who were reporting? Um, that the protesters wanted to form a coalition government? No, I was not in charge of direct um, contact. I had no direct contact with the media. And as far as I was concerned, uh, my belief was if they actually started to do their job and report fairly, we would reward them with contact or I would or whatever, not necessarily me. But if they continued down the path of constantly vilifying and lying about us, uh, I didn't see the point really of talking to them at all. Uh, we were effective, highly effective at getting out everything we wanted to get out to the public through alternative and social media. 
So you didn't make any efforts to go to the no, reporters sir. who uh, who had re reported no. a different interpretation and say, that's wrong. Can you please fix it? No. And so you don't know whether or not they would have issued a correction or uh, issued a, maybe not a correction, a follow up story. You just don't know. I don't know. And they never reached out to talk to me if, from my knowledge either. You know, I can assure you from someone who was in the video room while you were saying it, the, the vibe wasn't the same as, 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 it was, as it was right before that. What's your issue with mainstream media? They lie. And, and they have been doing nothing but lie uh, since the pandemic began. And I, and I think they probably were part of the lie before the first lockdowns started. And uh, they just continue to perpetuate all of Justin Trudeau's lies. Um, they do not report in a balanced, uh, transparent manner. They don't go and get stories uh, of even the doctors or even lawyers or nurses that had a counter opinion to the official government or, or mini ministry of truth's mm -hmm. uh, beliefs. And so I... I just, after all this time, I am not going to ever uh, give them a soundbite. And, and and I had an issue too when James Top, uh, myself, and Paul Alexander, Dr. Mm -hmm. Alexander, met with. Yeah. Uh, you were there. You covered yeah, it that I was, day. Yeah, in I was fact, there as well. I took the video that you uh, posted up on. Um, on YouTube and I reposted that because you're the only one who actually didn't edit. You captured the truth of what the conversation was, the whole thing, the whole thing. And, um, they, they chopped it up and created their own little narrative around sound bites. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't want to give them any sound bites whatsoever, uh, that they're going to chop up. And I, and I have no doubt now that they'll, they'll take even my little passing comment when I walked by and said, they're liars. They'll, they'll chop that up into something, um, mm -hmm. disgusting like they typically do. So I, as far as I'm concerned, um, they're just doing, uh, the, they're the biggest megaphone for Justin Trudeau and Jugmeet Singh and all these, uh, these people that are perpetuating lies. Mm -hmm. We all know they get paid. I mean, we're, it, it's, it's almost self-abusive because we, we, mm -hmm. as taxpayers fund, yeah, we're paying for that. We're paying to be lied and victimized yeah. by, by the mainstream media. So I refuse to participate in, uh, in any of their games. Um, so I walked right by, I saw you and I, and I only, uh, I spoke to you and I spoke to Andrew Lawton, yeah. uh, because I just refuse to, uh, reward them in any way possible because they're, even if they tell you that they're good, they're going to find a way to make you look bad. Oh, for sure. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned megaphone because that's what I was thinking of. There's a picture that I saw recently online. Um, it's journalism in the 1970s where mm -hmm. you see the politician speaking, you yeah. see the people on one side and you see the reporter with a megaphone shouting at the politician being the voice of the people. Now yeah. once 2022, yeah. you see the exact same thing, the politician there, the people here, yes. but you see the journalists pointing the megaphone at the people, basically yeah. regurgitating yes. everything the politician is saying. Yeah. Is this what you're... What you say? Well, that's exactly it, you know, and, and I've told this, this story a few times uh, in various events that uh, in, in 1933, when Hitler became the chancellor of Germany, mm -hmm. first thing he did was actually issue uh, free radios into the homes of every German oh, family. Uh, and he was also in control of the, the content that those homes were receiving. Mm -hmm. This is how governments historically get their message out to the people that they want the people. And now look at us at Bill C C 11. Mm -hmm. Last I was tracking it, it, it passed its uh, second reading in the Senate. Uh, That's we're, right, yeah. we're inches away. We're inches away from the government having full dominance of mm -hmm. the internet. Uh, and that, that puts all of us at risk of, of being an informed society. If the government yeah. is going to dictate, uh, what we can and cannot consume. No, Bill, Bill Sylvan is an absolutely it's an terrible bill. Let's say it's an online censorship bill, yeah. Soviet Union style censorship yes. bill. It's absolutely terrible. And if it passes third reading in the Senate, and it will. Yeah, I have, I have some I have some hopes that it won't pass, but I, I think I think there's a large chance. I think it, it will be terrible for the future of Canadian yeah. society. Listen, we have you on for only a few minutes. Sure. Now, I really want to get to one specific clip. Um, as we mentioned earlier, after your testimony, you st stepped out in the room and you did a three minute scrum with us. Mm -hmm. I think it will be worth it to show the full scrum that we did together. So let's take a look at that, and then we can talk a little bit, and then I'll let you I'll let you go. Sure. 
Wrong fully represented your, your position during the convoy, roughly represented Freedom Convoy. Can you elaborate on what exactly you meant by that? Yeah, and I, I talked about it in the, the testimony today, uh, where, you know, they, they vilified people or vilified the comments that I made. The commission is reconvened. La commission reprend. Good afternoon. Bon après-midi. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Um, the next witness... Uh, will be James Bowder, and it's uh, Jeff Lee on co-lead co counsel for the commission. Mr. Bowder, will you swear on a religious document or do you wish to affirm? Uh, the Bible, please. For the record, please state and spell your first name, your full name. James, J-A-M-E-S, Ralph, R-A-L-P-H, Bauder, B-A-U-D-E-R. Do you swear that the evidence to be given by you to this commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Mr. Bowder does not have counsel and uh, He's uh, requested to take the protections available to him in giving his evidence. Okay, uh, well, I understand uh, you're under subpoena, Mr. Bowder, correct? Correct. Okay, I um, have deemed uh, that the witness uh, has objected to answer each and every question on the ground that his answer may tend to incriminate him uh, or may tend to establish his liability to a civil proceeding at the instance of the Crown or any other person. And if but for the, the act uh, uh, or the act of any provincial legislature, the witness would therefore have been excused from answering the question, then although the witness is by reason of uh, the act or provincial act compelled to answer, the answer so given shall not be used or admissible in evidence against him in any criminal trial or other criminal proceeding against him thereafter taking place, other than, of course, a prosecution for perjury uh, in the giving of that evidence or for the giving of contradictory evidence. So that will be for each question and answer it's taken that you've taken the protection afforded to you under the Charter and the various statutes. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr. Bowder. Good afternoon, Jeffrey. Um, can you tell me uh, where you were born? I was born in Kamloops, BC, Canada. Um, I understand today is your birthday. It is. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. Um, and um, you currently reside in, in Calgary? Correct. And uh, for how long? A uh, better part of uh, my life, I guess. Uh, I met my uh, beautiful uh, wife, Sandy, and moved there 15 years ago, I guess. I've been in Alberta and BC my whole life. Okay. And um, what do you do for a living? I am a truck driver. And um, how long have you been driving a truck? Uh, since I was a kid on the farm. Has and then been from there in my early 20s and then uh, went into a, a different career path than truck driving. And uh, from there, I just uh, picked up the, the wheels uh, a couple years ago. Okay. And what was that other career path? My background uh, started in oil and gas when I was 18 years old. And by uh, the age of 26, I had worked up to consultant level of where then I specialized in uh, various uh, levels of governance, policy design, and risk mitigation internationally at the C plus director level. And I understand uh, you have uh, some uh, education in corporate governance? I've got a very interesting CV, yes. 
could you just briefly say, tell us a bit about your corporate governance uh, experience? So I don't know why that's relevant here today. Uh, however, I spent a better part of uh, my career looking for the truth and auditing and assessing governance models, looking at uh, the root cause analysis of our governance, and then cross-referencing that over to policies and looking at policy design, and then using risk mitigation factories and modelings from there was able to develop corrective action models for projects all over the world. Thank you. And um, I want to uh, deal with some of the convoys that you've been involved in. I understand that in 2019 hmm. you participated in the United We Roll convoy. That's in February 2019? Correct. And uh, that convoy went from uh, Calgary to Ottawa? Correct. And, Red Deer, actually. Uh, Red Deer. Yep. And um, that convoy was involved in protesting legislation uh, related to oil and gas issues. Yes, at that time, I believe Naughty Notley and Justin Trudeau were ganging up on us, and we said enough of that. And what was your role in relation to that convoy other than participating in it? Did you have a role? Yes, I did. Uh, my role was to represent unity. I had just uh, started the Canada Unity Foundation and I uh, got a call uh, from some beautiful people and said, uh, James, this is right up your alley. You should get into this. And uh, that was an amazing journey. Did, uh, just amazing. Did you play a role in the planning? No. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned Canada Unity. Um, I understand that a Canada Unity is a humanitarian organization that brings people together um, and bases its foundation on community. Is that correct? And uh, one of the things that Canada Unity does is oppose COVID-19 public health measures? What Canada Unity has, has developed into has been my honour and privilege to serve. We represent and we defend all Canadian lawful freedom of choice by coming together in unity. Okay, and... That's the mission statement. And um, you have taken a position that, uh, re with respect to COVID-19 public health measures, what's that position? I find them all unlawful. And starting in August of 2021, I understand you started planning for a convoy to Ottawa. Is that correct. correct? And you used the name for that Convoy for Freedom? Correct. Uh, if you'd like, I could elaborate a little bit on that, because uh, there is some relevance to this, and how ahead. that Convoy for Freedom was originated, because it's, it's pretty important. Yes. When I'm looking at my wife who comes to me and says, James, it's your job to protect the family. I didn't know what that would detail. However, uh, I, I just found my faith and got recently baptized. And that day I got baptized, it stuck. It stuck deeply. And you can imagine my world going from international Flying, uh, you know, the only object of uh, news I got was CNN and BBC in an airport. So I have a, a pretty good understanding of how corporate decision makers and policy makers can get very distracted with the media and not get the full facts. So I made a prayer to save my soul because of all the division and divisiveness that I was witnessing in my country. And the answer to that prayer was Convoy for Freedom. Okay. And to specialize and put unity at the forefront of that convoy. That's, that's and does um, Canada Unity have members? A few. How many? Hundreds of thousands. And uh, how do you join Canada Unity? 
we have a platform, multiple platforms. Now, uh, Mr. Clerk, could you put up on the screen COM 50505? And I understand this to be a copy of a, a Facebook page hmm. of yours, um, and it's dated August 30, 2021? Correct. And um, you say, want to know what Justine Trudeau hates more than protesters, a convoy parked on his front step, just saying. And then um, you go on, if you have a semi truck and are willing to step up to save our great nation from becoming China, to text me, I am ready to make some noise, but I need you big truckers. So was this, um, a call for people to participate in your convoy? Yep. Yeah, I was watching and witnessing the, the destruction of Australia and our brothers uh, down and sisters down there. And um, two factors gave me the motivation to do this, other than answering and, and being directed by God on this, was A, the United Rural Convoy, and me coming here and witnessing uh, the homeless in the streets where you can check this on Canada Unity's YouTube. I, I didn't participate in the politics because I'm non-political with our foundation. And that's hard to see that we're actually, it, it, there's a definite line there. Uh, so I went out and I actually fed the homeless and I made a documentary on it. Okay, remember that was my we... first time I came here. So then, oh, and you're, yeah, yeah. So, Watching uh, Australia start a convoy over there over these unlawful mandates and seeing our brothers and sisters down south get treated like third world citizens, uh, it gave me uh, enough uh, motivation to step up and, uh, and do what Canadians do. We are the peacekeepers of the world. We need to step up in unity and show the world what peace and unity is all about. I just want to remind you, as we've talked about, we have an hour for you to give your evidence. I know you want to be able to tell your story. True. So, um, you were supposed to do this. <laughs> okay. Um, so you say further down, um, the convoy will be 100% geared for uniting Canada, no political agendas. You say simple terms, no vac, vax passports Canada-wide. No masks mandate Canada-wide, no more lockdowns Canada-wide. We demand our government put immediate stop to all of the above, correct? And so correct. that was the, the goal of uh, that convoy? Yep. And I, you started from Calgary and uh, went to, to Ottawa? Correct. Uh, did you go... Uh, in terms of the planning, um, how many vehicles were part of that convoy? Uh, upwards of 500 sometimes. And then there was, we, we made a big boo-boo when we started. We had all our registration dates. And my wife and I were in Calgary with Action for Canada, and we were convoy of one. <laughs> okay. So, um, and we got going, and then it just got, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it just uh, it grew. And you, you planned it all? Uh, did you, yes. you know, develop the maps and the routes, the logistics, schedules? Uh, no, actually, I made, a, I made a, a post asking for help. And uh, from there, uh, I got a lot of help. A lot of help. And, and I'm I, grateful for that. And when did you arrive in Ottawa? I can't remember, to be honest. Uh, it was in October sometime. And if you're going to ask me dates, I don't. I'm, I'm terrible with dates. So well, no, October's um, fine. If you need the actual date evidence, no, I can provide I, if that. If I need a later it, time. I'll ask you for it. Okay. Okay. Um, now, if I can ask you to put up on the screen, please, uh, COM five zero eight five eight. This is another uh, Facebook page of yours um, from December 13, 2021. And it says, Operation Bear Hug Ottawa was a great success. This was what we've just been talking about, the, the convoy? Um, yep. And you say Operation Bear Hug. 
What is the why why bear hug? So if you want, I've got ah <laughs> hang on here. Okay. Uh where is that one that I'd like to bring up? Sorry, uh, what are can, you can referring I, to? Because I'm gonna actually read my evidence to answer your question, John. Or Jeffrey, if that's well, what okay. are you referring to? JBA 0000, so six zeros four three. Okay, can you and bring I can, up yep. that document, please? Uh, and then I can answer that question about the bear hug right there. That's not it. Okay, well, can we? Can you just give me an explanation, sir, of why you use the term well, I, air hug? I'd really like to actually read my evidence that I submitted here, Jeffrey, well, and that's this not what I quoted. This is not the evidence. Well, can we do it this way, sir? If you answer my question, so, uh, the, we'll get the object this. of a bear hug, okay? Let's 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 be honest here. We are in a country of division by design. The very root foundations of our government and our governance have division in it. So the opposite of division is unity, pure and simple. And we are a country that has got many problems with division. And if you're in touch with God and you're, you're, you're praying all the way through this, the one thing that, that came to our team, and this was a team effort, I, I, I can't remember the exact person that came up and he said, bear hug. And we started looking at this from a psychology point of view. And it has been an amazing journey to keep love and peace as an organizer with a bunch of truckers. Uh, Bridget mentioned here uh, a couple of days ago that he had a couple hundred truckers together and, you know, we're a little rowdy and I know I am one. Uh, so, how do you bring together a country in unity that's fighting in division, uh, a pair hug? Got love, it. love, love. And if you want, I can give you a demonstration. No, I don't need a demonstration. <laughs> Thank you. Because it was very much evident. And if, if those that went down to Ottawa or can anywhere we, across Canada... Can we go on to my next question, please? Um, <laughs> Sorry, you put back up COM50858. And um, just quickly, to I want to deal with uh, the things you did in Ottawa uh, it, on that uh, in that convoy. Say you went maskless shopping and maskless dining on day one, and then, every day, and then on day two, you went to Dollarama and they uh, shut down their tills, but they were told by the police to open. Correct. And then day three, you did a media blockade at CTV. What's a media blockade? Uh, it's, it's, we just showed up and... Block the parking lot? Uh, yes. Uh, not, like, we were on the street, so there is laws on, on doing this, and, and the police of Ottawa were very, very helpful, uh, and, and these are the laws that we can operate within. Yeah. And because then I've been day... working with the police all the way through, from day one, August, yeah. uh, every day, and... They just, this is what we can do. So we held CTV and, you know, I think for half an hour or 45 minutes, each person. And then we had a little chit chat with them about their propagandas that they were spreading. And yeah, it was okay. awful. Very and then lawful. on day four, uh, you did the same thing uh, with CBC. Yes. And then you say you went over to Justine Trudeau's and the governor general's houses and held a block party in the middle of the street, shutting down the road for about 30 minutes. Uh, and you say the police were called and they didn't interfere. Correct. Um, that, so that lasted 30 minutes at each residence? Correct. And, and there was a, there was a, um, a, I do remember something. Uh, we did two back-to-back -back convoys over there because uh, the first convoy, we were told that Trudeau was going to be in the, the main house, you know, uh, on Sussex, I think. And then uh, he wasn't there. So 
we turned around, we came back to Confederation Park, and then we got news that he was at the cottage. So we did the, the pretty big convoy size at that point. So we jumped in and we we went back to the cottage and and you know the police that were there with us they were pretty pretty cool. Uh, they all started screwing and and trying to catch up to us and then they caught up to us and they said James what are you doing? So I said we lost something. And he said well what'd you lose? And I said our freedom. We're trying to go find it. Okay, thank you. And then. Um So you, you did a. You also went to uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's uh, house uh, again. Is what you're telling us, and the Governor General's house, and you blocked the road during rush hour traffic. Is that, is that correct? It? And all the evidence and the videos we uploaded for you for that. And further down, you mention a bear hug too. Correct. And so you your plan was to uh, repeat this, if you could. Do that. So the original Bear Hug One, uh, we had been marketing and promoting Convoy to Ottawa and doing several convoys all across the board and, and marketing when the time comes that the federal mandate is imposed on the trucking industry. Get ready. Be prepared. So we thought that was going to come on in December. That's why we were there for Bear Hug One, and it didn't happen. So we knew that the federal government was still itching to put this federal travel mandate on and, and force us to take vaccines just to travel. So we went home, uh, as you can see, and then uh, just as I get into Calgary, Facebook shuts off my everything. They reinstated it, but uh, we were completely... Uh, taken out of the equation so I'd, I'd like to go on and talk about the mou that you mentioned in that doc the, the memorandum of understanding yes and um can you bring up please com five zeros eight six six And can you just scroll through that and confirm for me that that is the, the your memorandum of understanding? I have the original right here, so well, piece of history right here in front of me. That's 15 pages. That's not the original. Can you tell me what this document is then? I need to see the whole document. I haven't seen this. Yeah, okay. Well, I, 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 we'll scroll through it. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. No. So this is the French and English version? Yes. Okay, yeah, this is the original. Okay. And then um, I take it that this document was prepared by you and by your wife, Sandra, and by a gentleman named Martin Broadman? Correct. And who is uh, Mr. Broadman? Martin Broadman is a truck driver. Uh, with a also similar interesting pass uh, uh, with his uh, background, he also worked international as well. And I think it would be an understatement to say that this is a very important document to you. Uh, it, it served its purpose. Okay. And has it remained the same since the outset? Have there been any changes to it? Not since we uh, strategically withdrew. Sorry? Not since we were strategically withdrew. And so that's, um, you withdrew that in February 2022. February 8th, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, after we got uh, viciously attacked by this government and slandered and defamed so, and character assassinationed and everything. Yeah, we'll come that. to that. Okay. Um, if we can go to page two, please. If you just scroll up. Um, next page. Sorry, um, can you go back? Uh, now, the parties uh, to this agreement, if you can scroll a little further, um, are, the, are listed as the um, concerned Canadian citizens, the Senate of Canada, and 
the governor general. I think you missed a few more people. Back up there, please. Uh, I'm trying to, we okay. can all read it. I'm just trying to summarize it. Okay. Um, and um, if you can keep going, please. Um, to where it says, uh, on back uh, to where it says the Senate of Canada, um, or sorry, let me start uh, with the concerned Canadian citizens where we were. Mm -hmm. There it says, uh, represented by you and your wife and Martin Broadman, correct? Correct. And the Senate of Canada would be represented by the Honorable George J. Ferry, QC, the Speaker. Correct. And the uh, uh, Governor General would be the Honorable uh, Mary May Simon. Correct. Representing the, the Queen in Canada. Now, um, did you have uh, any legal assistance in drafting this document? No. You, the three of you did it on your own? Yep. And so I... Because an MOU isn't a legal anything. It's just words. So... And I take it that your intention was to have the, the, the Senate and the Governor General um, enter into this MOU along with you, correct? Had the Senate or the Governor General responded, then the next step would have been immediately contacting multiple organizations that we've been working with across Canada like Police on Guard for Thee, Action for Canada, Vaccine Choice. I mean, I could keep going. We had a lot, Take Back Our Freedom. We had a lot of groups that we could have um, very, very, uh, we could have facilitated uh, establishing the Canadian Citizens Committee so that we could then sit down in, in partnership with the Senate and the Governor General and address the unlawful mandates that are happening across this country and come to some resolution. Now, can we come to Article 3, where it says uh, mandate? I'd just like to review, review these with you. So Canada um, Unity, that's CU, and um, I guess that's uh, SCGGC, which is the Senate and the Governor General, agree to form a committee called Citizens of Canada Committee. And... That committee undertakes and appoints authorized representatives. Or, or sorry, the Senate and Governor General undertake authorize, to appoint authorized representatives, and Canadian Unity does the same, correct? Uh, at that point, Canada Unity is out because we would have had a group of, of individuals that come forward of doctors and scientists and, and well, specialists see, and so on and so forth. So at that point, Canada Unity would have been out of it and I, CCC I'm just would have taken it over. The document, sir, and if you go to Article 1, you see Canada Unity and in brackets CU. And then we come down to Article 3A, yes. it says CU. So you're referring there to Canada Unity, right? Correct. And if we can look at uh, our Article 3D, um, the, the parties adopt and adhere to various uh, legislation that you've set out there. And uh, coming down to E, um, SCGGC will affect a, as of midnight on that date, instruct all levels of the federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to immediately cease and desist all unconstitutional human rights, discriminatory and segregated actions, and not limited to immediately instruct all levels of federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to not only stop, but furthermore, waive all SARS-CoV-2 and not limited to SARS-CoV-2 subsequent variation fines that have been issued and imposed on its citizens, institutions, and private enterprises. And so in that, uh, the, 
the SCGGC would have the authority to instruct those levels of government to do that? Yeah, if we'd all entered into an, a, a, an agreement, uh, this is just a, you know, here we'd like to talk about this, but it, it means nothing because nobody signed it and nobody entered into it. So yeah, it's, it's non-binding. But that was the hope that we had presented that we could sit down and collectively come to an agreement to cease and desist on all these unlawful mandates. And you understand, sir, that the purpose of a memorandum of understanding is to set out the principles that will then be formalized into a, an agreement, right? Yeah, I believe that's right here in front of you. That yeah. was our principles that we wanted to And if we look at uh, paragraph F, um, I won't read everything but er, uh, there, but it's again, instruct all levels of government to reinstate all employees in all branches of government, uh, private industry, institutional sector employees with full lawful employment rights prior to the wrongful dismissal and unlawful dismissal, dismissal stemming from SARS-CoV-2 and subsequent passport, vaccine passport mandates. And uh, if we can just, and then we go over to G, um, the SCGGC <clears throat> will issue a cease and desist order, abolishing all federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal vaccine ports passport requirements, vaccine discriminatory regulations, initiatives, and mandates regarding SARS-CoV-2, mm -hmm. correct? And so this committee would have the power to issue a cease and desist order? If we had uh, been able to get to that yes. aspect and the committee had come to an agreement that uh, we had proved our case that all of this was unlawful, Yes, At that and point, then obviously uh, the next step would be to do a cease and desist because of laws being broken and tyranny and treason and crimes against humanity that are listed within the document. And, and then uh, H provides for a further cease and desist order um, to the members of the Government of Canada with uh, instructions to the premiers and the mayors um, to stop all such unlawful activities pursuant to Article 3, so they would have the power to do that if you'd come to an agreement? Correct. And then in J, it says, by signing this memorandum, Canada Unity will immediately stop Operation Bear Hug Ottawa demonstration slash convoy and federal referendum activities and we'll strive to work with all groups and entities to bring this country together in unity. Correct. So that was, if you had this uh, memorandum agreed to, then you were going to stop the protests. Is that right? Correct. If we could have entered into an agreement, that would have been, that's all we wanted to do was communicate with our government. And we tried every single option available to us right. multiple, multiple times. We exhausted all means of communication with this government from one part of Canada from coast to coast to coast. And you'll see in, um, uh, just to further that, the point you've been making, um, under L, there's to be a final signed uh, agreement in place within 90 days of accepting the memorandum, correct? Yeah, we felt that 90 days would have been given enough time to strike the committees and talk to Canada about this process. And then uh, from there, sign into and enter into an agreement. And then if we can come down to Article 4C, um, SCGGC will represent itself as the government of Canada as a whole and not party related. Correct. You're saying that SCGGC is now the government of no. Canada? No, no, uh, not even close. In, in, in correlation to everything that we would be discussing as a committee, uh, we have the people and the government together. And that was, you know, the best that we could come up with is that this committee would bring forward on behalf of the government of Canada and represent uh, the wills of, of the committee. Okay. And, um, and that it wouldn't, and, and, and the, uh, so in that it wouldn't be party related because when you look at the Liberals versus the NDPs versus the Conservatives, there's so much division in that whole process of governance right there in itself 
that we didn't want the parties being involved. We wanted to have a direct correlation to the source root of our laws, which is, we believe, the Senate, because they make the laws, they amend the laws. And a very interesting part in the Helsinki Act that's uh, listed sir, in here um, that comes from the Nuremberg Codes I is think that the Senate far afield, sir. can enforce the laws. Okay, thank When you. our government has chosen to completely ignore all the, the moral aspects that come from the laws that so many people represent and defend. So you're saying the Senate under those acts has the right to enforce the laws against the, the elected government? Is that what you're saying? Under the declaration, Helsinki, yes. Okay, thank you. Now, Because we signed uh, on to it. I understand. As a government and as a country to stand up for all humanity and end discrimination and segregation. And it is a law that we, you could, as a country, you stood don't up have for show, and signed sir. on to. Can you, Let's just stay calm, please. I'm, no, I know you're, you're emotional and, that, and that's understandable. But if you could try and just I keep, uh, keep it down. No, I don't apologize. No, I don't have to apologize. I will. Just, I will. Calm down. Just, just this is emotional when we see our government completely violating all the laws. I understand. And there's, where do we turn to? The Senate is our last hope. And that's what's in their paychecks and their job descriptions. Now, can I, and you pu widely publicized the, your MOU. You wanted uh, as many people as possible to know what you were doing? Correct. Yeah, and um, I want to skip ahead, if I can, for um, <clears throat> uh, a mo well, actually, let me ask you first. Um, in when you were in um, Ottawa with um, the the Canada Unity convoy, I understand you sent this by registered mail to uh, the Senate and the Governor General, is that right? We sent it all over, and it's listed in the MOU who we sent it to. Okay, but yeah. those were the people that you sent it to because those are the parties, and then you sent it to a number of other entities, correct? Correct. And um, if we can come forward for just a moment, and I'll come back to um, the Freedom Con Convoy in January, February 22, um, I understand um, one of your purposes uh, was to again see if you could get the attention of the Senate and the uh, and the Governor General to sign this memorandum. Correct. Enter into an agreement with the yes. with the committee. And um, when you were in Ottawa in in. Uh, January, February, 2022, um, did you again send it to those parties? No, it's already been sent. I see, okay. And it was receiving an enormous amount of support. Uh, our servers were going crazy, uh, and, literally. And you were aware, weren't you, that the Governor General was getting a lot of phone calls from people that supported this? No, I wasn't. Okay. Why, uh, was that a problem? I'm just asking the question, sir. Okay. So was I. The day, we actually attended a um, press conference now, you told us before that uh, you withdrew the MOU, uh, I think, on February 8th. And if you can bring up uh, OTT You'll see that's addressed to Honorable Mary Simon, Governor General, withdrawing the Memorandum of Understanding. Um, it has come to our attention that the MOU is being erroneously presented in the House as a means of displacing the democratically elected government. This was not the intention behind or purpose of this document. Um, so you, in effect, retracted it, correct? I didn't retract, I withdrew. Sorry? I didn't retract, I withdrew. Okay. Um, 
And if I had my if I had my statement, I I could actually bring that statement up uh, that I gave you. Uh, yeah. And it, it shows. and um, the um, and why did you do that? Why did you withdraw it? I can tell you, I didn't want to, and that I didn't need to. However, we had grown and morphed so fast as a humble family of truckers coming together. And there was documents flying left, right, and center, press releases, Zoom calls. We were going at Mach 2 and two phones and, and uh, 18 gears. And I, I think looking back at the amount of work that we were doing nationwide to come together and put this, this convoy together, there were so many people that had never heard of me and I hadn't heard of them, uh, but we were all coming together for the greater good. So one thing that we, we had done is sit down as a group and um, we had brought this forward. Martin being the, the, the president of Truckers United Inc had uh, a lot of truckers and, um, yeah, we talked about the MOU. We, we addressed that uh, it deals with all of our mandates. And it's a document that we're presenting to the government to try to communicate. And uh, we want to negotiate and sit down and say, hey, you, you've, you've created and, and committed crimes against us by unlawfully enacting these unlawful mandates. So we would like to sit down as a group. And the MOU actually addresses all of that. It always did from day one because two truckers sat down and wrote it. And a bunch of other truckers came in at last minute uh, and uh, they didn't get a privilege to, uh, to, you know, who here has actually read the MOU? Sorry, sir, that's not the way you conduct yourself at, at the, in this room. Would you sure. answer my question? What, what's the question again? Let me suggest to you that you withdrew it because there were people other people associated yeah, so, with the Freedom Envoy. So let everybody's, uh, let everybody's finish, just please, getting together sir. in Ottawa. And let me finish, please, sir. I, I will. Thank you. You withdrew it because other people involved in the Freedom Convoy asked you to do so because it was creating problems for the very reasons that you list there, that people, um, you say, uh, uh, interpreted it as displacing the democratically elected government. Is that right? Correct. Thank you. And um, well, I won't. You did refer to a document. I don't think we have to bring it up now, but it's JBA 6064, um, where you explain that um, the memorandum of understanding was officially withdrawn on February 8 because of external pressures after an intense, slanderous media smear campaign directed at the group Canada Unity and the founders. Uh, the authors, Martin Broadman, James Bowder, and, and Sandra Broadman, correct? Yeah. If and I can re just go back in time on that, because it was, it was pretty raw. Uh, I understand. Here, here we are as, as a freedom movement, and inside that freedom movement, we have been talking about <laughs> fake media and, and all the slander stuff they do and how our government uses very, very hateful, harmful wordsmithing directed at us. And it was never the intention to cause uh, confusion behind this, but I love my brothers and sisters that were coming here so much that this, mean, this meant nothing. We'd already won because we came here together in unity. So... In, in our perspective internally, the fact that they tuned on to CBC and CTV and Global, which they better be lowering up because I'm going to be suing them for everything on what they've done to me and my family. Uh, that's, that's when it was like, this has gone so out of control that yeah. it's lost where it should be. And at this point, I just said, you know what, team? We've won. The rest is in God's hands. Let's just withdraw this from uh, a, a, a temporary point of view and uh, sit back and observe and see where this goes. So 
Right, and the, the media was, uh, in your view, mischaracterizing it as an attempt to overthrow Canada's democratic government. Is that yeah, uh, so, so I, I just want to put it out there that um, I want you to all think here for a second here. They, un no, they sorry, unlawfully sir. arrested. Sorry, lot. sir, I'm going to stop you. This isn't the place to give speeches. You, you answer the question, and you've answered it. Thank you. Okay, there's more to ask. But. Um, and could you uh, pull up, uh, Mr. Clerk, ALB 401819. Now, are you familiar with the fact that after the uh, Emergencies Act came into effect, uh, there was an explanation offered by the government as to why they put it into effect? I haven't seen this document before. Okay. I'll, I just want to take you to one paragraph and ask you about it. If you can uh, go to page five, please. Um, so that paragraph that starts the protests, if you look on the screen, it's there, sir. Uh, the protests have become a rallying point for anti-government and anti-authority, anti-vaccination, conspiracy theory, and white supremacist groups throughout Canada and other Western countries. Protesters have varying ideological grievances with demands ranging from an end to all public health restrictions to overthrow the elected government. As one example, protest organizers have suggested forming a coalition government with opposition parties and the involvement of Governor General Mary Simon. Was that part of your memorandum of understanding? Mm, nope. This is hilarious, though. And you see it says, this suggestion appears to be an evolution of a previous proposal from a widely circulated memorandum of understanding from a group called Canada Unity that is taking part in the co convoy. Uh, the memorandum of understanding proposed that the Senate and Governor General to, could agree to join them in forming a committee to order the revocation of COVID-19 restriction and va vaccine mandates. And I just want to deal with the issue of appears to be an evolution. In your view, did, was there ever an evolution from the member of Andam of Understanding uh, to uh, suggest that there be a coalition government with opposition parties and the governor general? No, and we talked about that already in there where I said that the, the reason that we didn't want the parties in was because they weren't invited. Um, this was just strictly the people of Canada and to sit with their Senate. Um, that was it. And so I, I did, this is just, this will help me actually with my lawsuit when I sue them. So thank you. You're welcome. Now, um, do you know Tom Marazzo? Uh, Mr. Tom. Yeah. I didn't know him. Did you ever talk to him about your memorandum of understanding? Yeah. I don't know if, I can't really recall if we did. We talked for about 15 minutes uh, yeah. twice. Over the phone and then in person. And then... And if we can... Um, very grateful. I just want to show you a couple of other... Uh, well, in, in the interest of time, I will uh, move on. Um, you mentioned a, a document can I, can I? Uh, before I want to take you to it. COM uh, 50857. Jeffrey... For yes. one second, can I just reference, or Jason, uh, can you reference well, that Well, you can get it uh, afterwards, sir. It, the number was ALB1819. ALB0004. Zero, 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 Lots of zeros. 1819.00. Zero, zero. Sorry, I'll give you that uh, again. Uh, ALB4018.19. Thanks, Jeffrey. You got it. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, um, can we go to COM uh, 50857? 
And I think you referred to, to this uh, before, and I wanted to uh, give you a chance uh, uh, to tell me about it. You'll see it's a, again, a Facebook post dated, Facebook post dated September 16, 21, uh, to Constable Isabel Sear Piddock of the Ottawa Police. Um, and you told us before that you uh, remained in, in contact with the Ottawa Police during the Canada Unity Convoy? Correct. And, and, and was this part of the contact that you were talking about? Yeah, so, I mean, speaking of, of contact with the police, the uh, prior to us getting involved, we took this MOU to police on guard for the nationwide. And we were ecstatic as two truck drivers that this prestigious, honoured group of Canadians that represent our police and our military would endorse the MOU nationwide. And, Mr. Uh, Bader, you're, you're kind of venturing off the questions. So we'll get a chance at the end to yeah, we make work. a statement or something. So let okay. can, if sorry, because we want Lots to try and get through it because there's it's another. It's tough. I like to tell stories. So I, I I know you do, and it's obvious. But we're going to try and control yeah. this. Okay. And thank you. This I, I can tell you that this document is in evidence now, and it will be reviewed as part of the process of the commission in in. Uh, coming to its uh, conclusions. I'd like to take you now to the Freedom Convoy in, uh, that, in the uh, period of uh, January, uh, February 2022. Um, I understand that you, your view is that this was just a continuation of the planning that you started in August, 20, in August of 21. Correct. We didn't stop. Our whole team, just 24-7, uh, every day we were doing it. We were going and we were standing up for an awful freedom of choice. And um, at some point you uh, were be put in touch with um, some other people who were thinking of uh, organizing a convoy as well? When? In, uh, de in late December, early January, uh, Pat King. I, oh. Uh, yeah, look, remember? I, 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 lots Chris of people Barber. were calling me wanting in on this convoy. <laughs> so who called you uh, uh, about that? Do you remember? Uh, no. What, what are you, where are you going at with Jess, Jeffrey? Well, you, lots you remember of people who called, called you about uh, uh, getting a convoy going the end of December, early January? Uh, a lot of people were calling me to get a, like, hey, did, did you speak we were to, already... Did you speak to Chris Barber? Uh, no, until the Zoom call. I didn't know Chris before. Okay. I met him on a Zoom. Who, who invited you to the Zoom call? Uh, Pat King? Mm, I told Pat to put us... So you're referring to how we all came together as a yes. team? Okay, so but I believe, I'd like you just uh, we, to answer my, my questions and, and we'll get through this. Yeah, so, so you got to be a little bit more, you know, like if you're looking for specific information and who I was talking to, then just spit their name. Sure, so I let's go to mind. the, the uh, Facebook Live event that was hosted by Pat King. That was January 13th. Um, okay. And did you know Mr. King at this point? Yep. How did you know him? Uh, he was with uh, the convoy uh, that we came here to Ottawa with uh, back in 2019. And did you follow him on social media? Mm, not really, no. Okay. Um, and, I, and you recall that Bridget Belton and Chris Barber uh, also participated in, in that Facebook Live? Yes. And um, later on, uh, you... Met Tamara Leach? Here in the Ark Hotel for the first time. Okay. And I didn't talk to her. i just seen her. And, and I'd never met her before, and I talked to her on the phone prior to launching all this. I did my due diligence to make sure that um, uh, our, our trusted and vested interest in, in this whole movement. Um, one thing that you don't want to put truck drivers with with funds and stuff like that, we got enough to do. And we were looking for and trying to recruit uh, a, a, somebody that we could trust uh, uh, to handle all the funds. And I remember uh, talking with, with Bridget and then talking, and she'd mentioned uh, that what Chris was hooked up with her and they were, you know, building the convoy. They were going to do some slow rolls and stuff like that. 
I think we'd mentioned uh, that we already had Bear Hug Canada. So that was the, you know, for, for those that couldn't come to Ottawa, Bear Hug Canada would represent the slow rolls and so on and so forth. So can I just stop you there? Those were individual uh, protests that you had uh, were promoting across the country? It, nationwide. Yeah. So, at, so that, um, at that point, yeah, we all came together on a big Zoom and... Yeah. And so... Um, I understand that you're, what, from your perspective, what happened then was that um, uh, this was, uh, you provided the, the structure for uh, people to uh, participate in this uh, uh, convoy by providing the material that you'd already worked up and developed for your own convoy. Uh, all the logistical aspects behind the scenes with, with our national partnerships that we established, uh, that, you know, they were all involved, uh, already and anybody was welcome because we're about unity. So we were, <laughs> you want in, come on in. Uh, we don't care. Uh, this is for uh, all of Canada to, uh, come together in unity. So, and so, um, Were, were you in touch with the, uh, you left uh, Calgary uh, uh, when, uh, on this, uh, do you recall? Which time? For the, uh, in January of 22. Yeah, yeah when we left. Yeah, and um, were you in touch with the, you yourself, were you in touch with the police along the way? Extensively, every day. Uh, talking about what sort of things? Uh, we had all sorts of routes going on. We had captains of the yin yang that were coming in. The, uh, Western route was, was pretty easy to put together. Uh, it was the Eastern, uh, Southern Eastern Ontario routes. They gave us a lot of, um, logistical stress and we had to work very, very carefully with, with multiple police, uh, individuals and so what we did was instead of working i worked at the with uh with staff sergeants that had been working with since august 1st so I went, hey we're, we're coming back how you doing uh get prepared and then from there they started funneling um police to start connecting in with the captains and so and as we started bringing more captains in then we would start working on the the routes in the back end so that it all flowed and if you look at all the route maps and everything else, everything flowed into Wellington. So, and um, I, I take it that you were in contact with both the OPP and the Ontario, uh, Ottawa Police Service. Is that OPP, PPS, and OPS? And so, what happened when you got to uh, Ottawa? How did? Where did you? What did? How were you directed to go so somewhere? So I was in uh, coming in from the west. And uh, what I wanted to do was hook up with Martin Broadman. And I knew that Bridget was bringing in uh, the, the, the crew and, and our, our family coming in from Southern Ontario. And, and, and uh, it was always planned uh, that she would come in a day ahead of time. And then that actually turned out to, we had to split it up at the last minute because there was just so many trucks and it was just so large. So that became a, a Friday and a Saturday event um then from there i left to get uh, literally drove all night kind of thing so that we could get over to uh meet with uh the eastern convoy as the western convoy with chris and 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 tamara they're coming in bridget's in with all the the captains from uh the southern area and there's still more captains coming in on that day as well uh, so then we're bringing the West or sorry, we got the, the West routes and then we went and grabbed, uh, the East routes so that we could, uh, all come together in unity. And when uh, you uh, came circle. together, um, and about to enter, uh, Ottawa, uh, were you being directed where to go? Yeah, we were shambozled and blindsided because I can tell you that was not the original plans that we had set down with those police, uh, if you looked at the original mapping that was well, well posted, it was all points lead into Wellington. And we had really good detailed mapping on that. 
So yeah. you can imagine our surprise when we get to these blockades that honestly, a real convoy, do a 98, crash the gate, we got us a convoy. We didn't crash no gates because we respect the laws. We respect the citizens. We were working in partnership with the police. But when we hit that, that you know, the edge of town and we're like, this isn't, this isn't what we planned on. And from that point on, it, it, you know, I, I got a lot of flack for that. People were blaming me and throwing me under the bus. As soon as I got downtown, it's like, Woo! and I was like, I didn't do this. this what is what were they were, blaming you for? Uh, for not getting the trucks in to Wellington, like we had all agreed on. And was the plan for all the trucks to be on Wellington? There was two main routes that were on our maps, and our logistics team had uh, put that in, and our maps are uploaded into the server, so there again, uh, you'd have to bring those back up for and, and review them all. But it was two main corridors that we'd had, and I don't have that off the top of my head. And uh, and so where did you yourself go? I went back to Confederation Park to start with Unity One, and that's where I parked Unity One, and then straight over to the Ark Hotel. And what uh, type of vehicle were you driving? A 1991 Glendale Royal Classic that was adopted and named Unity One, not by us, but... Uh, but it's Sorry just, for uh, Unity One because it was the first it was the first convoy vehicle that started this Unity movement. And what size vehicle is that? That's big. It's thirty footer. Okay. And uh, can you put up, uh, please, Mr. Clerk, OPP zero 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 one four eight nine. This is a document you won't have seen before, uh, Mr. Bowder, but it's. Uh, comes from the Ontario Provincial Police Report, and it's dated January 28, 2022. Um, and if you can go to item five, I believe it is. Uh, and it, it refers to a video posted on the Canada Unity Facebook page. Um, and it says, James Bowder, who is driving in the convoy, indicates that Operation Bear Hug was intended to bring the law to Ottawa, and they will not leave the city until the law has been restored and they get their lawful freedom back. Is that something that you, you can recall communicating to the uh, OPP that you talked Correct. About? Yeah, multiple times. And then it says, uh, well, Bowder states that they have made plans so that members of the public and public transportation in Ottawa will not be disrupted. And let me stop there. What were those plans? From day one, convoy one, always keep the lanes open. That was well communicated. We had a code of conduct that uh, everybody had agreed to, had been distributed to all the truckers, uh, well communicated in the, in between the captains and the police. We worked in partnership together uh, multiple times, conversations and so on and so forth. And, and public safety has always been precedent number one, always. So anything that we could do working together in partnership and that, that actual word was used multiple times, partnership and safety. Thank you. And um, it goes on... Um he, to say he also hints that there are plans that they cannot make public for strategic and security reasons. Where is that? Um, Bowder further states that he anticipates that they will win in Ottawa, after which they will proceed to the United States to support the truck drivers there. Was that part of your plan? What date is plan? this? What date is this? January 28th, 2022. 28th, 2022. Yeah. Um, we lit up the world. And our brothers and sisters down south uh, in the border, uh, all the truck drivers, they started seeing what we're doing. And, uh, yeah, they were pretty excited, and they started convoying down there. And we figured, well, when this is done, uh, maybe we'll uh, go down there and we'll give them some support because they're supporting us up here. So that was what that was about. And then it says, um, he further references a memorandum of understanding that has been prepared 
that once signed will result in Prime Minister Trudeau, Aaron O'Toole, and the NDP leader stepping down. Is that something that uh, you you told the, the OPP? Um, don't recall. Sorry? I, I mean, obviously, I mean, if, uh, if we catch them uh, committing treason, <laughs> which we believe they have, uh, they'd be stepping down, right? And all the evidence that we wanted to sit down with the Senate and say, here, you know, we, we, we believe our government is committing treason. Uh, enforce the laws, please, Senate. Uh, at that point, yes, we would definitely expect to see Trudeau and, uh, well, Aaron O'Toole isn't any more, uh, but, uh, you know, applicable members that uh, would be identified uh, throughout uh, Canada that have committed treason and crimes against humanity. And we will never stop until that is public and on you know, another hearing needs to come. Um, I see my time is up. Could I have a few more minutes, please, uh, Commissioner? You actually have another 15 minutes. Oh, I do? Oh, good. Yeah. Well, we, we, uh, we all, obviously it's your lucky day, Mr. Bowden. Yeah, keep it going. <laughs> actually, it's for, uh, 13 minutes. Thank you. Um, now, you told us you were in, uh, you parked your, your vehicle in Confederation Park, and um, I understand that. Um, there were some people who set up a teepee in Confederation Park. Were you part of that? A teepee? Yeah. Uh, there was no teepees. We wanted teepees, and we could have had teepees, uh, but there was no teepees that well, I was aware of. Was there an incident that uh, um, the police spoke to you about uh, uh, regarding uh, Pat King and things that were going on at Confederation Park? Correct. And can you briefly tell the commissioner what that was? So a couple of days into uh, landing at the Ark, it was pretty hectic and chaotic, and I was very blessed to come across uh, these two uh, tribal sovereign clan mothers that I met at the Ark Hotel. And uh, being my wife as Algonquin, uh, it was a very interesting uh, conversation and, and, you know, we respect our elders deeply. And when two clan mums come up to you and want to talk to you, and, uh, you know, uh, the relevance behind Confed Park is that when we were here for Bear Hug One, we had attained the permission to use Confed Park, and we attained the permission again to use Confed Park. Okay, yes. so we had all that in play uh, for Bear Hug One and Bear Hug Two. So that's why we took Unity One to Confed Park, and our team was down there. And then comes along um, what I think is controlled op. Because what I was seeing from, from Pat King and then this incident that happened at Confed Park where this, uh, what I learned from the, the clan mums was that there was a fake chief named Chief J.D. Anderson. Now, he's claiming himself as a chief, but I find out from the clan mums, who are the hierarchy in the law in tribal, that this was not the case, and that um, he was running around Ottawa, and there was a... So I, I'm a trucker. I don't know anything about controlled op and all the rest of that stuff, and a lot of us didn't. That's why we had to call police on guard and help, you know, get in here and I take uh, it that so um, there was at, lots of those little incidents and bubbles of just you know shit disturbers right looking for your attention and I so take it that at, at some I think point Pat got wrapped up in that yeah and then they did something that is very wrong um they started a fire and a sacred fire okay there's a difference between starting a a, a, a you know a, a burn barrel kind of thing but this fake chief was running around and Pat's there and all these controlled op people that we'd identified were hanging out and it just was very greasy. It wasn't, it, this wasn't our, you know, that they basically just sort of, we're taking Confed Park over and from there, that caused a lot of conflict. And I take it uh, that ultimately uh, they, uh, they... Oh, well, it got big. It, they they this left. incident just about caused a, a like it was... You have no idea what happened behind the scenes. And that took me out, okay? You didn't know where James was? Putting fires out. 
trying to stop uh, the Indian natives, uh, you know, from going after Pat King and, and these fake chiefs. So I worked with the clan mums, who then worked with City Hall. I worked with the police. And together, we worked in partnership for safety, and we had to shut down Confed Park. And I was mad, because had that, not, had that event not happened, the clan mums were working to try to bring in some teepees. And you can imagine if we'd had some teepees there, because that would have completed the circle of unity. Without our tribal, we have no unity in this country. And they were very much a big part of this unity movement from coast to coast to coast. So we were really excited to get Thank you. an opportunity. And sadly, controlled ops yeah. and destroyed so, um, there We've heard evidence about... Um, Co various uh, complaints made by residents uh, when the convoy was in Ottawa, uh, things like constant honking, uh, smell of diesel fumes, harassment. Uh, did you see uh, and experience that? I experienced the biggest unity celebration in my life. And with that, you got everything else that comes with it. And... Um, just a, a few more questions. Um, did you have any contact with uh, truckers that were um, organizing uh, uh, blockades at Windsor? No. Nope. Coots? No. Nope. Emerson? No. Nope. Surrey? No. Nope. And yesterday, um, Mr. Marazzo, um, in his evidence, he, he, we had a live stream press conference from February 7th, and he made the statement, I'm willing to sit at a table with the Conservatives and the NDP and the Bloc as a coalition. I'll sit with the Governor General. Put us at the table with somebody that actually cares about Canada. Did you know about that statement? No. Did you have anything to do with it? No. It sounds like a good statement, though. That's what we wanted to do. And Tom was entrusted uh, deeply, uh, and we we're very, very grateful for Tom. Very grateful. He was exactly what we needed to help a bunch of truckers out that um, had a lot of emotions, um, a lot of fears, we had um, multiple police officers and agencies. Yeah. And there, there's just so we, much going on. I understand. Like, can Tom we come then to uh, big help? I, th I think they at a, at some point um, after the Emergency Act was invoked. Uh, I understand that uh, you and your your wife were arrested. Is that right? Correct. And I actually I'd like to bring that. Video but, up if we could because uh, that shows. How long is the video? Five sir? minutes. Not even. It's actually okay. quick. Well, it's can actually at least quick. show I think part this of it. It's relevant because it, it, it really is. Um, it's the new do video that you just received. Uh, that's this that morning. you. You. Uh, no. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. The one that I just. Yes. That we yeah. had problems with. Yes. Oh. Uh, this oh. is the hearing clerk. Just for everyone's benefit, uh, that video is a JBA 6081. Thank you. So I'm just coming out of the Arc Hotel here on Sunday, okay? And this constable here, if you're planning on leaving, yes, we were. And you can see the blockade of snow where we couldn't leave. We were obstructed. We couldn't leave if we tried. And just down the other side behind Unity One here, just down the road, there's a snow clearing crew coming down. Especially with it being uh, snowed in there. So you're willing to leave right now? We don't need to take action? I, I gotta get my hotel room up. Okay. okay. Okay, okay, right there. We're cooperating. Talk to Sergeant Louie with OPS. 
Now, also, when I came down, I was blindsided. I hadn't even had my morning coffee or nothing. And uh, 15 of these officers had a crowbar. They were trying to break into Unity One. I said, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I'll, I'll, I'll get the keys, okay? Uh, please, don't, don't, don't hurt it. And uh, ran back up. I grabbed my keys. I came back down. I want out. I want out. Got no lawful harm to anybody? Why not? So the question is, we're going to give you time Thank to check you. out Thank you. while we're talking minutes, not minutes. hours. Minutes. Minutes. How am I supposed to get out of that in minutes? Out. Well, can you back it out and go out? Uh, an RV don't back RV, out guys, of that crop. That way. That yeah. I was blocked by Ottawa city crews that didn't do their job and clean the streets. Call the auto police in seven days. This guy just said he was going to have to move up. No, not happening. Vehicles that are parked in this zone are all being towed and seized. Find your own way home. I actually don't. Okay, what's your name? Hotel. I'm Stu. Stu? Stu what? Where do you live? I'm in the hotel here. Where do you live? Is this your house? I actually, I'm homeless, and I live downtown Ottawa. You live downtown Ottawa? I, I'm homeless. Where? I don't have ID. No. It's like, I've, I've got, I guess, my health card. No, perfect. Seven days, you can call the auto police and get a release for it. Over. Conversation is over. What part of that you don't understand? We've already arrested two people at this location. Yeah, absolutely. Go check out. You give you how long did you give? So when I run your name, they're going to tell me your address is going to come back to what? Find your own way home. Probably somewhere in Sudbury because I'm homeless and I've been in Ottawa since uh, Canada Day and I've been living here. I'm on the like. Uh, can you just pause it there, please? Uh, do you want one? At what point can we forward it? Uh, yeah, this part, yeah, just uh, a little bit. About, uh, sure, try there. Okay, let's try there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe back. going keep going i think what you're going to see from here i don't know keep going i there is audio extensive audio behind this okay, well it's a little too long at this so point so i i, I, the I time think because it's already i don't, okay, we don't need but we to get we I mean, understand I your your evidence said, sir as to uh, to what happened to you uh you'll you'll notice that we yes. cooperated completely and if you got the rest of this you would you would you would see that my wife and I were very lawful, very peaceful, very respectful, as we always have been with the police. From thank you. Those, those are my questions, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we could, uh, I could call on the government of Canada, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Bowder. Good afternoon. My name is Brendan Vanianheis, and I'm one of the lawyers for the Government of Canada in this matter. Happy birthday. Thank you. I wonder if we could go to a document that you uh, wrote, I think, after you had left Ottawa. Which time? Uh, it's JBA 6043. On the first time, the second time, or the third time? Because it did three national, nationwide convoys. I'm not sure. You might have to tell me, but... Um, let me just ask you first if this is a letter that you prepared. Yep. Um, and looking at it, I suppose, it, it, in fact, you were still on the, as you say, on the front line in Ottawa when you wrote it, and you talk about having been there for about three weeks, right? Can you just uh, shrink this down a little bit so I can just... I, I mean, there's, there's so much that... Uh, Okay, so what's your, what, what, what do you need for a question? So this is a document that you wrote and made public after being in Ottawa for about three weeks. Okay. Is that fair? Okay. And if we look at the seventh paragraph on the page, um, it's the one that starts, the call for freedom, unity, and love has gone out, and Canadians answered. Do you see that? Correct. And in the 
last sentence of that paragraph, you say that you made a choice, you Canadians, I guess, made a choice to come to Ottawa, to Coots, to Windsor, and make your stand for freedom. Is it fair? All across Canada, coast to coast, we came together for our freedoms. And you told um, Mr. Leon that you were not in contact directly with the participants at the events in Coots and Windsor, for example, while you were in Ottawa, but you were grateful for the response across the country. Is that fair? <laughs> yeah, very grateful because they chose unity over division. And you accomplished more than you could have hoped to accomplish in terms of the national and international response. Is that fair, Mr. Bowder? Yeah. Yeah. You um, saw that what you had done inspired the protests at the borders in Coots, Windsor, and Emerson, Manitoba, for example. What I had done? I didn't. What, what you and others we. had done. What you and what you and others what had we, done. We, Team Canada, yeah. had done. The collective you. When I asked this question, yeah. and that um, those efforts by you and others. Um, uh, also inspired events at the Thousand Islands Bridge near Cornwall, the Blue Water and Sarnia Port Huron crossing, the Peace Bridge, the Fort Francis crossing, and the Confederation Bridge, bridge in Prince Edward Island, right? It was uh, a lot of people coming together because they were in pain. You inspired convoys in Surrey, BC, Vancouver, Toronto, Quebec City, Regina, and Winnipeg. I convoy for freedom, it's what we do. So if, if I'm uh, guilty of anything, it's uh, because I love to convoy and I love looking for my freedom that's missing. Uh, so uh, apparently other people, uh, you know, they wanted to convoy too on their own accords under the Bill of Rights. And, and uh, similar convoys amazing. were inspired in the United States too, right? Well, we started campaigning uh, strategically bear hug, uh, which I, I, I'm still wowed uh, at how that traveled around the world. Uh, it, it, it was Convoy for Freedom, Freedom for Convoy, and Bear Hug. Those three just exploded around the world. And it, it's still amazing. Uh, it, it's, it's godly. It went as far as New Zealand, Australia, Paris, Belgium, Finland, and the Netherlands, right? Thank you. Yeah. And the United Kingdom, right? Worldwide, we had the biggest unity movement in the world, and that goes down in history. And that's, that's all of us, Canada, thank you for coming together in unity and showing the world what this is all about. Thank you. Could we go to your statement of evidence, which is submitted, which you submitted to the commission? It's JBA 6080. This is the, the statement that you, you prepared and you submitted this, um, I guess, over the weekend, right? Eh? Oh, boy, oh boy. You're Warren bringing Monday. this one up, are you? This, this is, the, is the evidence statement that you were asking Mr. Leon to see earlier. Canada, this is the one that you want to look at and download and read because it has links to evidence contained within that link Trudeau to treason. We'll come back to that. Um, could we go to page four, please? If we could go to the, towards the bottom of the page under the heading, the launch of Canada Unity Convoy for Freedom. Do you see that area there? Yep. And you describe in the first paragraph under that heading that what happened to you in the spring of 2021 that led to the launch of Canada Unity, right? Yep. And uh, I understand from what you've written here that your employer, where you were a full-time truck driver, came to you and said that you would need to provide proof that you'd been injected with the COVID vaccines in order to be allowed access to uh, their clients' facilities, right? Yeah. And... Um, 
and therefore uh, you say that you were forced to quit your job, right? Yeah. And that's because if you were not willing to become vaccinated, then you would not be able to continue to attend at your employer's client's um, place of business, right? Vaccinated with the RMNA uh, gene altering therapy, uh, yes. Um. And that was a requirement that was imposed upon your employer as Correct. a condition of continuing to do business with the client, right? Correct. And to be clear, that was not um, a decision that was imposed upon uh, you by uh, government. Is that fair? No, that's not fair. Okay. Could we go to page six, please? Okay, sir, can you back up and what was that question again? That I you said asked? that that was not a decision that was imposed upon you by government. Oh, no, that... that hundred percent was imposed by this federal government as the main root of all of it and then followed by provincial governments that are so eager for a little piece of the trough to get some money and then the municipal governments at the very end uh so a three-ring circus of of just total unlawful issue of unlawful mandates that's that's your explanation for why you uh, quit your employment mr Bowder? No, I quit my employment because I'm never going to put that ever in me. I, I don't have any problems with vaccines. I've traveled internationally. I got lots of vaccines. Okay, those are medically approved and tested and everything else. But there's no darn way I'm going to put some gene-altering therapy into me. That's no good. And, and no way. That's my medical uh, rights. That's my lawful rights. And there's so many laws that are in this MOU that highlight that, Canada. Could we go to page seven, please, of this document? The second last paragraph on the page, please. Uh, shoot, I may have the wrong page. Excuse me a moment. You'd said six before, but... I just don't want to get it wrong twice. That's why we're here, because we did get it wrong. We chose division over unity, and hopefully we'll get it right, and we don't okay. have to go down this path again. Just, you can just wait for the question. Excuse me, it is page six, second last paragraph on page six. You see at the um, end of that paragraph, uh, Mr. Bowder, you've... Uh, written here that the words Convoy for Freedom and Operation Bear Hug got out internationally, deeply embarrassing our Liberal Minister, specifically Trudeau and Freeland, as they were called out by the international community, as they rightfully should be. You see that? Yep. Um, who uh, specifically in the international community did you have in mind when you wrote I don't that? have names. There's videos all over the place. Uh, like, you'd have to do that research yourself. There's a lot of evidence out there, and if you would like or you need evidence, um, by all means, I can provide it. I just don't have that recollection off the top of my head today. I just wanted to understand what you had meant, sir. That's all. But that's yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, could we go now to uh, another document that is a letter from you of February the 16th? It's JBA 6, or sorry, 708. You see, this is a letter from Canada Unity, I, I take it by you, that you submitted to the commission and wrote to the Ottawa police. Do you see that? Correct. And if we look at the third and fourth paragraph on the page, please. Starting with the, the paragraph that starts Canada Unity and the Convoy for Freedom. Do you see that? Correct. And you say that... Con you're also very concerned to hear about the estimated 2,000 missing firearms from Peterborough, Ontario, right? When crimes are committed, what do we do? We call the police, okay? And we had intel. We couldn't confirm or deny or anything. We just had intel. And any intel of crimes being committed 
that we uh, could identify, hey, right away, 911. This was a little bit more important that required, because it just, as you can see, the, 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 this was more where it felt that if it was put in a document, uh, that maybe it would get uh, a little bit more um, uh, assistance from the police to make sure that uh, if you can scroll the very top, and I'm not a I'm not a weapons expert. All I know is that that LRAD weapon um, was causing a lot of fear amongst everybody, and it was so we wanted to do our best. Remember, we're partnerships with the police all the way through. Hey, w what's going on? Uh, can you please address this and and put uh, everybody at peace? Because if that had been the case, we would have all said, no, no, I would have contacted everybody. I would have stood on buildings and said, no, please. Well, if you can just go back to my question, you'd become aware around February the 13th when it came out in the newspapers that there had been a trailer of approximately 2,000 stolen firearms from a trailer in Peterborough, Ontario. Is that what you're referring to? From the best of, I mean, whatever's here is what I can recall from what was happening. There was a lot going on. I was just you, you don't things. dispute that timing? Though, no. This is just a risk mitigation process to try to, uh, you know, give uh, the police uh, an opportunity to respond and, and do some... Uh, and, and you say your concern is not least because of that number of firearms, clips, and ammo being so easily taken, but because of their unknown location, right? Yeah, that's the evidence. I mean, we were getting intel that this was happening and they didn't know where it was, so... And, and, and you immediately, it. if you look to the next paragraph, you said, we have concerns that these weapons will be used against peaceful demonstrators or the citizens of Ottawa in order to blame the participants of this lawful demonstration, right? Correct. You, you were concerned that there was a connection between the events of the, uh, that were occurring in Ottawa on the Freedom Convoy and the theft of this large quantity of firearms, right? I didn't know anything uh, other than I got some intel, and I can't connect any of the dots. I'm not a, you know, this is just um, an observational request letter, really, um, that... This is stuff that I'm getting. It's concerning. It's deeply concerning. And I don't have all the evidence or the facts, but please investigate and, 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 and put, us, put us at ease. Sure, sure. And you knew by February the 16th about the fact that a large quantity of firearms had been uh, um, seized under search warrant in Coots, Alberta at the border blockade, right? Mm, I'd heard of uh, some stuff that was uh, being seized and so on and so forth at that time. Regardless, it was a reasonable concern for you to wonder if there was a connection between these stolen firearms in Peterborough and what was going on in Ottawa, Windsor, and elsewhere. Yeah, because this was so close. Um, when you get a rumor or a speculate, you don't play around with this. Like, this is serious business. And it's over my pay grade. And I felt that the, the right response was to notify the police. So that's thank, what we did. Thank you, Mr. Bowder. Those are all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, are the uh, convoy organizers. Good afternoon, Mr. Bowder. My name is Brendan Miller, and I'm counsel to the Freedom Corp, which is an organization that represented the protesters that were here in Ottawa in January and February of 2022. I am the lesser, better-looking yeah, Brendan yeah, come, of the lawyers. Come, come forward so, or put your mic a little bit. Yes, barely, sure. There you go. Okay. okay. So I want to first discuss with you again, uh, you've mentioned uh, and has been put in evidence this memorandum uh, of understanding, right? Correct. So I take it that was just basically a piece of paper, fair? Yeah. Right. And therein, and nothing that I've seen at least, uh, Canada unity has never called for any form of violence. No. Uh, you never called to violently throw, overthrow the government of Canada. Never. You never offered to do any form of sabotage, like blowing up bridges or anything like no. that? No. No, you didn't? Actually, can, can I, for, from that one there, speaking of rumors again, yeah. we got a rumor that our big trucks down in, in Windsor, uh, or the, the big bridge down there, right, um, that the vibration 
So we put a call out, used our social media. Hey, everybody, uh, if, if this is the case, uh, out, um, get off that bridge. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's all that I could do from my position to try to risk mitigate, right? Uh, anything to do with risk. Right. I'm going to jump in and try to take a, a high risk down to a lerp. Right. But uh, I take it that there was <clears throat> no motivation and uh, no expression on part of your organization and yourself uh, to call for any form of violence or no. destruction of property. No. Okay. We're calling for love and unity and, and peace and, and giving bear hugs. I mean, <laughs> okay. violence is the last thing in our minds. Now, you don't have to answer this question. I'm just telling you because you don't have a lawyer. Because what I'm about to ask you is subject to privilege, okay? So you don't have to answer it. You, yep. You're not required. Yep. Did you have a lawyer help you prepare the memorandum of understanding? No. Okay. No, just two truck drivers. Two truck drivers. So it was just a document written by two truck drivers. Yeah. All right. With no legal advice. No. All right. And you can agree with me that uh, in that document, of course, it, it's proposing that the governor general and the Senate uh, would essentially take over government in consultation with the committee is, is uh, that... not take over government. Yeah. yeah. No, right. uh, they would, because the, the, that those are the key holders of our laws. Mm -hmm. Okay. When, when Trudeau messes up, we're supposed to be able to go to the governor general and have a communication with her or whom him or whoever is, is elected in that position. And when you research into the Helsinki act, you're going to find a very, very interesting Right, right. And I, and, and I don't so, I don't need to, this is just the only question. I just want to make sure you're clear. You understand, of course, the governor general is appointed by the prime minister. Correct. Right. And you understand that senators are appointed in, correct. in Canada. So those are non-democratic actors, right? Yep. Right. So can you agree with me that what you were actually asking for was somewhat of an undemocratic uh, solution? Yeah. Well, yeah. Democratic, I guess. Uh, I mean, if you're asking uh, to come together uh, at a table and, and right. communicate, um, and yeah. you know, if they don't respond, you have nothing. Right. Right. You got nothing. Right. And you're going to communicate yourself into the wall because and, it uh, takes two parties I, to I, make an MOU. Right. Become I get it. Okay. Something. But the other thing I want to ask you is this: is that my clients, Freedom Corp, Tamara Lich, Tom Marazzo, uh, Chris Barber, etc., none of them supported the memorandum of understanding. They actually asked you to withdraw it, right? It was them who requested it. I didn't hear them request. They didn't come to me personally and okay. say, James, would you request this? My wife and the sovereign clan mums, um, we talked and out of respect, uh, just to say, Hey, I mean, it's, it, it served its purpose. Okay. Right. At that point, because of other situations with the freedom corp where I was put Tom in place. And then from there I backed off because I was dealing with all the shit that Pat had been doing and everything yeah. else. And I didn't even get a chance to come and talk to the Freedom Corp. I didn't yeah. even know who they were. Okay. And so... Really, I didn't know who the Freedom Corp was until weeks down the road. All right. And I take it my friend uh, uh, with the government, he put to you a discussion or a statement that you made about the Prime Minister had been condemned by the international community. Do you remember when he put that to you just moments oh, ago? That, yeah. Right. Was what you're making reference to, just to remind you, was it the March 2022 incident where the Prime Minister was to speak uh, in European Parliament and a bunch of the members of Parliament walked out and gave speeches against him invoking uh, the Emergencies Act? Is that what you were referring to? Yeah, that's yeah. the, like, there's evidence out there. It's pretty easy to find, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next. Nice uh, to meet the Freedom Corp for the first time. Uh, call on the uh, Ottawa Police Service. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Michikovsky. I'm a lawyer for the Ottawa Police Service, Mr. Botter. Nice to meet you, David. <clears throat> Thank you. You too. Um, I understand that you participated, you said, in an earlier convoy to Ottawa. Is that right? Yeah. And that was the United We Roll? Yeah. That was in 2019? Correct. And I believe in that case, you um, ended up staying in Ottawa for several weeks? 2019? In 2019? Yeah. No, I, we came, we, we were here for three days, and we went back home. Three days? Yeah. And it was peaceful? Yeah. And were you uh, parked on Wellington? Uh, I believe uh, we were there, and then we were out at uh, Arm Prior, and then we came back in. I think it was back and forth for a couple of days. Honked our horns and went home. 
And you maintained contact with the police while you I were I was here. not an organizer in that first 2018. That was uh, compliments of Glenn Carrot and Haley Whale. I was just, uh, I, I was here with my camera and I was a participant and I was invited to be on the convoy because, uh, you know, trucker and, and I was just invited. I was a participant and, and my wife had told me, uh, she says, James, this is my first launch of Canada Unity kind of thing. She says, it's not about you. Point the camera on everybody else and give them their voice and, right. and I, let their I, voice be on the platform. So sorry, I, I wasn't an organizer of 2018 at all. No capacity at all. Appreciate that. Uh, but you were here with a number of other vehicles, yeah. correct? Yep. And you had no issues with the police? No. No problems? Not that I was aware. No, I was too busy feeding the homeless in Ottawa. Okay. And so you, there'd be no reason for the police to suspect this time that the convoy you participated in would uh, cause problems because it didn't last time either, correct? No correlation at all, none. And I wasn't involved in the, with, with any of the dealings with the police uh, for 2019 at all. Right. Uh, just a uh, participant. I just want to talk about the parking situation. Um, you talked about where you could park in Ottawa. Do you recall that? Which time? Uh, this time. Okay. And Which, I think the, you said the, you the had first, some maps. The first bear hug or the second bear hug? I'm sorry? The first bear hug or the second bear hug? The, this time, when you were here in February. Okay, second bear hug too. Right. Okay. And so it, you said you were um, given some maps. So if we could just maybe call up that map, uh, it's JBA40068. And so you'll see this, uh, it, it, we'll just scroll through it for a minute and then I'll come back to it. Can you just back up for a second, please? Sure. Take direction from the police whenever applicable, leave open space for emergent vehicles at all times, no closed trailers permitted on Wellington, uh, all staging areas must be kept on adjacent emergency vehicle. Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, and this is what you were referring to and then there's some maps if we scroll down. There's a lot of maps. Right. So this is what you were talking about, the information you had, correct? Logistics and planning and all sorts of stuff. And so if we um, could please look at... Page. That was a big team that put this all together. Uh, were you coming eastbound on Highway 417? Which time? Uh, this time. Uh, I actually came in from the east Right. So we, with we, Martin and the eastern convoy. Okay. So were you traveling eastbound on Highway 417? Uh, eastbound. No, westbound. You were coming no, westbound. I, I, I'm from Calgary. I don't know your okay. streets. So the same just... tree and these maps, I got a big team. Okay. Okay, and I know that they specialized in doing a lot of logistics and, and mapping and everything else. I just know that I overviewed and, and I made sure that the main, uh, the safety points were in, in, in correlation for all of our captains, and if our captains had any problems or questions, then we would right. make a, you know, change. And so you weren't able to park on Wellington this correct. time, correct? Yeah, all points lead to Wellington. And so you'll see on page three, the map uh, shows um, uh, parking only in curb uh, lane, capacity 38 tractor trailers. Do you see that on Wellington? Yep. And so... Uh, if that was our goal all the way along was take the curbs, leave the center open for everybody. And then we are there lawfully and we're, you know, right. But you, on the, you see, there's a limited amount of parking on well, Wellington. If, if you correct? know how long, Sorry, a, if, if you, you just know how finish. long a block is and how long 53 foot trailer is and so on and so forth. And you do the math roughly, you can get about 38 tractors in there. Right. So you, you agree with me, there was limited parking and you knew that on Wellington street, correct? Yeah. Right, and so if we keep scrolling down, there are then uh, instructions for where vehicles uh, are supposed to come in, depending on whether they're coming from the west or the east, and there are staging areas for those vehicles, correct? Yep. Okay, so there's nothing that suggested that there was unlimited parking on Wellington, correct? Mm, nope. Okay, and... Um, if you could also look at um, OPP, uh, speaking of maps and parking, if we could just turn up uh, OPP oh, uh, four zeros, 
4261. And so if we could turn, please, to page five. Uh, you will see on the bottom, uh, well, if you look at Parliament Hill area one, you'll see the traffic plan provides that a decision will be made by the incident commander uh, based on the location of the individual convoys on when to shut down traffic in this key area. And then if you scroll down a little further, uh, where it's a stacking area, you'll see the real estate roadway on Wellington will be filled on a first come, uh, first, uh, on a first come basis, no spots reserved, and then vehicles are to be staged along Wellington. Uh, and so there were specific instructions you understood as to where the convoys were supposed to be uh, parking, correct? Correct. Um, and then just finally, just to um, conclude, um, there is um, a, an article in, I believe, Vice magazine about you. Have you seen that one? You got it? Um, well, l let me, let me just... You're going to reference it. Do you want to pull it up? Um, it let, let me just a ask you um, this, sir. The article talks about um, um, you having... Um, uh, Facebook uh, postings saying that the 2020 election in the U.S. was rigged. What's that have to do with this? Uh, I'm just the asking US you if, if, those are, if that's what's posted on well, your... I, I believe that it was rigged, but right. what's that got to do with this? And you've shared on that Facebook hashtags for QAnon. Fair? Yeah, so? And um, that 9-11 was planned by a shadowy uh, government body. Is that correct? If, I, if you've seen it, uh, there again, you're, you're trying to make me recall stuff uh, that I don't have uh, to recall, but I'm going to take your word uh, okay. that you've seen it with your own eyes, obviously, that you're trying to do stuff. But what's the point? What does that have to do with us being here to talk about an emergency act that was unlawfully invoked by Trudeau? Right. And um, just to, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, just to finish off, um, I understand, and I'll pull up this document and maybe you could just confirm it. It's uh, OPP 403562. And if we could um, please go to page five. Just going to ask you about two pages on it. The third uh, bullet um, under open source information. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so it indicates an image of Ottawa police notice to demonstrators has been posted to the Freedom Convoy Facebook group page. And you see that? Okay. And is that in fact correct? You did see that notice to protesters? Negative. You did not see it? Nope. This is Freedom Convoy 22. I'm Convoy for Freedoms, the original. Okay. So you didn't, you didn't see that? Okay. No. And then if you could please go um, to uh, page 7. The second paragraph, I believe. Yeah, uh, it, you're actually highlighted in there. And it indicates police information indicates James Botter of Canada Unity was more so aligned with uh, King, that's Pat King. His current position as to who he may align with or direct his some odd 40 odd trucks remains a gap. So am I correct that you are in, were, in fact, aligned with uh, Mr. King? In what respect? Uh, in terms of your participation in the... In the uh... so, so Pat King, I mean, it, it's no secret. I mean, the guy's a, a social media guy, 
and and that's what we brought Pat King in for. It was social media, and he was really good at it. Plus, he also had a background in in convoys and logistics and stuff like that. So, I mean, Pat was Pat, and um, we don't have to agree. That's the beauty sure. of 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 all of this is that we all had individual rights to be right. here, and we came together as a team with and our indifferences. Right, included. and um, and then it talks about you having about forty odd trucks. Uh, that you believed were in your control. Is that, is that a reasonable estimate? No. Was more or less? Um, with respect to what date, when, and 40 trucks, like, I, I don't even... That would, you would have some influence on whether they would stay or go? I don't have influence over anybody that's exercising their Bill of Rights, okay. nor would I ever want to. Okay, thank you we're very much. We're all free will to come here on our own. Thank you very much, Mr. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, next is the uh, Ontario Provincial Police, the OPP. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see me and hear me okay? You're on mute, or we can't hear you, so. Is he here in the court? No, he's... Uh, oh, Zoom, Zoom. Zooming. Oh, zooming, he's zooming zooms. Zooms. We're, okay. We're high tech. I was like, huh? What? <laughs> can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can. Yes, Okay, I guess there might be a bit of a delay which caused that issue. Uh, but sir, can you see me and hear can see me on the screen and hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Yep. Right, my name is Chris Diana. I'm counsel to the OPP. I just have a couple of questions that just arose out of some of the evidence that you gave in response to questions from my friend, counsel to Government of Canada. Uh, he brought you to a document where you expressed some concern that a number of firearms have been stolen from the Peterborough area. Do you remember that? Yes. And I take it you were concerned about the possible existence of firearms, perhaps, uh, in your area there? Rightfully, yes. All right. Do you know what happened with those firearms? No. Uh, that was the last I heard of it, was that report. Right. And then from there, I got distracted uh, and off to another, putting out something else. Okay, so I would put to you, and just because I don't think that's information that should should be out there without resolution, but I would put to you that those firearms were recovered only a couple of days after they were stolen. Uh, do you That's know that? No, I, I honestly, after that, uh, there was a lot of other things and I, I just didn't get a chance to uh, follow back on it, but I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, um, if, if we were able to help uh, in any way and just alert you, yeah, you know, it's just one of those things when you See something, yeah, phone crime stoppers kind of thing. So we were just well, doing I our think, part to, think, to help. I, sir, thanks. I think police services were aware uh, okay. of it. But Commissioner, I think this is an important fact that, again, that I don't think should be just kind of out there as a loose end. And although this document was not on the list to be put to the witness, I think it's relevant to this issue. And so I would like to refer to it now on this point. And that's document OPP 401549. And if we can make it a bit bigger, thank you. And sir, you will not recognize this document. It's internal email correspondence within the OPP. Uh, if you can go to page two, please. And under it says update 10. This is a, an email from Brad Collins, who's uh, with the OPP to a number of others within the OPP. You'll see it says Peel Regional Police confirmed the recovery of the stolen load of firearms from Peterborough Police Service Jurisdiction. Information developing, but the load of rifles has been recovered, save for possibly a few individual pieces removed from skids. Do you see that, sir? Yes. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Commissioner. I have no further questions, but I thought that was a uh, factual issue that should be dealt, dealt with. Thank you for clearing this up that we were able to help uh, assist in catching some bad guys. Yep. No further questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, Council uh, for Former Chief Slowly. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Tom Curry for, for the former chief. Uh, we have no questions for Mr. Oh, Water. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is uh, City of Ottawa. Alyssa Tompkins for the City of Ottawa. This city has no questions for this witness. Thank you. Next is the uh, Ottawa uh, Residents uh, Coalition.
Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Botter. My name is Paul Champ. I'm a lawyer for the Ottawa Coalition of Residents and Businesses. Just have some questions for you. Nice Paul. to meet you, Paul. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Um, the MOU, uh, people could sign that or show support for it online? or At the present uh, time that we had it uh, going out there, we yeah, you could sign on it. Right. And then you would get a digital certificate of authenticity and everything else stating that you actually signed it, uh, like DocuSign. Right. Much. Right, and and to your knowledge, did the other uh, some or some of the convoy organizers uh, did some of them sign it? There's no way I could sit here and recall okay. close to four hundred thousand signatures. That's fine, no problem. So uh, next, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what the plan was uh, when you were coming to Ottawa. You know, seen some of the videos and whatnot, and your your Zoom call on on January twenty third with uh, Mr. Barber and Ms. Belton and Mr. King. Um, what was the plan when you were going to come to downtown Ottawa? You were you were going to try to like uh, encircle downtown. Was that what Operation Bear Hug was? No. Nope. Uh, we wanted to come here and, and talk with our government, the federal government specifically. Okay, I'll, I'd ask uh, the clerk to bring up uh, document COM zero zero eight three eight. And that's the transcript. While, while he's calling that up, um, I want to ask you another question about uh, some of the, the protest tactics you were thinking about when you came to Ottawa this time. Um, was, it, was it discussed or was it planned to have uh, groups of people without masks go into restaurants and shops and uh, stores? Yeah. That was, that was part of the plan, to make the point that you're free people who could yep. go where you want. Yep, because, okay. I mean, we were here for Bear Hug 1, right? And we've got all the videos of us exercising under the Bill of Rights, our lawful freedom of choice. And it just proves that uh, when you follow the path of law, you'll find that these mandates don't have the law to back them up. And that's why we went with the police. And we talked with the police and we communicated with the police and we got it all on video. Sure, but they're there all the time. And at any given time, if we had committed and broken laws, we would have been arrested right there. But you know what? The police of Ottawa were, were really helpful, and they right. showed us that we can do lawful events. And, and from there, uh, we told Ottawa that when we were here, we would be right. back. So, so but the, the plan was as a, f a form of protest to go into restaurants and shops without masks to show that... Yeah, you we, we were protesting back. that all over the world. And the... So and the, 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 the and, and I, I know I'm going to regret doing this, but... The, the Canadian Bill of Rights has property rights. What about the property rights of the restaurant or the shop owners? Why couldn't they ask people to not come in unless they're wearing masks? Didn't they have those rights? Or was your rights more important than their rights? Well, let's see here. So you're asking Canadians to violate and participate in an unlawful mandate. So I don't want to break the law and, and put myself in a situation where, uh -huh, you know, like these mandates are going to be proven that they were unlawful all the way through. And history will write that, not me. If you could just bring up page 27. Uh, and while that's coming up, I'll ask you just another question on that, Mr. Bowder. But uh, wasn't that maybe a little bit of a recipe for conflict at times if a store owner or like a teenage staff asked people to leave who aren't wearing masks and they wouldn't leave. Wasn't that a risk of, of some conflict there? I, I'd say that the risk of conflict was the day that the, the unlawful mandates were put across Canada and our government um, ignored us from there on in. Right. So because the government imposed those unlawful mandates that gave you Thank and you the people for you saying they were unlawful. with. Thank you people, for saying they were the unlawful. people that you in protest with could then override the rights of a, of a no, staff. No, we couldn't override anybody. Or could threaten a staff. Couldn't if they threaten said, anybody. Please, uh, if I could finish. But, so, but when a staff member would ask people to leave, you, you saw some conflicts in stores and restaurants, didn't you, Mr. Bowder? Seen conflicts all over this country. Yeah, but you saw some in Ottawa while there were several thousand people at downtown and big trucks going into stores. Yeah, no, and that's why we brought them. the police okay. along yeah. with us and they handled the conflicts. If, if you can... 
try and you're you're eager to answer, I understand, but if you could wait till the question's finished to okay, answer. Sorry. So if we could just roll to near the bottom of this page where it starts, Mr. Patrick King, just up a bit. Mr. Patrick King, uh, you let the spark here again, uh, but it's not just going to roll into Ottawa and park in the trucks for a couple of days. James, give them an idea of what's going to... Just a, it, uh, I apologize. Slow down uh, for the translators. Please. Thank you. James, give, me, give them an idea of what's going to partake in Ottawa and we're there. Just an idea. Don't let the cat out of the bag just yet, but let them... Uh, uh, give them a little bit of an idea. Uh, what, was the, what was the cat in the bag at that point, Mr. Bowder? Do you recall? What date is this? This is, uh, sorry, this is, I apologize, Mr. Bowder. This is a transcript of your Zoom call with uh, Ms. Belton and Mr. Barber and Mr. King on January the 23rd, as you're planning. January 23rd. If we go through, maybe this will assist your memory. So at the bottom, it says, Mr. James Bowder, okay, well, you know, let's see here. What is a bear hug detail? Well, A, we're going to have some fun doing a bunch of convoys all over Ottawa. Okay, we won't mention where, but we're going to have fun definitely going a whole a different pile of convoy activities. We may potentially convoy over to Justin Trudeau's house. Good, says Mr. Barber. Uh, Mr. James Batter, you know, little things like that. We may get stuck on a couple of bridges, things like that. So that was part of the plan, Mr. Bowder, is to maybe block bridges for a period of time? Well, if you notice that when we were in Ottawa the first time, we did block uh, a lawful sure. blockades, right? So, right. I mean, we are allowed under our Bill of Rights and so on and so forth to do coordinated uh, with the police. We wouldn't right. have done any of this without the police. I can tell you that, so... But, but what you did in 2019, Mr. Uh, Bowder... I, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't do 2019, okay? That was another organizer, so please. Right, so... You, you know, have to understand, that was already put on record that I did not have anything absolutely. to do with 2019 well, as you, a organizer. Right, you didn't have okay. anything to do with organizing. I just said you, you're homeless. That's it. But you, but you participated in that protest in 2019, and that protest in which you participated with a number of trucks in a convoy, you came from staging areas a, couple, a few times a day, did draw, drove around downtown a few times around the parliament buildings, and then would go back. And you did that a few days, and that was a successful protest. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. So this time you had to do something more. Is that right? Right? That was the plan. You had to do something more. You had to not simply come downtown, you had to stay downtown and create a bear hug around downtown. Is that right? That's your words. Well, Operation Bear Hug is your words, but is that what it meant? You wanted to do something different and bigger this time. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, Because uh, and obviously every other option to try to communicate with this government had failed. That's right. So you needed to increase the volume, so to speak. Correct. You had to encircle downtown and apply some pressure, right? What do you mean by encircle and apply pressure? Well, encircle, have trucks all around downtown. Love, hug, right? Hug. Yeah, hug. so, okay, yeah. so, and, and apply pressure. To who? To what? To the, the people that you're hugging. Mm. So... Okay. All right, Mr. Bowder, uh, just, I've had no, I only have a couple more minutes here with Sorry, you, but I want to ask you about uh, horns. Now, the horns, when they're very loud and when they're all going at the same time, uh, I've heard it described as something that's almost biblical. Is that something how you would describe it? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say that uh, when, with the reference of the, the trumpets and bringing down the walls of Jericho. Right, and that's where I was going to go. Uh, Joshua, book six, talks about how you bring down the walls of Jericho with the trumpets, right? I have honestly never read the Bible, and I just got baptized last year, and I still haven't read the Bible. And I really am a weird duck, and I don't get it, but that's the truth. I could, could we uh, particularly counsel? Uh, I don't want to set off things, and I think it's important that it, at a minimum, Council give the example. What does that mean, sir? So did I do I'm, something wrong? No, no, you did nothing. Oh, I'm wrong. sorry. I'm I'm just having some trouble with, with the. Uh, what council? 
with the crowd and council, but that's my problem. Don't worry. You're giving your evidence. Everything's okay, okay. from your perspective. Okay. I, I'm nearly finished here, Mr. Bowder. I just want to understand. So you haven't read the Bible, but it sounds like you know the story of Jericho, right? I've heard of it from, from uh, others. Right. It was fascinating. It was really interesting. Right. And that inspired you a bit for the, the tactics uh, for the convoy protest in Ottawa, correct? Mm. No. Well, you raised it before I did. So, so right. If if you want to get into this and, and talk about God, so when I got baptized, I was told by God to put this convoy together and come to okay. Ottawa, and that's that's where I'm at. I, I, I don't want to get into big uh, uh, discussion about your your faith, Mister Bowder. I respect your faith. Uh, I just want to understand to what extent your faith inspired the tactics that that you suggested and worked on with others with Ottawa. So it's it's my understanding with with. Jericho, the plan was to encircle the city. They walked around the city six time, six I days think it was in a, just the in a parliament row. building where right. they walked around the, right. the parliament building because that's where the evil is at. Well, and on Saturday, the first day of the protest, Saturday the 29th, isn't that what the trucks did? They did a circle around the parliament buildings. They went across the bridges over to Gatineau and around, right? The first bear hook? Yeah, no, no, this this one in, in on January of 20. Well, I don't know. I was out in the east, so I don't know what was happening on that because we had two days of convoys coming from all over Canada. Um, and I was, like I said, I, I was with the eastern crew and we got stuck out in the middle of nowhere and then we had to come in here and that pissed off a bunch of people. And uh, it's just uh, what it is. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowner. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, the... Uh Democracy Fund Citizens for Freedom, JCCF. Good afternoon, Mr. Bowder. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rob Kittredge, and I'm counsel for uh, the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms. And you, like me, are a chatty man and a challenging witness. So I'm going to try I, and do the impossible here. I'm trying to be challenging, honestly. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as open as I can. I, th I agree that you are being as open as, as you can. Uh, but I'm going to try and uh, uh, persuade you to uh, give me yes or no answers, if you can. Because what we're trying to... One I'm, of the things... Okay. So one of the things we're trying to do here, we have a short period of time, and I am trying to construct an argument that the Emergencies Act was invoked unlawfully by Trudeau, and your yes or no answers will help me to do that. Um, I can play with this. Pardon me? I can get along with it. All right, well, let's see, let's let's see how well we do. So, we um, talk? so uh, what I'm looking for is a little clarification on a series of questions that uh, my friend Council for Canada asked you earlier on today about how you and others in Ottawa inspired other protests across Canada and around the world. You had an emotional response to those questions, as I think I would as well if I were in your position. Um, and I just wanted to get a bit of clarification for the record about what inspired meant to you in that context. Um, and again, if we can do yes or no questions, yes or no answers, that would be great. Um, Council for Canada said that when he said you, he didn't just mean you, he meant and I quote, the collective you, meaning you and the other people in Ottawa. Uh, was that your understanding when you answered those questions? No, I thought he was referring to me personally. To you specifically? Yeah. All right. Um, so, Council for, I, I thought, uh, well, it doesn't matter what I think. Uh, Council for Canada suggested what you, that you uh, inspired other protests across Canada and around the world. You agreed. You remember that series of questions, do you? Yeah, the questions, yeah. All right. Um, I understood your answers and your emotional response to mean that you were proud that the protest here in Ottawa had been seen by others in Canada and around the world, and that they had independently decided to protest themselves. Was that your understanding? Yeah. Uh, can you say yes for the record? Yes. Yeah, because it's a written transcript. Yes. So. Um, sorry. And, uh, I say sorry a lot. Pardon me? Typical Canadian, I say sorry a lot. <laughs> right, as do I. Uh, so while the, uh, while the Ottawa protesters, yourself included, may have inspired protests outside of Ottawa, you didn't organize any of those other protests, did you? No. People elsewhere may have seen what you and others were doing here in Ottawa, but they independently decided to follow that example and raise their voices in protest, didn't they? Yes. Um, and uh, just to be, uh, I guess, fair to you, since you've been so fair to me, um, I have a minute or two left. If uh, I was wondering if there was anything you'd like to tell us about how it felt to inspire people around the world to raise their voices. 
Objection. Get into my feelings. Objection. I'm not sure how that's relevant. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I, 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 still to this day, how I feel. I'm broken, but because people come together and they chose on their own accord to choose one word, unity. I will forever be grateful and thankful for Canada, for giving the world hope because we needed it. I got a lot of feelings and I'm sorry. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bowder. Those are my questions. Thanks for the love. And thanks for the bear hugs. M Mr. Keep Commissioner, uh, yes. that's Paul Champ on the record. I apologize for not saying it earlier for the purposes of transcripts. I just know I, I didn't ask Mr. Bowder any questions about his many hateful comments about Islam, uh, his many hateful and bigoted comments about uh, homosexuals. I, I'm not sure how this is relevant. What, what are I, I you agree. doing here? I didn't think it was relevant. That's when I asked. But that's why I'm asking why Mr. Bowder is given an opportunity to, to answer those kinds of questions, whether, which are otherwise well, irrelevant. Well, it's, firstly, huh? um, it was a question within his time period, and he was asked how he felt. I'm not sure what that adds, if that's your point, in terms of uh, the evidence. But in any event, I was going to give him, as he's unrepresented, an opportunity to say something at the end. So I think all this has done is do it in advance. But what exactly is your point? You want it, what, struck from the record? Or do you want a further opportunity to cross-examine? What is it you're after? Well, Mr. Bowder has asked, uh, has made many comments about uh, unity. Um, if, if that's relevant to the commission, I could ask, uh, I would ask for it, ask him some questions about his views on unity. If you want to do further cross-examination, uh, you stopped at the end. I was prepared. I didn't cut you off. If you want to come back up, you can go ahead. Mr. Bowder, you've testified many times about your love and brotherhood uh, for others and your love of unity, uh, but you would agree with me, uh, you don't feel unity towards all Canadians. It does not include Canadians, for example, of Islamic faith. Isn't that right? No. You, you are upset that you feel the government of Canada promotes Islamic ideologies. You said that before, correct? Was that before I got found God? Okay, so you've said that before. Was that before I found God? Because you're you're asking dates, and I don't agree with what you're saying now to date, right now. Okay, well that's okay, good. that's I that's that. where I'm under oath. I appreciate today. that. I don't agree with that. Okay, I thank you. I appreciate that. Now we've seen some documents up there where you've referred to Prime Minister Just to Justin Trudeau as Justine Trudeau. Why yeah. do you refer to him as oh. Justine Trudeau? Why not? Are, are you trying to suggest something? It's emasculating or making some kind of comments or suggesting be a typo. that she's. I don't know. Uh, could Pardon be a me? typo. I don't know. Pardon could, me? Could be a typo. Was it a typo? It's your word, sir. Well, maybe it's a typo. I don't know. But are you telling us it's a typo or were you trying to suggest something because you think it's somehow negative uh, to be uh, of uh, transgender or so forth? Is as an alpha male uh, trucker oil patch farm boy kind of guy uh, and see an old little Mr. Trudeau there in his boxing shorts with his juice box water bottle sort of things. Yeah, we call him Justine. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you. Um, okay, that's uh, any re-examination? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bowder. You're free to go. Uh, Am I free to go? Or you're, yes, you are. This is uh, you're completed your examination. Right on. Um, I'm not done. Is I, am I not allowed my 15 minutes or no? If you'd like to make a statement, uh, that's yeah, fine. There, you can a have video it. that I'd really like to bring up, and I'm just, I lost my video stuff. And it's got to do with, hmm, hang on here. Where is the video? Jason, where are you? 
Uh, the speech out in uh, Quebec. The unities. Which number? Media press release. I, I don't have it on here. Okay, is it in the file or no? Which number? I just... Uh, it I'd like to leave, I really would like to have that video of, of this. Uh, I, I, I have four videos um, with a JBA prefix. Uh, I can give you the titles if that helps you that I have. I have one that says maskless shopping, no. one that says James at Trudeau's house, no. December 21st. That's worth watching. Uh, one that's MOU served December 21st. No. And then we already showed JBA um, 81 during um, commission councils. Well, we, we tried to upload a lot of evidence and we had problems and technical issues and so on and so forth, but it was, uh, it was a very, it was too bad. Maybe you could just sum it up for us. It was when we left Calgary, my wife and I, and for those that want to do their research in Canada and look into the definition and our history and our governance and respects to division over unity. When I was looking at all the governance aspects and policy aspects, looking for a solution, you can imagine when the word unity was given to me and that has forever changed my life, my heart, my mind. And from there, I, I, I did this little research because I was very, very stricken that, that in our country, there was nothing really out there for Canada unity. Like you Googled back then and there was only one reference that I could find as a, as a Western Alberta oil patch farm boy growing up with this, the West hates the East and the East hates the West. And I started asking myself, well, they're Canadian, aren't they? They're our brothers and sisters. Where does this division come from? So I get into our governance and I find out that by design, we are designed to be divided, right? In our governance. And that disturbed me deeply. It's, uh, it was, so that's when I made the first prayer. I said, God, what do we do? And he says, unity. Like, what? How am I going to put that into a corrective action? Well, you look at our history and, and how close we were to dividing. Quebec. Somebody in Quebec saved this country. And I don't know who. I tried and I tried to find this one person. Because if you remember in history when Quebec wanted to separate and we had a 51 to 49 vote. What if somebody hadn't raised their hand and said unity? Because that was the only reference I could find at that time was somebody had raised their hand in Quebec and said unity. And then there was a Canada unity flag. And that was it. And I was like, this can't be. So I went on Google and I registered all of everything, Canada unity, all of it. Trademark, all the everything. Yeah, and I'm it, not sure this so, is. So, can I just interrupt you for a minute? I mean, my stories, I, I try to. Sorry, sir. I I'm tell just, too much it, stories. It's, yeah, it's a little too much of a story. I'm not sure how when it I, helps us. I understand gonna, you're on, you, your unity. This video would part, tell it. But, but that's fine. I think your message has been given. And uh, we've seen. Uh, let's, let's wrap it up. Just please. Like, yeah. What I observed was that unity was missing, and I'm thankful to this day for Quebec for standing up and saving country uh, and putting unity onto that, uh, that table. It is my humble, humble honor to come from the West and come out to Quebec with my wife and with the olive branch of unity and say, let's stop dividing, let's stop the division, let's come together and... Thank you, Canada, for that precious, precious moment in our history. Okay. Thank you.
we're going to adjourn uh, for the afternoon break for 15 minutes. The Commission is in recess for 15 minutes. La Commission est levée pour 15 minutes. in 2022 is certainly about being able to make free choices for ourselves and for our family who we believe are the best. We have seen so much suffering over the last two years. People who die alone in terrible conditions, people losing dream jobs, polarized families and a society that insult and yell at each other for making a different medical choice. But people have risen and it will be through them that the future will have an important meaning for all of you, but especially for the next generation. Ruben News has been present at every step of this great challenge, but so many other pioneers whom you could meet and hear at our great conference about freedom for our beautiful country, which is Canada. This conference, which will be held in Calgary and Toronto, will show you the faces of the influence of freedom that you have seen over the past two years. You don't want to miss this. So get your ticket now at ribbonnewslive.com. And it will be a pleasure to see you there and meet you in large numbers. It's time to drop these masks and let the truth shine. Everyone, good evening, everyone. Good uh, afternoon. I am joined here by Celine Gallas, a Rebel News reporter from Alberta. Celine, how are you doing? I'm doing really fantastic. I left this morning in a blizzard and I came to Ottawa and it's like plus 15 degrees. So well, that's great. It's one great, good thing in Ottawa. The right great now. corrupt liberal city of Ottawa. You know, the architecture <laughs> is beautiful here, but the people not quite the same. If you want to let us know your thoughts throughout the live stream, you can always go on Rumble or Odyssey, send us paid chats, and we'll do our best to read it on air at the end of the live stream. Later on, we will have Freedom Convoy volunteer, not quite organizer, participant, public persona, Tom Razzo coming on. And we'll also have leader of the Ontario Party here in Ontario, Derek Sloan, come on as well to discuss the Emergency Act Inquiry and everything that has happened today. Uh, also, just so that you guys know, on November 19th and November 25th, we will have Rebel News Live events in both Toronto and Calgary. Um, and in the Toronto event, I believe that we will have Tamara Leash participant, uh, participate as a speaker. So you will be able to hear from uh, the great Tamara Leash, convoy kind of organizer Tamara Leash as well. So Celine, this was your first day in Ottawa. What was your main takeaway from today? 
Um, well, again, besides the weather, it's just really interesting to see. There's some protesters that have started to show up um, outside of where the emergency commission is being held here in Ottawa. Um, I can only imagine that where there are one, there will be many more to follow. So that'll be interesting. Um, I really thought that it was very interesting what uh, Tom Razzo screamed for all the people in the back, what we we're thinking uh, for the last three years. But when he actually refused to talk to mainstream media, um, that was really interesting. I believe we have one of those clips as well. But um, again, that's something that a lot of people have been saying. And it's nice to have people publicly refuting or refusing to speak with mainstream media. Yeah, I think we've heard both Chris Barber, one of the organizers of Freedom Convoy, and Tom Marazzo as well, in both of their testimony, discuss um, the way that they see mainstream media has manipulated the narrative, has vilified yes. the Freedom yeah. Convoy. I think that's the reason why people were so upset in mainstream media, because they weren't giving them a fair they share. They were portrayed correctly. Well, yeah. exactly. They were vilifying the people participating in the Freedom Convoy. We can see on the screen right here, Tom Marazzo refusing to take a question from one of the mainstream media reporters earlier today. So today, just a reminder, we had a Freedom Convoy lawyer, Keith Wilson, mm -hmm testify in front of the commission. We also had Freedom Convoyer Tom Marazzo testify as well. And we had Pat King who ended the day. I think he might still be giving his testimony, yeah. uh, King, yeah. at the moment. That is, that is very possible. Um, so Celine, you've been following also, I, I think that you've been following the con, not the convoy, the emergency second inquiry for the past weeks as well, for the past yeah, three weeks. I'll agree, that's right. It's been a long three weeks. Um, we always talk about what we're seeing throughout the inquiry. We also talk, uh, talk about our takeaway from the inquiry. What was your takeaway from the past three weeks? Well, um, as some of you might know, I was actually there when the convoy first arrived in Ottawa. I showed up the night, the same, the same night that the truck started to pile in um, around the Parliament building and down Wellington. And um, from that point onward until the police came and crashed it, it was peaceful. Mm -hmm. So my main takeaway from the Emergencies Act inquiry is that, uh, again, there's a lot of discussion around even what they're calling the protesters, if they're protesters, you know, if they're if they're racist, if they're misogynist, if mm -hmm. they're sexist, then the narratives just keeps on changing. And when you see so many inconsistencies with stuff like this, um, I think it's fairly obvious that it's it's a cover up that's going on. That's my opinion, at least that I believe that it's a cover up. And there is no way that you can actually with all of the, mm -hmm. the proof, all the videos from the very beginning since those trucks got there um, to the very end. No one can tell me that they were anything except peaceful. 100%. You were also part of the Freedom Convoy. Um, and you, we heard, as you just mentioned, Paul Champ, lawyer, that's, that keeps arguing um, about how non-peaceful, about how threatening the Freedom Convoy people were. Uh, we heard Zexy Lee say that the people, the people that were part of the Freedom Convoy were harassing citizens, even though we learned that the whole, the own citizens of Ottawa who were opposing the Freedom Convoy were throwing eggs. Eggs are egging them, the exactly. Protesters. Yeah. They were egging the protesters. Yeah. Is what you're hearing right now from the testimonies of these anti-convoy people what you, the same thing as you've witnessed as a journalist in Ottawa? Um, no, <laughs> like absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, I left before things, um, before the police started to really like pile in there and like crack down on the peaceful mm -hmm. protesters. So I just saw the very beginning where everyone was still in very much in a state of awe. And um, it was the first time that you saw so many people smiling together, laughing, being merry, cheering. That was kind of that was the norm that people were looking for. Mm -hmm. So when you have people like Zexy Lee who are testifying and trying to validate throwing eggs at trucks and at protesters because there was honking or like microaggressions and people were being offended. Um, it's very interesting. Like, how can you validate something like that? What do you think? Yeah, well, it, it's so crazy. And we've seen there's there's a single counter protester. Well, a protester actually that been, that's been here for the past for the past few days in front of the commission building that's been calling the truckers, the Freedom Convoy people, terrorists, has been calling them racist, that's been calling them far right lunatics. We see her right <laughs> here really... and not a single supporter of the Freedom Convoy has laid a finger on her. I think yeah. they were re-terrorists. Something like that would have happened and we have yet to see any violence that's been yeah. inflicted that's been put on this woman yes. for protesting Tamara Leach, protesting Tom Marazzo, protesting yeah. the Freedom Convoy people. Yeah. Well, especially like think about how Antifa was brought into yeah. this as well, right? So you had aggressors in the crowd that were trying to pretend that they were part of the, the freedom movement um, as these, pre these peaceful protesters. And 
you could see even I remember being there um, when so many people would take interviews from Mocha and myself or Alexa Lavoie or Lincoln J, um, anyone from Rebel or actual independent media. But you had people with huge cameras going and standing behind like police lines, casting this right. very ominous shadow over this crowd, making it look very dangerous. And that is not a part of the narrative um, that the people there mm-hmm. like actually saw, listened to. That's not what what they're portrayed as because the mainstream media is very, very good at uh, taking those angles and making sure that uh, the truth is smooth. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why Tom Morazzo refused to answer questions from, from the mainstream media. Freedom in 2022 is not sitting idly by while health diktats with no skin in the game make up all the rules. If you're like me, I want to play an active role in upholding civil liberties and freedoms for all Canadians, for our children, and eventually our grandchildren. Then come out to our Rebel Live event and get to know us in person we'll hearing from some of the most influential leaders in the freedom movement. We have events in Toronto on November the 19th and in Calgary on Saturday, November 26th. Tickets are on sale now at rebelnewslive.com. Come out, have lunch, get some rebel swag, meet the rebels and more. You don't want to miss this event. Check it out, rebelnewslive.com. Hey everyone, William Diaz here with Rebel News, currently at the Library and Archives building uh, in Ottawa for the Emergencies Act inquiry, the inquiry that is happening because Justin Trudeau used a never seen before anti-terrorism law on peaceful protesters in February back when the convoy was here in town to basically euthanize weeks of peaceful protests against COVID-19 mandates. And this morning, Freedom Convoy lawyer Keith Wilson was testifying in front of the committee. He spoke about hate speech. He spoke about organizational issues that the convoy organizers face while trying to plan the whole convoy and difficulties they were facing throughout the duration of the protest. So as he was coming out of the room, we were able to ask him a few questions. Here's what uh, Wilson had to say. Just, you said that your, your wife's assessment of the government overreaching the COVID-19 pandemic was what pushed you to you know, work with the convoy. Were you? Would you say just out of curiosity that you were an apolitical person before that? Or less concerned with the uh, civil liberties and everything? Uh, was I? Yeah. Well, I can assure you this, my wife was. Um, she was extremely apolitical and busy with uh, uh, her own activities and uh, caring for our elderly parents and doing work with her church. But her medical training was such that she observed the advice that was starting to come from the public health officials and doing her own research. And she said, this doesn't add up anymore. Um, And she became very concerned about the direction of the country, the level of overreach, uh, the mandates, the harm that they were causing to children in schooling, playgrounds, um, normal activities that she said, you got to get involved. Yeah. You know, we heard the Government of Canada Council talk about hate speech. What are your views on hate speech and hate speech laws uh, by the federal government? Well, my view is that in any other modern democracy, for a prime minister to call six million Canadians racist misogynists and say, how do we deal with these people and should we tolerate these people would result in such a level of reaction that that prime minister would be forced to resign and apologize. And the fact that this prime minister deliberately divided and created hate, engaged in the process of othering people, and so far has suffered no political consequences, absolutely remarkable. Do you think? Do you think if the prime minister has spoken with the protesters, you guys would have been here for less long, or the situation would have been resolved quicker than it was? You know, it's amazing that none of the protesters, and the leadership, and otherwise, wanted to meet with the prime minister. It's not an individual they hold in high regard. It's a, it's an individual that they believe has done unbelievable harm to our country, to its social fabric, and to our economy, and so on and is engaged in uh, uh, reprehensible conduct in terms of uh, his hate speech. 
uh, there was a strong desire and numerous requests to sit down with some of the federal ministers and have a substantive discussion about the policy foundations of the mandates. Because remember, the other G7 countries were not doing this. A lot of the Canadian... The Commission is reconvened. La Commission reprend. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. The next witness is uh, Tamara Leach. Leach. Ms. Leach, will you swear on a religious document or do you wish to affirm? I would like to swear on the Bible, please. For the record, please state your full name and spell it out. Tamara Lee Leach, L-I-C-H. Do you swear that the evidence to be given by you to this commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do so swear. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, Brendan Miller for Freedom Corp and also counsel to Ms. Leach. Uh, we have already invoked in writing uh, on October 7th, 2022, all the proper provisions of the relevant uh, statutes with respect to testimony here today but I believe my friend's consenting that I can have that invocation marked as an exhibit. Um, if we could bring up document HRF 00001610, please. And if we can just scroll down to, I believe the third page. Oh, fourth, my apologies. And there is the invocation. And thank you, sir. Thank you. OK. I understand she's uh, uh, under subpoena. So just confirming that. OK. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Leach. Good evening. My name is John Mather. I'm commission counsel. Uh, I'm going to start with some questions about your background. Um, can you tell the commission where you were born? Uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And uh, where do you live now? Uh, Medicine Hat, Alberta. And could you tell us, in brief, just give us a summary of your employment history? I've been primarily uh, oil and gas logistics and administration. Um, and we understand, or the Commission understands, that prior to COVID-19, you were politically active. Is that a fair statement? Yes, I was. Okay. Uh, you were, among other things, a regional coordinator for Wexit in southeastern Alberta? Yes, sir. Uh, you were on the board of directors for Wexit Canada? Yes, sir. And at one point, you were vice president of communications for Wexit Canada? Yes, I was. Uh, for those who may not be f as familiar with Alberta politics, can you explain what Wexit is? Uh, Wexit started out as a, a movement, I guess, based off of the Brexit uh, movement that started in the UK. And um, we, I joined that movement. Uh, I was very concerned about the things that I was seeing happening to Western Canadians in politics and became, a, I guess, a bit of an advocate. So I, I got involved in the movement and we morphed into um, a provincial and a federal party. Um, and at one point, Wexit merged into the Wild Rose Independence Party, is that correct? It did, yes. Um, and you, at some point, left that party and then joined the Maverick Party, is that correct? Uh, how that happened was um, I was sitting on two boards when it first came out, the provincial Wexit Alberta as well as the Wexit Canada. And during COVID, my husband and I relocated to Manitoba for about 19 months during the pandemic. So I, I left that board right as that merger happened. But I stuck with the Wexit Canada board and then we renamed ourselves into the Maverick Party. So is Maverick essentially Wexit but with a new name? Basically. Yeah. Um, and when you said you had concerns about, uh, I think, West, how the West was being treated, can you expand on what those concerns were? Yes, sir. Um, at that time, we were dealing with uh, Bill C-69 and Bill C-48, um, and I was just seeing uh, friends and family that, that worked in the energy industry in Alberta suffering as a result of some of that legislation. Uh, there was job losses, and I, I just saw... 
I just saw people losing their jobs and coming into my office, you know, handing me their resume with tears in their eyes, asking for a job two weeks before Christmas. And I just felt like I needed to get involved and exercise my democratic rights. And again, for people who may not be as familiar, can you explain how those bills at least in your mind, led to the job loss you're talking about? Well, B Bill C-69 was the No More Pipelines bill, and I think you can recall at that time there was the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion and other pipelines that they had um, been discussing or proposing, uh, Energy East, for an example. And um, when all those got cancelled, a lot of people didn't have any work. What is the goal of the Maverick Party? The goal of the Maverick Party was to seek constitutional reform for better uh, equality for Western Canada uh, or to seek an independence, very much like what Quebec has um, being referred to as a nation within a nation. And what, uh, can you give any examples of the constitutional reform that the Maverick Party is seeking? I believe one of them was the um, the getting more equal seats in the House of Commons. Uh, I, I mean, a big concern for people in the West is that every election um, before the polls even close in Alberta, the uh, it's already decided. The elections are already decided. So. I think uh, myself and a lot of people in the West just felt like we didn't really have a voice uh, in the House of Commons. Does the Maverick Party consider the federal government to have too much power? I don't necessarily think so. Um, and going back to uh, the constitutional reforms that you referenced, and then I think the next thing you said was, uh, if there isn't uh, constitutional reform, then ultimately the goal of the Maverick Party is uh, independence from Canada, is that correct? Correct, yes. Um, have you ever been a trucker, Ms. Leach? Never. Um, the Commission understands that uh, in 2019, you also participated in the Yellow Vest Movement. I did. Can you explain what the Yellow Vest Movement was? Well, at that point, there had been a uh, yellow vest. I'm sorry, I don't speak French. I'm not sure of the, the, Fran the French term, but there had been similar protests in France. And the organization that I, I joined in, Medicine Hat, again, was primarily to deal with the legislation against our energy industry, which is what we were advocating for. And we had, would have rallies every Saturday from 1 to 2 in front of the Tim Hortons and stand there with flags and hold signs, that kind of thing. And so those Yellow Vest rallies were rallies in opposition to the same legislation we spoke about earlier? That's correct. And you mentioned that it was, uh, maybe is inspired the right word by the movement in France? What would be the right word? I guess inspired maybe, yeah. Uh... And did, were you aware that the movement in France uh, eventually came under some controversy for being associated with uh, Islamophobia? I was not aware of that, no. Um, and so I think you mentioned, uh, but it's the Commission's understanding that you were the organizer of the Yellow Vest rallies in Medicine Hat? I kind of moved into that role. Um, as I, like I said, I was going to the rallies and meeting people and offered to help in a, any way that I could. And it's uh, the Commission's understanding that uh, the uh, Yellow Vest in, uh, in Medicine Hat ended up changing its name, is that right? Yes, they did. And why did the Yellow Vest group in Medicine Hat change its name? Um, I read this morning an article, and I don't really remember what, what happened at that time, but I did see in the evidence that I was reviewing last night that there had been death threats against the Prime Minister. So clearly we wanted to distance ourselves from that. Right, and so if I could pull up uh, COM50908. And then if we could scroll down to the headline. Um, this is an article from January 12, 2019, and says, following death threats to Trudeau, Yellow Vest Medicine Hat looks to change their name. Is that the article you're referring to? Yes, sir. And uh, the article states that um, not on the Medicine Hat Facebook page, but on the more general Yellow, Hat, Yellow Vest Canada Facebook page, there had been death threats that had been posted about uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, is, do you recall that occurring at the time? <laughs> They, uh, I don't really recall that, but we did. I do recall that we did change our name. I'm not sure what the threats were per, per se, but we did change our name. 
And did the name change? I appreciate you might not recall the specific threats, but the name change was as a result of those. Yes, threats. yes. That's not something that I ever advocated for or anybody that I was associated with in the Medicine Hat movement. Right. And if we could go to page three of the article. It quotes uh, you, Ms. Leach, is saying, stave positive is number one. We don't want any name calling, bashing or belittlement. Respecting people's privacy is also a big one. We will not tolerate threats, hate speech, or anything like that. We don't want that kind of stigma attached to our cause. Do you see that there? Yes. And I take it that's a, a view you held at the time and Absolutely. a view you still hold, hold today? Absolutely. Right. And that's ultimately a, you had to deliver a similar message at times when it came to the protests in Ottawa. Is that true? I did, yes. Uh, the commission has heard evidence uh, on a few occasions about a convoy in 2019 called United We Rule. Um, are you familiar with that convoy? I am. Uh, did you participate in that convoy? I did not. Did you have any involvement in that convoy? I didn't have involvement in that convoy other than maybe uh, c connecting people's phone numbers or getting people connected that were going. Um, at the same time as to, uh, that United Re United Rewell was st was starting, there was a lot of, um, I guess, mini convoys, I would call them, in little communities. And so I, I was a part of our organizing the little one that went through our community. So you uh, connected people's phone numbers and then organized a, a smaller convoy within Medicine Hat? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you provide more detail about what you mean when you say you were connecting people's phone numbers? Well, just because I've moved around a lot, I know a lot of people, and uh, that would be, have been the extent of my involvement if someone was looking for a contact number, per se. Um, were you aware at the time that Pat King was involved in the United We Rule convoy? That's when I first heard of Mr. King. Okay. And how did you first hear of Mr. King? Um, he was, well, I was on social media, so of course, you know, you're scrolling and you would see video, so that's, that's how I came to know of, of him. He had a social media live stream, he was live streaming it. Um, during United We Rule, did you ever communicate with Mr. King? No, I did not. When was the first time you communicated with Mr. King? Uh, the first time I ever remember communicating with him was after we had started this convoy. So in the context of the yes. Ottawa convoy? Yes, sir. We'll get back to that in a minute. Between United We Roll and the Ottawa convoy, did you follow Mr. King on social media? I followed Mr. King until the United We Roll was over, and then I, I stopped following him at that point. Um, and when we talk about following, did you make a deliberate decision to click on follow on Facebook? I did. And why did you make that decision at that point in time? Because it was over and I really had no further reason to follow him. Did you come to form an impression of Mr. King's views in following him during United We Roll? I, I thought he was loud, um, very boisterous. Um, other than that, I didn't really know too much about him. Do you recall finding anything he said offensive in, with respect to United We Roll? I don't recall that, no. Yeah. Um, did you communicate with James Bowder at all uh, during United We Rule? I don't believe so, no. Do you remember when the first time was that you met Mr. Bowder? I would have met Mr. Bowder for the first time in person in Ottawa this past winter. Right. And then had you met him virtually before then? No. Or sorry, when we were organizing, my, my apologies. Yes, as we organized, he was in the meetings. So again, within the context of yes, January sir. 2022? Yes. Okay. So moving now to the Freedom Convoy, how did you get involved in the Freedom Convoy? Uh, a friend of mine sent me Mr. Barber's TikTok video uh, where he was calling for a shutdown on the 23rd of January. Um, <coughs> she sent me that video and I, I, I watched it and I texted her back right away and I said, well, what do you think about possibly another convoy to Ottawa? And she kind of laughed and said, well, it, you know, it didn't really accomplish much. I mean, it was great to see the crowds come together, but Could they you just Slow down oh. a bit, please, Sorry, for the yes, translators. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and, um, and then I'd reached out to another friend, and I asked him the same thing. And uh, we just sort of came to the same conclusion that we weren't sure if that was an idea that, was, that would be successful. 
uh, a friend of mine or an acquaintance of mine from Red Deer that was involved in the United We Roll gave me Mr. Barber's phone number and I contacted him on January the 13th and we discussed, I can't really remember the details of the conversation. I do remember um, that I, I said, I'm here to help you in any way I can. My background is logistics and organization and administration and you are gonna need social media and you're gonna need some funding and if I can help you at all, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, uh, a few questions arising out of that. Um, do you remember who the acquaintance was, that acquaintance was that gave you Mr. Barber's phone number? Yes, it was Glenn Carrot. Okay. Um, and did Mr. Carrot participate in the convoy, do you know? He did not. Okay. And the two friends that you uh, you indicated you had a conversation with about whether or not a convoy again was a good idea, who were they? Uh, Cindy Parker from Medicine Hat. She ended up uh, assisting on the finance committee that I was going to create, and she also assisted with the social media. Yeah. And uh, a Kevin Tichinski, he was a friend of mine that I worked with in Manitoba. And I understood from your answer, but correct me if I'm wrong, that both uh, Miss Parker and Miss, uh, Miss I'm going to mispronounce the last name, Mr. Lichinsky, was that? T Tishinsky. Tishinsky. Did they participate in United We Rule? No, not to my knowledge. <clears throat> so, why did you want to get involved in the convoy? Why did you want to reach out to Mr. Barber? I was growing increasingly alarmed with uh, the mandates and the harm that I was seeing, um, the mandates inflict on Canadians. Sorry, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> I'll try not to. Um, and I, I just felt like I needed to exercise my democratic rights. I have tried over the years emailing MPs and just never got a response. And I just felt that this was important for... Canadians who had been living under lockdowns and restrictions for two years. When you say emailing MPs, had you been emailing them about COVID-19 mandates? I believe I did once, yes. But I had e emailed previously, like I said, in conjunction with the Bill C-69 and Bill C-48 and uh, never felt like anyone was listening to me. And, and I know it wasn't me. There was other people that were emailing also. And you just get these, thanks for contacting our office, blow off emails. So you'd form this impression that you were having difficulty getting someone to listen to you in the government based on letters you sent primarily with respect to the the, the, ga the pipeline issues we've been talking about? That's correct, yes. Um, how had COVID-19 restrictions or mandates affected you personally? Well, I lost my job. Uh, my husband also lost his job on the same day. Um, my parents run a pilot truck business, and a lot of their business was uh, involved crossing the border, which they were no longer allowed to do. At the time of the convoy, there was rumblings of uh, stopping cross-border, interprovincial, sorry, uh, travel if you were unvaccinated. My parents live in Saskatchewan, my grandmother's in Saskatchewan, and I have a daughter and a granddaughter in Manitoba. So I, I found that incredibly alarming. And why did you lose your job? We were sent home, uh, I guess, in early January because of the Omicron variant. And uh, that combined, obviously, with, with the downturn in the economy at that time, they closed the shop that I was working at. And uh, the majority of us were laid off. And what shop was that? It was for an oil and gas services company. Okay. Um, were you affected at all by vaccine passports or other restrictions on unvaccinated people? We didn't go out. <laughs> you know, my husband and I played in a band. We weren't allowed to even go and, and play. Everything was shut down. Um, we just, that's part of the reason with that we went to Manitoba after, after we both lost our jobs. We went to visit my daughter and um, realized that the city that we were in was basically a ghost town and we would prefer to be out on the farm in the country uh, helping them on the farm and and being productive what did you want to achieve by participating in the freedom convoy i was hoping that somebody would come and listen to us and listen to the concerns that we had essentially about the mandates in particular did you have a goal beyond having someone come and listen to you about the mandates? 
No, we wanted to be heard. We wanted to have discussions. We wanted to end the mandates. Was your goal to have the mandates end or was a discussion enough or was that something you hadn't turned your mind to? For me, I feel if we would have just been able to have a discussion with somebody that that would have at least opened a dialogue. And, and as the convoy came across Canada, you know, Canadians were telling us, don't stop, don't stop until we're free, don't stop until the mandates are lifted. So honestly, a bit of both. The frustration that you were describing with respect to mandates, did that feel familiar to the frustration you had been feeling with respect to the pipeline and oil and gas issues? I was much more frustrated over the mandates. And why was that? <laughs> because I was seeing families torn apart. The suicides in my hometown were so numerous that they stopped reporting them. Um, elderly people were dying by themselves in long-term care facilities and saying goodbye over iPads. <laughs> my grandma is 94 years old and she was locked in her little apartment by herself for two years. And now that she can go out and do things, she's not healthy enough. She lost two years of her life. My father is, I'm so sorry. Take your time. My father is a very social man. He is the Coffee Row Saskatchewan father. And I remember him telling me one day that he went down to the local restaurant that he went to every single day and these are small towns where everybody knows everybody and he was asked to leave. And I didn't want my children and my grandchildren to live in a world like that. I was becoming increasingly alarmed listening to my prime minister call me a racist and say that I shouldn't be tolerated. I found his rhetoric to be incredibly divisive and I'm a, I'm a believer that if you are a leader of a country, you have to lead all of your people, even if you don't agree with them. And I, I just saw so much. Coming across Canada every day, I heard stories. People, at least three people, would tell me they were planning their suicides until we started the convoy. Or stories of people that we were too late. I heard from families that were living in their vehicles because they'd lost their jobs. I heard from people that had lost their jobs and lost everything. I have the tears of thousands of Canadians on my shoulder who every day told me that we were bringing them hope. I saw little old ladies praying on their knees on the side of the road and I saw little children holding signs saying, thank you for giving me back my future. Sorry. So you offered to help in reaching out to Chris Barber, and it's our understanding that one of the first things you did was create a Facebook page, is that correct? Yes, sir. And started the GoFundMe campaign, is that yes, correct? Yes, sir, I did. And you did the, both of those things on January 14th? I did, and a Twitter account also. And a Twitter account. Was that different than the Twitter account that we saw earlier today that was your personal Twitter yes, account? Yes, that was my personal one, yes. Um, with respect to GoFundMe, had you ever done fundraising before? Uh, not, in, not on that type of platform. Um, just community, you know, uh, selling chocolate-covered almonds or stuff like that. So never done an, an online, social media-driven uh, no. fundraiser? Okay. And then it's the Commission's understanding that on January 17th, 
you created or the organizers created a finance committee. Is that correct? Yes, I did. And can you explain what the finance committee's purpose was? Yes, well, when we, when I started the, the GoFundMe, I had asked, I, I think it was Mr. Barber, what should I set the target for? And he said, $200,000. And I said, no way. <laughs> I kind of laughed. I was like, that sounds greedy, and I, I don't believe that we'll ever hit that. I, and I said, well, how about I set it for $100,000? And, and I said, I feel even funny about doing that. I, I was literally expecting maybe $20,000 in donations, which I was prepared to hand. I've, I felt I would be able to handle that with my very minimal accounting skills. And um, I can't remember what the total was up to on Monday morning, but I realized that I wanted to create a finance committee um, so that Canadians that were donating this money would rest assured that we were going to be open and transparent and accountable and that they would know exactly what was happening with, with their donations. I, I just felt that was so important. And how would a committee assist with that? Well, uh, there was, uh, in, the, in the initial meeting, there was two bookkeepers that had obviously accounting experience. Cindy Parker was also on that committee. Uh, Nolene Villebren uh, joined us also. She, um, she's a clan mother, a Diné clan mother from the Northwest Territories. And we were in consultation with a, a chartered accountant in Medicine Hat. So we, we formed the committee. Obviously, we had a lot of things to figure out, such as how we were going to um, pay the costs of, of the truckers to get to Ottawa. And um, they came up with some calculations based on distance. Uh, I'm not sure if it's been entered in evidence, it might be, but um, because clearly if you're driving from Vancouver, it's gonna be you know, way more expensive than if you're coming from someplace in Ontario. Um, and we'll get into that more in a minute. Um, the Commission also understands it was around January 21st, 2022, when go the GoFundMe donations hit a uh, million dollars. Does that sound accurate? Probably. There was a lot going on then, but yeah. Yeah, in and around there? Yes. Um, what was your re reaction when that milestone was hit? I believe I, well, I was blown away. Uh, we did not see that coming, did not expect that we were going to have that level of support and um, it was funny as we were driving across Canada and the committee member or somebody would call me or text me and say, you've got to bump it up again because there was a few days there where Canadians were donating a million dollars a day. And, um, and it was ex very exciting and exhilarating, of course, but at the same time, I, I would just feel myself almost getting like more and more anxiety because... From my view, um, when you're talking that kind of money, the, the lawyers are coming, <laughs> and uh, here we are today. <laughs> <laughs> right, because that kind of money, you know, in the millions of dollars, a lot of responsibility It's comes a massive with responsibility. Um, other than set up the finance committee, uh, what else did you do to... Uh, address the responsibility that came with having millions of dollars? Well, um, as you heard from Mr. Dichter, I contacted him and um, I, I was, for the same reason that we added Chris to the accounts, I, I didn't want to be solely responsible. So um, I, I added him onto the GoFundMe campaign, um, just as I had added Chris Barber as a signatory on my accounts. Anything else? Probably. <laughs> Sorry, my mind went blank. That's okay. Um, and then on February 2nd, 2022, we understand um, that $1 million from the GoFundMe account was transferred to a TD bank account in your name. Is that accord with your recollection? Yes, sir. And then that TD bank account was frozen the next day. Is that... Does that sound right? That sounds about right, yeah. And then you, there was actually another TD bank account that got frozen, is that correct? Yes, um, we we opened another, or I opened a checking account underneath that account so that we could keep the e-transfers separate from the, the GoFundMe donations. I don't know why, I just thought it would be maybe easier that way to 
keep them distinct. I, I wasn't sure, obviously, again, what was going to happen, and I was trying to just make sure that every all the boxes were, were ticked and everything was going to be easily uh, identifiable or easy to account for, I guess, is a better way. Right, and it's the Commission's understanding that uh Donations were received both through GoFundMe and through e-transfers, and I, what I understand you'd be saying is to segregate where the money came from, you opened a second account specifically for e-transfers? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, within a few days, or uh, probably actually within a couple days of the GoFundMe campaign, we were receiving messages um, that, about people that were very hesitant to use the GoFundMe platform, and they were requesting an alternative method to donate money. So that's why we started that. How did you find out that your bank accounts had been frozen? Uh, Mr. Chatiros and I had gone down to the bank. Uh, to, the, the lawyers had flown in, and we were going to cover the cost of that flight. And so we went down to the TD Bank here in Ottawa, and we were going to wire that company. And that's when uh, we were told, no, there's a hold on your account. Uh, the lady was excellent. She said she gave me a note and said there is a Mr. Jay Stein that has left his name on here. If you could contact him, um, and then she indicated that he was working with the fraud department. If we could pull up com.or705 and Miss Leachwell comes up. This is uh, the overview report that was presented this morning with respect to crowdfunding and. Um, and if we could go to uh, paragraph 87, which is on page 33. So uh, here, Ms. Leach, it uh, des describes that on February 5th, 2022, you attempted to make a wire transfer to Northern Air Charter PR Inc. from an, uh, from an Ottawa TD branch. This transaction was denied. Is this what you were referring to just previously? Yes. Um, and that was the flight, I, I think you said, that had brought uh, Mr. Wilson and your husband and others to Ottawa? That's correct, sir. Um, who approved the using of the funds for that purpose? Oh, boy. Um, I'm not sure if at that time we had already had the board um, created or not. And the board, are you so, referring to the board of the directors for the not-for-profit corporation? Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that was, if that was created yet. Um, I, I, I don't really remember, honestly. I, I think it was maybe with me and Chad and, and Mr. Barber. Did you, did you consult with the finance committee before attempting to use the money for that purpose? I don't believe I did. Do you know I why you... Sorry. That's okay. Do you know why you didn't consult with the finance committee? Um, other than it was very busy and crazy uh, times, it was, it was kind of chaotic at that point. So um, we recognized that we needed to have legal counsel um, and legal advice here on the ground. So I guess we felt it was just urgent and, and so that's why. Um, if we could, uh, we can take that down. Um, in that same report, I won't turn it up, but... Uh, it indicates that uh, most of the $1 million was, was frozen and you weren't able to withdraw it from the account. Is that correct? That's correct. Do you recall how much you were able to withdraw? Uh, I believe it was $26,000. So $10,000 of that, uh, if you would like me to break it down for you. Uh, you're, uh, you're anticipating my question, so yes, please go ahead. Uh, $10,000 of that was wired to a bulk fuel supplier. Uh, $3,000 was e-transferred to another fuel provider. Uh, Chris and I had gone down, sorry, Mr. Barber and I had gone down to the TD and we uh, withdrew 3000 in cash from one account and 10000 in cash from, uh, um, or sorry, one branch and then went to the next branch. And then, um, and I remember being very nervous about it because I was very conscious that we needed receipts and we needed to be accountable and... Uh, um, and, and they were the, the road captains that went out and bought whatever supplies, fuel, uh, they, I believe some of that went to fuel. Um, and they were, when they brought the receipts back, there was actually extra money uh, in, the, in the kitty, so. Right. 
So uh, when you're talking about the road captains, are you talking about the $13,000 that wasn't for the t first two bulk fuel purchases you That's you correct, had? yes. And uh, am I understanding you correctly that that money was distributed to the road captains? Uh, I believe so. I, uh, um, I, I didn't keep it. I, I had 10 million problems of my own, so I, wasn't where I didn't want to be handling any of the cash. So um, I, I, can't, I think I gave it to Chris, and then Chris distributed it to the road captains from there to provide fuel. And the $10,000 that was used for the one bulk fuel purchase, do you recall where you purchased the fuel from? I believe it was a company called fillerup.ca. And there was also a $3,000 fuel purchase, do you recall? Yeah, that went to uh, Adam something who was with the Quebec, uh, the, the Quebec part of the convoy. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his last name. That's, that's okay. Um, mm. After the fuel was purchased, did, how was it distributed? The fuel? Yes. That I left up to the professionals. Did you, through dealing with the professionals, did you have come to have any understanding of how they distributed the fuel? I'm assuming with a fuel bulker of some sort, or I, I honestly don't know. And when you're talking about the professionals, who are you referring to? The truck drivers. Okay. Was there anyone in particular, or any people in particular, who were responsible for... Uh, overseeing the logistics of distributing fuel? Uh, we did have a few volunteers that came on board. Um, there was a gentleman that was there for the first, I think he was there for the first week who looked after that. Um, and then he had to leave and another gentleman stepped in and took it over, who was from Alberta, Calgary, I believe. And then um, another gentleman from Ontario that, that assisted. And who were those gentlemen? Uh, the first one, I believe, was Joey Mitsu, M-I-Z-U. Uh, Tihon, I'm sorry, I don't know his last name. He was from Calgary. And then John Skubik, who was from Ontario. What happened to the receipts that the captains returned? I have them in an envelope in my, in my room. I, uh, they were um, scanned and sent, uh, I believe, Eva Chipiuk had scanned them. And there was... One of the road captain's uncle was here, so he created a spreadsheet so that we could keep track of all of them also. If we could go to GFM 156. <clears throat> so this is a GoFundMe uh, attestation letter. Are you familiar with this document? Yes. Uh, can you describe uh, what this document is and uh, what its purpose was? I don't really remember the details. Is it okay if I read it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it looks to me they just uh, wanted confirmation on how the, where the funds were going and how they would be distributed. Right, and, and, and the clerk has scrolled down now, and what I, what I want to ask you about is, um, it says, with the oversight of the Finance Committee, I will execute the following plan to meet the stated purpose of the fundraiser and distribute the funds raised and released to me, and then it sets out a process. Do you see that there? I do, sir. Do you recall making this form of commitment to GoFundMe? I do, yep. And it's our understanding that GoFundMe sought this sort of commitment as part of the ongoing discussion about whether or not it would release the funds. Is that correct? Yes, I, I believe they were trying to do their due diligence. Okay. Um, and you see here it sets out a process. Funds will be distributed via e-transfer directly from the TD Unlimited checking account, established in my name to individual convoy participants. Participants must submit their own convoy registration forms, fuel receipts, and verification for their participation from the road captain to that. Participant registration is verified by the respective road captains upon uh, demonstration of completion, receipts, and confirmation of the journey to Ottawa. And reimbursement amounts will be calculated at an estimated rate of 62 cents per kilometer driven. Do you see that? I do, sir. So this... This attestation, it appears, was contemplating how people would be reimbursed on their way to Ottawa. Is that right? Yes. Was any similar plan made for uh, disbursements once the convoy was in Ottawa? 
Well, um, I guess what, what the finance committee we decided to do was obviously come up with registration forms because we felt that that was um, really important and a code of conduct also. And that is based off of the um, calculations that the finance committee had come up with to, to pay them for. So uh, when it was not anticipated how large this was going to grow, um, I thought e-transfers would be very a very easy way to disperse the money, and that's what the registration was for, so that we would have their contact information and their email addresses in order to make that happen. So my question was with respect to distribution once you were in Ottawa. Was the plan to use the registration forms once money was distributed in Ottawa as well? It was. That was, that was the plan. Did you follow that plan? Well, we didn't need to because the funds were, were frozen and... What about for the $26,000? I'm sorry? What about for the $26,000? Oh, that was from the e-transfer money, okay. not the GoFundMe money. So the GoFundMe money, you had a distribution plan, um, but for the e-transfer money, you did not? That's correct. Okay. Did you consider having a distribution plan for the e-transfer money? At that point, um, I had handed over everything to the finance committee because once Mr. Barber and I got on the road, I, w I was quite busy doing other things. Um, so my communications with them were quite quick um, and, and I trusted them. They, I, I trusted that they knew what they were doing and, uh, and yeah. And while you may have turned things over to the finance committee, it's uh, the commission's understanding again from testimony and documents that we've read that um, you, you became the person associated with the GoFundMe campaign and the person associated with the, the 10 plus million dollars. Is that, was that your experience? Yes. What impact did that have on you? Well, it, it was incredibly, again, uh, it was an incredible responsibility. And again, my, uh, I, I was, wanted to always be as open and transparent about it as possible, which is why I started doing the lives so that I could let people know, you know, what was happening. The, the finance committee has been formulated and try and do little updates on, on what we were achieving at that point. Did you get a lot of questions about the money and what you were planning to do with it? Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, everybody wanted to know about the money. Did uh, you get a lot of people approaching you and asking you if they could have some of the money? I did, yes. Okay. Um, and Mr. Eros, who we've spoken about, uh, had an interview with the commission, and he said that at some point after February 1st, he spoke with you on the phone, and you told him that you were feeling overwhelmed because a lot of people were circling you and asking for money, and he said that you called them vultures in a text message. Yeah, that's that's how I, I didn't mean they were vultures. I just felt like the, the vultures are circling. How did you handle having all these people circling around you and seeking money? The best I could. I, I had created a finance committee to ensure that um, the money that was donated was protected and that I was protected. And we had, I, I just wanted... Um, I don't know. I, I just put one foot in front of the other and I would just explain that I was not in a position, like this was not my money to give out mm -hmm. and that we needed to, the, the money was primarily, like it said in the GoFundMe campaign, primarily for the, tr for, for the it was for the truckers for feud, uh, sorry, fuel, fuel, food and lodgings if needed. And so um, I couldn't buy hot dogs. I didn't feel like buying a, a sound system for $150,000 was appropriate when I couldn't get money out to give to the, to the, to the truck drivers. Um, so I had a lot of people coming at me and um, my hands were tied. At one point I had somebody threatening that they were going to get a lawyer to come after me for the money, which was kind of ridiculous because that was really at that point just going to tie it up even longer, you know. I'm going to now ask you some questions about the organization of the, of the, the Freedom Convoy. Um, first question for you is, at the time, did you see yourself as one of the founders of the convoy? A supporter. Who did you see as the founders? Uh, Mr. Barber and Miss Belton. 
Did you view Mr. King or Mr. Bowder as founders of the convoy? I did not. When you joined, were you aware that they had been assisting in planning and promotion of the convoy? I found out, uh, and I can't recall if it was in my initial discussion with Mr. Barber or the next day. It would have been either the 13th or the 14th that I found out that they were involved, but I don't remember exactly which date. I appreciate that uh, you saw yourself as a supporter and you're not one of the founders. Did you come to see yourself as one of the leaders of the convoy? I came to see myself as part of a team. And uh, maybe it was because of the GoFundMe that my name was on, or maybe it was because of the live videos that I was doing. I was, I was, I felt I was perceived as that, but I, I, all I wanted to do was help. Did you see yourself as have a, having any say greater than anyone else on the team? I did not. And who did you see as a member, the members of that team? Obviously, uh, Miss Belton and Mr. Barber. Uh, the road captains, Joe Jansen, Miranda Gassier, Ryan Mihilowitz, um, uh, Dale Enns, Sean Thiessen. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. <laughs> so when Mr. Wilson described you as an organic leader, do you agree with that statement? I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's what I alluded to with my previous answer. Right. And what I understood from your previous answer is that you were seen as the leader, but you yourself didn't feel that you were the, the leader. Absolutely not. <clears throat> Chris Barber in his testimony discussed that there was power struggles among the organizers. Was that something you observed as well? It was, and I, and I think when you have anything, any type of organization, there's always power struggles involved, and, uh, and, and ours was no different. What power struggles did you observe? Um, I saw what I perceived was, you know, uh, people, organizations coming in, perhaps trying to, to um, take over, or I hate to use the word take over, but... I believe that they were all there for, with, with the same goals that we had. It's just that maybe some had different agendas or, or um, were looking to possibly promote their own brand. Uh, there, was, there was obviously, I had a lot of people coming up to me as we were just talking about, you know, telling me what I needed to do with the money, should do with the money, could be doing with the money, what I had to, had to do and, and um, it was, it was very overwhelming. What were some of the people or groups that were doing that? Um, the first one that I was concerned about was an organization called Taking Back Our Freedoms. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt, again, that they were there with the right end goal in, in mind. I remember they showed up with bags of swag. Um, all of a sudden, I was getting pulled into meetings with, um, I believe it was Give, Send, Go, because uh, we were looking at, there had been obviously problems starting with GoFundMe and we weren't sure what was gonna happen. And so I, I honestly don't, I, I remember being, in meetings and conference calls, and I really didn't even know what was going on. Um, and I had a discussion with Mr. Eros after one of those, and he was concerned. When you talk about bags of swag, um, and that was the, 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 are you, was, is that a case where you were concerned that, well, they, the group might have had the same goals, they were seeking a promotional opportunity? Is that what you're referring to? Essentially. Um, did you have concerns that there were other groups or individuals who were seeking to use the, uh, uh, the, the mass media coverage the, and the $10 million as a way to promote themselves instead of focus on the cause? Not that I can think of off, offhand now. Did you ever turn 
your mind to whether or not this was acting as a promotional opportunity for yourself? Absolutely not. I, I never in a million years saw this coming. Uh, I never had an agenda. I literally just wanted to help some truckers drive across Canada and stand in front of Parliament with some signs. <laughs> that was literally what I had envisioned. Um, so the Commission understands that uh, you participated in a press conference on February 3rd, 2022. Uh, Mr. Wilson also attended. Do you know which conference I'm referring to? I do. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, that conference in a second. But first, I just want to understand when you first met Mr. Wilson. Uh, they flew in on the evening of the 2nd of February, I believe. And uh, it, was, it was quite late at night when they arrived. Um, they came to, I, I think I was still at the Ark Hotel at that point. And they came up and... Uh, introduced themselves. There was five five lawyers, I believe, that showed up, and that's when I first first met them. Um, and how did it come about that the convoy was looking for a lawyer? Well, I know that there was a doctor that was um, in Ottawa with us that that was quite concerned, I believe, about what he he was seeing from these organizations that were coming in, and. I, if I remember correctly, he's the one that set up a call with the JCCF. Oh, sorry, who was that doctor? Uh, Dr. Francis Christian. Okay. And was it your understanding at the time that it was the JCCF that had arranged for Mr. Wilson and others to come and assist the convoy? Yes, yes. And what was your understanding of what the JCCF was? I, I had heard of them before. Um, never imagined I'd ever need to use them um, about the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedom. So I, I, at that point, I, I just understood them to be a charitable organization that assisted with uh, legal cases, uh, helping to fund defendants in legal cases such as this. Had you met Mr. Wilson prior to February 2nd? No. So can you please explain to the commission how it came to pass that you met Mr. Wilson for the first time on February 2nd and then on February 3rd were at a news conference with him? Yes, I can. Um, again, there was a lot of pressure that was happening at this time. Um, it was, it was Mr. Marazzo and I, I think within the first day or so, I, I think he saw me running around and people pulling me in all sorts of directions. And he took me into a room and we sat down and in his very calm voice, he told me, you know, you need to take a day off. You need to just take a day and, and not do anything and just relax. So I decided, I think, so I thought, okay, well, maybe Thursday I'll just try and sneak away and have a nap or, you know, um, just get, relax for a little bit. And um, so I, I agreed to it. I was like, okay, I, I'll try. And then we had a meeting, I think it was Tuesday evening. It was actually probably Tuesday that day that we had that talk. We had a, we had a meeting Tuesday evening, which would be the night before they arrived. And uh, one of the gentlemen from taking back our freedoms, told me I was to be at the Marriott Hotel for a press conference the next day at 1 o'clock. So and that, was that on the first going to the second or the second going? Uh, I believe that was the first going into the second. Okay, sorry. Sorry. I yeah. um, and I said, no, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I, I'm, I'm going to get some rest. And, and they were quite alarmed that I, was, that I was turning them down. I have no media experience. I, I felt... And I'm not saying that this is what they were doing, but I felt at that point like I was literally being thrown to the wolves. They were going to take me to the Marriott, give me 10 minutes of media training, and then put me in front of the mainstream media. Like, I grew up in Saskatchewan. <laughs> this is not my world, you know? And so I was... Of, of course, I had a lot of anxiety, and it was a big responsibility for us here. You know, we... And to... to I was really concerned about being put in that situation terribly unprepared. So that was the first? Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I'm not having an answered your question. Oh, so, no, no, no. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. If you're... Yeah, I, I forgot. We, I still hadn't answered it. So uh, Mr. Wilson and the team came in on Tuesday night. Uh, we met with them. Um, he explained to me his reasons for being there, which was out of concern for his children also. Uh, 
and I immediately liked him and, and his team. I told them about this press conference, uh, probably begged him to help me because he's had experience with this. Um, as someone who is a very trusting person, I was rapidly becoming aware that I needed to be careful who I trusted, if that makes sense. And so I trusted Keith and his team immediately. And he agreed to help me. And it was, it was crazy. It was a crazy day. We, we, uh, I can't remember uh, if he drafted, drafted the statement I made or perhaps the, 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 the media committee had, our communications committee had something to do with that. Um, anyways, uh, he agreed to, to help me and, and uh, they were like knights in shining armor, in my opinion. So I'm... So, um, you said in that answer that you, maybe, maybe I'll back up. So February 1st, um, I took it from your answer. It's fair to say you were already feeling overwhelmed by everything that was going yes, on. Yes, definitely. And, Before I left Medicine Hat, I was feeling overwhelmed. <laughs> um, and now you were being asked to do a press conference, um, which you were not feeling prepared to undertake. Is that fair? That's fair. And you said in your answer that you also were getting the sense you needed to be careful who you trusted. Yes. Um, because as these groups would come in, I did trust them. I, I like, if you wanted to help, we need your help. You are welcome here. Um, and in that instance, um, if I may back up just a bit. So as we were organizing before we even left. Um, obviously, the finance committee was one thing I recognized needed to be created instantaneously or right away. Uh, our, our Facebook page was being inundated with messages that I was unable to keep up with. So I created, uh, I found volunteers and created a social media committee to have that or to look after that. Um, I, I then realized that we needed, I guess, a, a media team or or. Uh, like a, yeah, I guess a media team would be the best thing. So there was a little committee uh, made with that, which uh, you heard Mr. Dichter allude to today that he was a part of. Um, and I forget where I was going. <laughs> Could you ask me your question again, please? My question was really, you said you, in, in the February 1st to second period, you began sensing you need to be careful who you trust. Oh, yes. And I wanted to understand what had caused you to have that Healing. Yes. Um, I just can't remember what my point was with the committees. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, I felt at that point like everyone kind of, not everyone, I felt that some people didn't see me. They, they just saw $10 million over my head. And of course, as they would come in and these organizations would come in and there were many, many wonderful organizations and obviously we were very grateful for their help. But again, in that case, I was feeling as the days went on, um, I was getting more and more uncomfortable with them coming in and, and um, taking over the meetings that we were like our briefing meetings. I got... I actually left the Ark Hotel because all of a sudden they were in the room next to me on the seventh floor, which I thought was really odd. And one of the road captains made mention to me that we had a coffee in my room one morning. I rode the road captains and myself. And um, they mentioned that when they left, people, like they were opening and closing their door to see who was leaving my room. I don't mean to interrupt you, but can you explain who the they is in this situation? I'm not sure who the room was, who it belonged to, but uh, uh, Mr. Byer and Mr. Peloso um, and their team were in that room. And this, they were with the Taking Back Our Freedoms group? Yes. Was there any other groups causing you this sort of concern? Not that I can recall. And so what was different about Mr. Wilson and the people he was with? 
what you mean, why did I trust them? <laughs> it's another way of putting it, yeah. Um, um, I felt that they were genuine. Um, as I said, when Mr. Wilson was explaining to me his reasons, uh, he was a lawyer, obviously. He was sent there to help us, but he, he was also had concerns, and uh, he was concerned for the future of his children, too. And, uh, and I, I guess I just had to, I had to trust them, and uh, he n gave me no reason not to. And then at the next day, you did appear at the news conference with Mr. Wilson, is that correct? That's correct, sir. All right. And at that press conference, uh, Mr. Wilson described you as the spark that lit the fire. Do you recall that? I do. Do you agree with Mr. Wilson? Were you the spark that lit the fire? As I said, I never saw myself in that light, and I still don't. I feel like I was part of just an amazing team. Appreciate I would not describe myself as the spark that lit the fire. Appreciating everything you've said about Mr. Wilson, and, and I've heard you, did it concern you that Mr. Wilson opened the press conference by placing you in the spotlight like that? I, I didn't really think about it, to be honest. Um, now I want to ask you some questions about sort of your day-to-day -day life in Ottawa when you were uh, uh, participating in the convoy. And we've heard the evidence, and I've already heard you say we understand that it was a busy time, there was a lot going on. But can you give the commission a sense of what you were doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, well, when I first arrived there, I was in and out of a lot of meetings. <laughs> it, it is honestly a blur. I, we had kind of a joke there that one day felt like a week. Um, there was so much going on. But we would have uh, briefing meetings in the morning um, to, to lay out the, to lay out, you know, kind of what we anticipated for the day. Um, as I said, when we, when we first saw this taking off, our number one priority became safety. Safety for the drivers, safety for the partic participants, safety for the public. So um, we had a lot of briefings on on making sure that, you know, talking about <coughs> things like keeping the emergency lanes open. Um, I remember, if, well, if I remember correctly, I believe the first weekend we got there, we had some problems with, I heard, Antifa that were spray painting vehicles and breaking windows and putting nails under uh, tires. And so um, th they created block captains that could monitor throughout the evening um, to ensure that people were, were going to be safe from, I, I guess, anti-protesters or whatever they are. So you, you attended the meetings. What else did you do? Uh, lots of meetings in the beginning. I was uh, at the Swiss Hotel. <laughs> it was so many meetings at the beginning, honestly. Um, I tried to get out to see, to talk to people. Um, uh, the first Sunday we were there, uh, there was a church service that we attended, and I spoke at with the clan mothers and Mr. Dichter. And the, the, the commission's heard evidence, uh, for, you know, from instance, Mr. Marazzo, who described himself as responsible for logistics. Uh, Mr. Barber, who uh, sound, sounds like he spent a lot of time interacting with truck drivers and, and speaking with them. Um, Mr. Dichter today talked about uh, how he was responsible for uh, public relations and messaging. Um, we anticipate that Mr. Bulford's going to testify tomorrow and that he was responsible for uh, security and other things. Um, with all of that covered, did you have a specific responsibility? Mother hen? <laughs> no. Uh, I guess when I first got there, there was lots of obviously meetings to do with the finances and stuff like that. And as I said, they, they were, um, we ended up setting up a give, send, go. So there was conference calls and stuff like that. The details, I couldn't tell you, but um, uh, I got out to speak to the crowd and wanted to go see the people, and I went to um, uh, 88 or the uh, um, Embram, I believe it was called. Um, saw and went to the truckers that were down on Parkway. So I spent some of my time just walking around in, in the crowd and talking to people. And and it fair to say that once the money was frozen in terms of managing the finances, that was something that was mostly off the table. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you about uh, some of the people we've already discussed about and some of the people we've heard in the evidence. Um, uh, you've already talked about uh, Mr. Eros, um, who we understand was the accountant for uh, the non-for-profit corporation. Is that correct? That's correct. How would you describe your relationship with Mr. Eros when he was in Ottawa? 
He was a godsend. Um, I will be forever grateful. Um, that man dropped everything to come to Ottawa to help us with the accounting portion and go fund me and work with the legal team. And um, I, I thought he was great. He, he uh, I have very basic accounting skills. And so to have him come in was a huge load off my shoulders. He could understand what <laughs> they were talking about. He knew the big words, right? Um, and, and I was extremely grateful. We had a great relationship while he was here, yeah. Um, and another name the Commission's heard about is Joseph Bourgo. Yes. Um, did you know Mr. Bourgo prior to the convoy? I did not know. Did you know of him prior to the convoy? I did not. When did you first meet Mr. Bourgo? Uh, I believe we had stopped in, I want to say, we had a stop along the way, maybe Sault Ste. Marie? I can't remember. Anyways, um, we had a little pit stop, and um, I believe it was Mr. Barber who introduced me to him. And when Mr. Barber introduced you to him, was it your understanding that Mr. Barber and Mr. Brugot knew each other? I, I'm not sure if they knew each other or if he knew of him. I, don't, I, I can't say. Fair enough. What did you come to learn about Mr. Brugot after meeting him? He's a very good man. He... He was there also to exercise his democratic rights and express his concern for what he believed was um, was happening in our country also. Just a patriotic, good Christian man. Did you learn anything about his background? I knew he had a business in Saskatchewan, a, a successful um, farm implement business in Saskatchewan. Um, what, what contribution did Mr. Bougot make to the Freedom Convoy? Well, um, as uh, I believe he paid for a lot of hotel rooms. Um, he covered, I believe, at least uh, rent the rental of one of the conference rooms or maybe a couple of conference rooms there. Um, obviously, when, we, um, when the lawyers flew in, my husband was on that flight, and I was quite concerned because I didn't want the, the nothing. I mean, when, when I started GoFundMe, my savings account was $1.13 overdrawn, so I made sure I put the $1.13 into it, right, so that I never wanted any questions asked. And so um, Mr. Begaud actually took my husband and I into his room one day and offered to pay for the, what would have been, I guess, Dwayne's portion of that flight. Did he do that? Uh, in the end, no, because I believe after I was released from prison, I was told that Adopt-A-Trucker covered that flight. Um, in his interview with the commission, Mr. Eros said that at some point a Ryan Olson asked you for $100,000 to mis reimburse Mr. Bugo for the hotel rooms he had paid for. Do you recall that occurring? I don't recall that occurring, no. Um, the next person I want to ask you about is Mr. Bowder, who testified before you. Yes. Did you know about Mr. Bowder prior to the Freedom Convoy 2022? I knew of him. Um, I, uh, I think maybe he was live streaming during the United We Roll Convoy too, or maybe uh, that he was participating or involved somehow. Um, so I, I knew of him. I did not know him. What did you know about him? Really nothing other than he was, he was a participant in that convoy right, at that point. I, I think he maybe had a, a podcast or, or not a podcast, but a live stream Facebook show did you ever watch that? Um, briefly. I might have watched a few clips as I was scrolling through Facebook, but I didn't follow him. Do you have any memory of what he was uh, streaming about when you did watch? I uh, not really, no. Um, when did you learn that Mr. Bowder was involved in the convoy? Uh, uh, like I said, when I spoke with Chris, I, I can't be sure if it was the 13th or the 14th. Right. But their, their names had both come up. I wasn't in... I talked to Mr. Barber on the 13th, and then I believe they had a meeting that evening over Zoom. And so it, 13th to the 14th. Um, at any point in time, did you become aware of the Memorandum of Understanding? I did. I, I, I think it was quite a few days after that. And I, I do recall hearing about it. I've never read it. I really didn't pay any attention to it, to tell you the truth. Uh, do you recall what you were told about the Memorandum of Understanding? 
Just that there was a memorandum of understanding. Were you given was... any indication about what was in it? <coughs> no. Mr. Wilson has testified and in his interview summary stated that members of the board had come to him at some point in time and asked him about the memorandum and whether or not uh, it was, for lack of a better word, legitimate. Were you part of that conversation? Maybe. I, I, I honestly don't recall that. Did you interact with Mr. Uh, Bowder at all while you were in Ottawa? I ran into him. I, I didn't really see him that much once we got to Ottawa. Um, so I, I think I ran into him maybe a handful of times. And if we spoke, I, I believe it was just kind of a greeting and small talk. I, I really didn't have anything to do with him. Um, and we heard testimony today also from uh, Benjamin Dichter. Um, he testified that uh, you, you two met sometime in 2017 to, uh, or 2018. Is that accurate? I thought it was 2019, but it could have been 2018. It's, poss it's possible. <laughs> um, and then he testified that whenever you first met, that you stayed in somewhat regular contact after that. Is yes, that we correct? did, yeah. Yeah. Um, how would you describe uh, the relationship between you and Mr. Dichter before uh, the convoy? I consider him a friend. Do you still consider him a friend? I'm not allowed to speak to him anymore. Um, was Mr. Dichter testified that you asked him to take on a public relations role and messaging role, was that correct? I did, yes. And um, as part of that, did you give Mr. Dichter permission to post on your Twitter account? I absolutely did. I asked him to help me with my Twitter account, actually. <laughs> um, and why did you ask him to help with your Twitter account? Because I was getting very, very busy. I was getting messages about the convoy, and I had my hands full with um, trying to, to work, focus on the Facebook page and help the social media committee, as well as um, preparing for, for our departure to Ottawa. So I, I just asked. I, I felt like he was excellent on Twitter. Um, and I felt that he could that he could uh, help me with that. Just to just to kind of I guess keep getting the message out or the progress. Um, and uh, the next person I want to ask you about is Mr. King. Um, if I understand correctly, you became aware of Mr. King during the United We Rule because uh, you would see him posting and, and then you stopped following him at the end of that. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, and I apologize if I did ask you this, but had you met Mr. King prior to the Freedom Convoy? No. When did you first meet Mr. King? I was thinking about this last night. I, I must have met him while well, we were on our way to Ottawa, but um, the first time I remember now meeting him uh, was in Winnipeg when uh, we were discussing... Uh, Benjamin's concerns with the video that he'd, he'd seen that morning about bullets flying. Um, I, I'm sure I met him along the way before then, but I, I honestly don't recall. But that was definitely, uh, I remember that conversation, or being on the side of the road. Okay. And, we, and again, I think we'll get to that in a minute. Um, what would you understand Mr. King's role to be in the convoy prior to that conversation? Uh, I believe he was helping with some logistics. He was, uh, I, I think because of his previous experience with United Reroll, he had a pretty good idea as to the routes that they would be taking. Um, so fuel, l l helping um, to try and find fuel, that type of thing. If we could pull up COM 50902. While this is coming up, Ms. Leach, this is a news article that's reporting on text messages between you and Mr. Barber. Oh, yes. Um, it was referenced during Mr. Barber's testimony. Yes. Um, and while, before we get to my questions, um, we have been advised by your counsel that you no longer have access to your text messages. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, what happened to them? Well, that, well, I was in jail for 19 days, and of course my phone was inundated with messages, and apparently I found out after the fact there's a setting that you can have on your iPhone where you can have them delete automatically delete after 30 days, uh, and it was set to that. So we go to page three of this article. Um, so... Uh, 
It, do you see where it says on January 22nd? Do you see there? I do, sir. Okay, so it says uh, on January 22nd, Leach told Barber that they needed to have they need they need to have a very frank discussion with King, raising concerns about past allegations against him. Do you see that? I do. Do you recall what the concerns were at this point in time? Well, up until then, I mean, I've, I've obviously followed Pat uh, through the United We Roll convoy, and um, so, uh, but I, I knew him by reputation, also. And um, Pat has a Mr. King. Sorry, has a lot of people that like him and a lot of people that don't like he's a very controversial figure so i was getting messages and phone calls from a lot of people that were concerned that he was involved um I, this frank discussion i believe um came about because somebody had contacted me and mentioned that uh, mr king had um lied about being a, a veteran and which is a very serious allegation. And I just felt like we needed to have a discussion with him and, you know, a frank discussion and, and I guess find out the details. And what was your concern at that point? Well, uh, there was people that, that were not joining the convoy because they were concerned about him. And again, I, because of his reputation, um, I know he's said a lot of inflammatory things, which I was concerned about. Um, and, I, and I was concerned that that would have an impact on, on what we were trying to achieve. It would take away the focus from what it was we were trying to achieve. So at this point in time, January 22nd, you were aware of Mr. King's reputation for yes. saying inflammatory things? Yes. Controversial things? Yes, sir. Uh, things that people may find racist? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, had you ever been offended by anything that Mr. King had said? I'm not the type that gets easily offended, sir. But you recognize that some people would take offense and that that could have an effect on the image of the convoy? Yes. And I thought I heard you say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you were actually receiving messages from people who uh, were expressing a reluctance to participate because of Mr. King's involvement. Is that, did That's I hear that correctly? That's correct, yeah. Do you have a sense of how many messages you received along those lines? Oh, geez. Uh, I had a conversation with my MP about his involvement. I remember that. He was concerned about it. Um... um Cindy Parker had concerns about, about him also that she'd raised right away. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know how many messages or... There was concerns, but there was also people that were there because Pat was involved too. Like I said, he did have his, his followers also, right? Right, and if, and if we continue to look at the story, it goes on to say that despite the concerns we've just talked about, you said that he was needed by the movement, um, uh, and then it makes a commentary about later comments, and then it quotes you, uh, later statements, sorry, and then it quotes you as saying, we need him, and I don't care about his past, but it only takes one. Uh, we have to control his rhetoric, not even threatening to throw snowballs at Parliament. When you said we need him, was that what you were referring to, that he had a lot of followers? Or was there something else? Uh, that was in reference to conversations that we'd had with the road captains. And um, some of them, th you know, he, he, he had been involved from the start and had, you know, made, uh, I, I think he looked after uh, the accommodations or something in Sault Ste. Marie because he's from that area. So, um, yeah, so that wasn't necessarily me saying I felt like he was needed, that I was, I was kind of referencing the, the conversations in general that we were having and, that, and some of them felt that they were concerned um, that, that if he left, that the people that, that supported him would, would leave. Um, my, my reference to I don't care about his past is that I'm, I had to believe that everybody that was involved was getting involved for the right reasons. And um, as I said, when I spoke with Mr. Barber, 
that f- and I found out that they were involved, I was aware of his reputation and um, I just felt that I didn't want to start this off um, criticizing other people. Again, because I, I just felt like I had to believe that people that were joining this movement were joining it with the best of intentions, regardless of, of their past. At this point in time, did you think Mr. King was participating for the right reasons? I believe he is a passionate Canadian. So is that a yes? Yes. Um, it says here that uh, we, uh, we have to control his rhetoric. At that point in time, did you think you, had, you stood a, ch- a shot at uh, controlling Mr. King's rhetoric? Uh, well, he's kind of a beast, and he very much speaks his mind. Um, um, I, again, was just concerned with, you know, to be frank, he was a bit of a hothead in my opinion. And I was just concerned that he would say things or um, say controversial things or inflammatory things. And so that's why I added in the, like, we can't even be threatening to throw snowballs at Parliament because that's not what we're here for, right? So... If we can pull up, uh, actually, before I do that, so we understand um, that at a certain point you had a conversation with Mr. King and that you asked him to not come to Ottawa. That's you, correct. And it's our understanding that happened around January 28th. Does that sound correct? It was in Sudbury. Okay. And describe that conversation to the commission. Uh, well, we pulled into Sudbury. Um, I believe it was by accident. I think we took a wrong turn. So we ended up in, in this yard somewhere and we stopped and had a break. And my recollection was uh, Mr. Bar- uh, Mr. King came over to the truck and he said to me, uh, I can't go into Ottawa. I'm getting death threats. And I said, good, Pat, you shouldn't come into Ottawa. And, and he made a comment or said something, well, I organized this whole thing. And I said, no, you didn't. We all did. This was basically, I'm paraphrasing, this was a team effort. Um, We all had a part in this. And again, he said something about not going to, or he organized the whole thing. And I said, "Um, no, you didn't. This movement is not about you. This movement is not about me. Uh, You need to check your ego. And if you care about this movement, you will not go to Ottawa. And uh, in his testimony yesterday, Mr. King denied that uh, you had said you need to check your ego and not come to Ottawa. Did you hear that? I did hear that. What was your reaction to that? I, maybe he just doesn't recall it. So ultimately, as we know, Mr. King didn't take your direction. He did come to Ottawa, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And. Uh, how did you feel when you learned that he was still coming? I had other things to focus on, and so uh, when once we got it, once we got to Ottawa, um, I, I think I saw him four or five times, maybe. Um, I believe I'd been there for at least a week. Again, it, a lot of stuff happened in three weeks. Um, um, and the first time I ran into him was down at Parkway one night and I was just leaving. And uh, so I didn't have a lot of interactions with him when we were there. To your knowledge, prior to February 14th, and we'll get to that later, but prior to February 14th, did Pat K- King do or say anything that caused you concern while he was in Ottawa? I heard a lot of rumors, um, but I heard a lot of rumors. <laughs> so... Uh, Again, I, I had other things to worry about. Uh, I let I let the, the truckers or the road captains kind of handle that that's that aspect. Um, if we could pull up uh, HRF four zeros one three four six and then go to page fifty one, I believe. And again, just to give you some context while we wait, um, I expect the document we will see is a code of conduct for truckers, um, and I'll have some questions for you about that. Sure. Yeah. Maybe I'll take a short break at this point, just five minutes. 
uh, to stretch our legs, and uh, we'll come back in five minutes. The commission is in recess for five minutes. So, la commission est levée pour quinze cinq minutes. Freedom in 2022 is certainly about being able to make free choices for ourselves and for our family, who we believe are the best. We have seen so much suffering over the last two years. People who die alone in terrible condition, people losing dream jobs, polarized families, and a society that insult and yell at each other for making a different medical choice. But people have risen and it will be through them that the future will have an important meaning for all of you, but especially for the next generation. Ribbon News has been present at every step of this great challenge, but so many other pioneers whom you could meet and hear at our great conference about freedom for our beautiful country, which is Canada. This conference, which will be held in Calgary and Toronto, will show you the faces of the influence of freedom that you have seen over the past two years. You don't want to miss this. So get your ticket now at ribbonnewslive.com. And it will be a pleasure to see you there and meet you in large numbers. It's time to drop these masks and let the truth shine. Everyone, good evening, everyone. Good uh, afternoon. I am joined here by Celine Gallas, a Rebel News reporter from Alberta. Celine, how are you doing? I'm doing really fantastic. I left this morning in a blizzard and I came to Ottawa and it's like plus 15 degrees. So that's great. It's one great, good thing in Ottawa the right great, now. The great corrupt liberal city of Ottawa. You know, the architecture <laughs> is beautiful here, but the people not quite the same. If you want to let us know your thoughts throughout the live stream, you can always go on Rumble or Odyssey, send us paid chats, and we'll do our best to read it on air at the end of the live stream later on. We will have Freedom Convoy volunteer, not quite organizer, participant, public persona, Tom Razzo coming on. And we'll also have leader of the Ontario Party here in Ontario, Derek Sloan, come on as well to discuss the Emergencies Act Inquiry and everything that has happened today. Uh, also, just so that you guys know, on November 19th and November 25th, we will have Rebel News Live events in both Toronto and Calgary. Um, and in the Toronto event, I believe that we will have Tamara Leash 
participant uh, participate as a speaker so you will be able to hear from uh the great tamara leash convoy organizer tamara leash as well so celine this was your first day in ottawa what was your main takeaway from today um, well, again, besides the weather, it's just really interesting to see. There's some protesters that have started to show up um, outside of where the emergency commission is being held here in Ottawa. Um, I can only imagine that where there are one, there will be many more to follow. So that'll be interesting. Um, I really thought that it was very interesting what uh, Tom Razzo screamed for all the people in the back, what we we're thinking uh, for the last three years. But when he actually refused to talk to mainstream media, um, that was really interesting. I believe we have one of those clips as well. But um, again, that's something that a lot of people have been saying. And it's nice to have people publicly refuting or refusing to speak with mainstream media. Yeah, I think we've heard both Chris Barber, one of the organizers of the Freedom Convoy, and Tom Marazzo as well, in both of their testimony, discuss um, the way that they see mainstream media has manipulated the narrative, has vilified yes. the Freedom yeah. Convoy. I think that's the reason why people were so upset in mainstream media, because they weren't giving them a fair they share. They weren't portrayed correctly. Well, yeah. exactly. They were vilifying the people participating in the Freedom Convoy. We can see on the screen right here, Tom Marazzo refusing to take a question from one of the mainstream media reporters earlier today. So today, just a reminder, we had a Freedom Convoy lawyer, Keith Wilson, mm -hmm testify in front of the commission. We also had Freedom Convoyer Tom Morato testify as well. And we had Pat King who ended the day. I think he might still be giving his testimony, yeah. uh, King, yeah. at the moment. That is, that is very possible. Um, so, Celine, you've been following also, I, I think that you've been following the, con not the convoy, the emergency like inquiry for the past weeks as well, for the past yeah. three weeks. Oh, great, that's right. It's been a long three weeks. Um, we always talk about what we're seeing throughout the inquiry. We also talk, uh, talk about our takeaway from the inquiry. What was your takeaway from the past three weeks? Well, um, as some of you might know, I was actually there when the convoy first arrived in Ottawa. I showed up the night, the same, the same night that the truck started to pile in um, around the Parliament building and down Wellington. And um, from that point onward until the police came and crashed it, it was peaceful. Mm -hmm. So my main takeaway from the Emergencies Act inquiry is that, uh, again, there's a lot of discussion around even what they're calling the protesters, if they're protesters, you know, if they're if they're racist, if they're misogynist, if mm -hmm. they're sexist, then the narratives just keeps on changing. And when you see so many inconsistencies with stuff like this, um, I think it's fairly obvious that it's it's a cover up that's going on. That's my opinion, at least that I believe that it's a cover up. And there is no way that you can actually with all of the, mm -hmm. the proof, all the videos from the very beginning since those trucks got there um, to the very end. No one can tell me that they were anything except peaceful. 100%. You were also part of the Freedom Convoy. Um, and you, we heard, as you just mentioned, Paul Champ, a lawyer, that's, that keeps arguing um, about how non-peaceful, about how threatening the Freedom Convoy people were. Uh, we heard Zexy Lee say that the people, the people that were part of the Freedom Convoy were harassing citizens, even though we learned that the whole, the own citizens of Ottawa who were opposing the Freedom Convoy were throwing eggs, eggs they're egging at them. the exactly. protesters. Yeah. They were egging the protesters. Yeah. Is what you're hearing right now from the testimonies of these anti-convoy people what you, the same thing as you've witnessed as a journalist in Ottawa? Um, no, <laughs> like absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, I left before things, um, before the police started to really like pile in there and like crack down on the peaceful mm -hmm. protesters. So I just saw the very beginning where everyone was still in very much in a state of awe. And um, it was the first time that you saw so many people smiling together, laughing, being merry, cheering. That was kind of, that was a norm that people were looking for. Mm -hmm. So when you have people like Zexy Lee who are testifying and trying to validate throwing eggs at trucks and at protesters because there was honking or like microaggressions and people were being offended um it's very interesting like how can you validate something like that what do you think yeah well it, it's so crazy and we've seen there's there's a single counter protester well a protester actually that been that's been here for the past for the past few days in front of the commission building that's been calling the truckers the freedom convoy people terrorists that's been calling them racist that's been calling them far right lunatics we see her right <laughs> here really and not a single <laughs> supporter of the Freedom Convoy has laid a finger on her. I think yeah. they were re-terrorists. 
something like that would have happened and we have yet to see any violence that's been yeah. inflicted that's been put on this woman yes. for protesting Tamara Leach, protesting Tom Marat, protesting yeah. the Freedom Convoy people. Yeah. Well, especially like think about how Antifa was brought into yeah. this as well, right? So Freedom in 2022 is not sitting idly by while health diktats with no skin in the game make up all the rules. If you're like me, I want to play an active role in upholding civil liberties and freedoms for all Canadians, for our children, and eventually our grandchildren. Then come out to our Rebel Live event and get to know us in person. We'll hearing from some of the most influential leaders in the freedom movement. We have events in Toronto on November the 19th and in Calgary on Saturday, November 26th. Tickets are on sale now at rebelnewslive.com. Come out, have lunch, get some Rebel swag, meet the Rebels, and more. You don't want to miss this event. Check it out, rebelnewslive.com. Hey everyone, William Diaz here with Rebel News, currently at the Library and Archives building uh, in Ottawa for the Emergencies Act inquiry, the inquiry that is happening because Justin Trudeau used a never seen before anti-terrorism law on peaceful protesters in February back when the convoy was here in town to so basically euthanize weeks of peaceful protests against COVID-19 mandates. And this morning, Freedom Convoy lawyer Keith Wilson was testifying in front of the committee. He spoke about hate speech. He spoke about organizational issues that the convoy organizers face while trying to plan the whole convoy and difficulties they were facing throughout the duration of the protest. So as he was coming out of the room, we were able to ask him a few questions. Here's what uh, Wilson had to say. Just, you said that your, your wife's assessment of the government overreaching the COVID-19 pandemic was what pushed you to you know, work with the convoy. Were you? Would you say, just out of curiosity, that you were an apolitical person before that? Or less concerned with the civil liberties and everything? Uh, was I? Yeah. Well, I can assure you of this. My wife was. Um, she was extremely apolitical and busy with uh, uh, her own activities and uh, caring for our elderly parents and doing work with her church. But her medical training was such that she observed the advice that was starting to come from the public health officials and doing her own research. And she said, this doesn't add up anymore. Yeah. Um, and she became very concerned about the direction of the country, the level of overreach, uh, the mandates, the harm that they were causing to children in schooling, playgrounds, um, normal activities that she said, you got to get involved. Yeah. You know, we heard the Government of Canada Council talk about hate speech. What are your views on hate speech and hate speech laws uh, by the federal government? Well, my view is that in any other modern democracy, for a prime minister to call six million Canadians racist misogynists and say, how do we deal with these people and should we tolerate these people would result in such a level of reaction that that prime minister would be forced to resign and apologize. And the fact that this prime minister deliberately divided and created hate, engaged in the process of othering people, and so far has suffered no political consequences, absolutely remarkable. Do you think? Do you think if the prime minister has spoken with the protesters, you guys would have been here for less long, or the situation would have been resolved quicker than it was? You know, it's amazing that none of the protesters, and the leadership and otherwise, wanted to meet with the prime minister. It's not an individual they hold in high regard. It's a the commission is reconvened. La commission reprend. Thank you for that indulgence. Uh, now we can run through to uh, the end, I hope, and adjourn before it, uh, well, it'll be late, but go ahead. <laughs> it's already dark. Um, so if we could pull up uh, HRF 428, sorry, HRF 1346, page 51. And uh, if we could zoom in a bit. So, Ms. Leach, this is a uh, document titled Freedom Convoy 2022 Code of Conduct. 
Are you familiar with this document? Uh, yes, I am, sir. Can you describe what it is? It is a, a code of conduct. Uh, we recognized once the, the once the support started coming and we began growing that we should have something in place um, for people to sign saying that they would hear would adhere to uh, a code of conduct. Right. Um, and uh, do you recall if this was distributed? It was put on uh, the, the back side of the registration forms, I believe. Uh, and those were the registration forms to get reimbursement? Yes. Was it distributed in any other manner? Um, I think we they could uh, get them by email or get hard copies. Um, I think we had them up on, on a website. Was there anything done to proactively distribute them, to, for instance, to the people who were on the ground in Ottawa? Uh, we had printed off a lot of copies. <laughs> we, had, we had big hopes <laughs> when this started and that. Um, and so we had printed off a bunch of copies to have the road captains take to the drivers to sign, uh, thinking that this would be a fairly simple task. But because of the amount of participation that we had, it was it was crazy, but I did I actually did receive a lot of them uh, through email, so they did get out. Um, I'm not asking for a precise number in any way, shape, or form, but do you have a sense of how many you got back? I I'm not sure. Okay. Um, a lot. Right. Um, and we see here in item three, it says, be respectful. Everyone will have their own reasons for participating in this convoy, and we need to be respectful of their reasons. What were you trying to capture in that point? Well, I believe in being respectful and why, while I may have been going to Ottawa to, um, because of the mandates, there are the, yeah, the mandates. I mean, what my reasons were for wanting the mandates to be lifted may not have been the same as somebody else's reasons for wanting the mandate lifted. To your knowledge, was there anyone there who was uh, seeking to do something other than end the mandates? No. And all the people you spoke to, did anyone ever suggest that they had any other goal than ending the mandates? Other than hearing about the MOU, which as you've heard today, I haven't even read it yet, um, but other than that, no. And what were you hearing about the MOU? I know you haven't read it, but what were you hearing about it? Um, what did I hear about it? Um, I just heard that it was a document that was to be presented to the Governor General. I, I really don't recall all the details. It was just a general in passing, I guess. Item number four says not pr promote harmful media. Mm -hmm. What did you consider to be harmful media? Well, no hateful rhetoric. We didn't want any sort of divisive rhetoric. Um, just again, it goes back to point three, be respectful. Um, we, we didn't, I, went, I was on lives daily saying that we are going to Ottawa to peacefully protest and exercise our democratic right to assembly. We are not going there to create uh, problems and um, um, you know, I, I, I said, if you see anyone that's at, acting in a threatening manner or an aggressive manner um, to get their license plates, phone the police and report it or contact us and we could report it. Um, we just didn't want any of that type of behavior happening here because that was never what it was about. Did you believe that there might be people in the convoy who may promote hateful content? It was a concern. Uh, again, I know when we were on our way at one point, I believe it was when we got to Thunder Bay, we were on our way to Thunder Bay, and um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody had contacted me saying they thought that there was infiltrators, Antifa, that had infiltrated our convoy from Winnipeg that were maybe going to cause some problems for us. So there was always, that's, that kind of information was always coming to us, right? Other than potential actions by Antifa, were you concerned about other people potentially making or promoting hateful content? Not really. Everyone that I talked to and saw and were all there for the same, for the same reason. At any point in time, to your knowledge, did any of the organizers have to do anything to uh, have to take any action because there was reports of either 
uh, threat, threats, harassment, violence, or hateful conduct, or anything that you would have thought was inappropriate? Um, well, of course, there was the conversation uh, that Benjamin, when he called me that one morning when we were on our way, I think it was our second day, and there had been a tweet come out about uh, Mr. King talking about bullets. And so um, that was obviously concerning. Um, we stopped and we chatted with him on the side of the road about it. Um, he indicated that it had been heavily edited by some media, I'm not sure. But it, it, was, it was obviously concerning. Um, do you recall if that bullet comment, whether there was, we, we've heard evidence of two bullet uh, comments from Mr. King, at, at least two. One was Trudeau, you're going to catch a bullet, and one was this will all end in bullets. Do you recall which one of those? It was the ending in bullets one. I don't remember ever hearing about the, the one about the Prime Minister. Okay. Um, Ms. Lee, you can take that down now. Um, Ms. Leach, you've, you've watched much of these proceedings, so you've heard a lot of the evidence that we've heard about people complaining about the horns, people saying there was harassment, there was intimidation, there was unsafe, uh, there's unsafe settings. Um, we've had evidence from citizens of Ottawa who said, said they felt unsafe in, in their own city. Do you have anything to say to that? I encountered hundreds and hundreds of Ottawa residents when I was here, um, thanking me, thanking us, saying that we gave them hope. Uh, um, Ottawa residents and, in fact, federal government employees that were taking donations of food to the truckers, blankets, um, fuel, and... Um, yeah, we... Everyone had said the same thing to, to me that, the, I mean, the word that I heard the most on the way here and when I was here was hope. Many of the protesters who have testified this week have shared a, shared a similar message, talked about the positive, loving atmosphere that, uh, w that they experienced in the protest. Do you deny that there were incidents of harassment or incidents of intimidation or threatening like the ones we've heard, do you deny that that happened? I never witnessed it. I never witnessed any of that, any of that type of behavior. Again, there was always rumors, um, but, but I never personally witnessed any, any behavior like that whatsoever. I also heard that the Russians were involved. I also heard that we were tried to burn a building down um, I mean, there was a ton of misinformation out there. I had um, my family from Edmonton messaging me, texting me, asking if I was okay, and they were really worried about my safety. And I said, worried about my safety? Like, this is, this is the biggest love fest I've ever participated in, right? When you hear the citizens of Ottawa, not all of them, I appreciate that, but when you hear some of the citizens of Ottawa say, I felt harassed, I felt intimidated, I felt unsafe, do you believe them? I believe that's how they felt. I, again, I can't say I, I never witnessed any of that. Um, obviously, the last thing that we ever wanted to do when we came here was to, to make the citizens of Ottawa feel that way. And I guess, you know, when, as we alluded to even in our letter um, with the mayor, right, like we never, intended for that to happen and we didn't want to cause that kind of disruption and and we worked really hard the the road captains worked really hard to keep the emergency <coughs> lanes open and to of course the horn injunction came in and worked really hard to ensure that that was adhered to um because we didn't we definitely would never wanted anybody to feel that way right and then once the horn injunction came in um the, the, the that was now a court order but yes. prior to the court order, did you have a view on the honking? Well, I did have a view on the honking, as uh, even Mr. Barber said. After a couple of days, it was it was getting to be a bit much for me. I, I you know, trying to walk down the street and have a conversation with somebody was um, sometimes difficult. Um, but again, I, I stayed um, in the Ark Hotel for a few days, and then at the Sheridan Hotel for a few days. And um, at least in my room, I. Maybe I was preoccupied, but I didn't hear a lot of horns. But then we weren't also, we were on, I uh, guess, uh, Slater and Albert. 
Did you see yourself as someone who had a level of influence over the convoy and the protest? I felt like I was respected, that my opinion was respected by most, most of them, yes. Um, did you ever consider, given what you said, that you got started to get annoyed at the horns? I take it you probably at some point understood that the horns was causing frustration to a lot of people. Is that fair? I'd heard that, yes. Did you ever consider taking any steps to use the respect you had to reduce or eliminate the horn honking prior to the court order? On or about February 4th, I want to say, um, my Facebook page was disabled, which is how I accessed the convoy page to do videos. Um, so I, I couldn't have, I guess, but I, I never really considered it because I left that type of stuff up to the, up to the captains. And was it, again, given the respect that you felt you had and, and the evidence bears that out, or that we've heard a lot of evidence on that, um, do, you, did you con do you think that if you had asked the captains to take action with respect to the horns that they would have listened to you? Well, they were, already were, so it wasn't necessary for me to. So I, I, the, had you instructed the captains to stop the horn honking? I don't... No, I don't think I instructed them to. I believe we had discussions about the horns, though. And what was the result of those discussions? Um, well, for sure, I know Mr. Barber would go out and, and try and talk to the drivers, and uh, I, I believe Mr. Marazzo was also out um, to try and get them uh, to slow or cease, become less frequent, sorry. It's okay. I'm going to move to uh, another topic now, um, and I apologize, I am moving around in time. It's okay. Um, uh, the Commission is aware that on uh, January 30th, uh, you attended a press conference with uh, Mr. Barber and Mr. Dichter. Um, this would be the, before the arrival of Mr. Wilson. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, you had mentioned earlier that you were uncomfortable uh, attending a pe press conference on February 2nd. Do you recall why you were comfortable attending this press conference on January 30th? Well, I wouldn't say I was comfortable. I was still quite nervous, but um, uh, uh, Mr. Barber and Mr. Benjamin, uh, sorry, Mr. Barber and Mr. Dichter were uh, friends of mine. And also uh, we had made the conscious decision at that point to not have the mainstream media there. So I felt like uh, the independent media were not going to be aggressive with me, if that and, makes sense. And with respect to the Taking Back Our Freedoms press conference, was your understanding the mainstream media would be there? They were there, yes. Okay. Um, if we could go, uh, so the video, the commission has the video, it's COM 50850. I'm not proposing to pull it up because again, that would, that would be the end of the day. Um, but unless there's objection, I would like to enter it into the record. And then I'm gonna ask you about the transcript, uh, which is COM 895. Yes. So if we could pull up COM 895 and go to page 10 of the transcript, page 11 of the PDF. So if we can uh, scroll down. So scroll down. Stop right there. Up per, actually, scroll up just a little bit. There we go. So uh, an unidentified reporter asks you, um, uh, notes that Maxine Bernier has sort of had a rally here in downtown Ottawa today. Are you associated with him at all? Are you pleased with support he's given the convoy? What are your thoughts on that? And you respond, we're not associated. We took a vote as an organization, all the committee heads and the organizers, and we are not partisan. Uh, we had re we had reached out to a couple of others. A couple of other ones reached out to us. And we wanted to get up and s who wanted to get up and speak, and we said no. That's not what we're about. This is a grassroots movement, and no politicians are going to represent us. I mean, they're kind of the reason we're in this mess in the first place. Do you recall saying that? I do. Right. Um, why was it important to you that the movement was nonpartisan? Well, because I guess uh, right within the first couple days of us starting uh, to organize before we'd left, I did have politicians reaching out to me. 
um, that wanted to get up and speak. And I just felt like we, we had our message and that's the message that we needed to, st to stick to without getting it convoluted with the messages of other politicians. And so by this point, um, to tell you the truth, I shouldn't say that I'm telling the truth, but um, it was about three days into organizing the convoy that I knew that my time with the Maverick Party was done. And the reason I knew that it was done was because I was sitting at my kitchen table um, and we had chats with the different road captains in the different areas um, going on messenger. And I was chatting with the Quebec, the Quebec team. And we were told there was a thousand truckers ready to come and support us. And I had, I guess, an epiphany moment. And there's me, you know, chatting here and I got Google Translate on the other one and I'm talking to the Quebecers, me and Albertan. And I just had this moment where I just thought, this division has all been a lie. They're the same as us. And, and I knew that I didn't want to see Canada divided at that point. And I resigned from my position with the Maverick Party uh, up two or three days after I arrived in Ottawa. So uh, as I understand what you just said there, that uh, seeing, seeing the, the pan-Canadian nature of the oh. convoy led you to no longer... Uh, be interested in an in a Alberta secession? That's correct. Do you still hold that I feeling? I do. As a matter of fact, I'm going to learn French. <laughs> um, we've already referenced that Mr. Eros had an interview with the commission and, uh, and, and, and provided us some information. Um, one of the things Mr. Eros said uh, was that he suggested, I should say, in his uh, interview that once Mr. Wilson and the other lawyers arrived um, in around February uh, 3rd, I guess, uh, the, the, he's, as he describes it, the Western sovereign, sovereigntist movement tried to take control of the narrative. Do you have, at any point in time, did you get any sense that there was um, direction or influence from the people that you had, would have known through your time at the Maverick Absolutely Party? Absolutely not, no. Did, did anyone uh, who you had uh, affiliations with or know from the Maverick or Wexic party join you in Ottawa? Uh, the only person that I saw that came out from there was um, a gentleman that had ran as a candidate for the Maverick party who was a friend of mine. His, his name was Tarek. Anyone else? Uh, not that I can remember. Oh, sorry, my bad. Colin uh, Kruger also showed up for a few days. When did you first become aware of the protests and blockades in Coots, Alberta? Oh, I, I'm not even sure. We had so much going on here to deal with. I remember hearing about the borders, um, but I, I'm not sure when it was. It has already been in the news for a few days, I think. Um, did you know anyone who was participating in the protests or blockades there? Um, I, it's sort of my home area, so uh, I do know of two of my friends that were there for sure. Um, but I, and I probably, actually I believe my parents even took food there one day. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know. Uh, were your friends there, were either of them involved in organizing the protests or the blockades? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, were you communicating with your friends who were in Coots? Um, I think um, one of them had sent me a text message um, just to see how I was doing, because um, he was a friend of mine, and mentioned that he was there. Um, but other than that, no. Did your friends or anyone reach out to you uh, to request support or guidance on how to organize a protest? Never. Did you have any understanding about the makeup of the protest group at Coots? I did not. I, I, I really did not have time to follow what was happening closely. I just knew that they were happening. What did you understand their goals to be? I think they were there, I assume they were there for the border mandates. Did your friends tell you what they were doing when they were participating? No. Or sorry, why they were participating to be more precise? No.
Did you have any communications with any other protesters at any of the other protests in Canada that were occurring at the same time as the Ottawa protests? No, sir. Anyone, uh, any communications with anyone in Surrey? No, sir. Emerson? No, sir. Windsor? No, sir. If we could pull up HRF 1294. Um, so if you scroll down, so this is an email uh, dated Friday, February 11th, 2022. Um, and uh, while it's blocked out, I believe this is an email that was sent to you. Is that correct? I had 15,000 emails, <laughs> maybe. Well, well, let's scroll up and put some context to sure. it then. So you see there on two days later, uh, there's an email message from February 13th from Tamara with a signature, sincerely Tamara, Tamara Leach. So it appears that you're forwarding this email uh, onto someone named Danny. Yes. Yeah. Do you have any reason to believe you didn't receive the email down, down below? I, I don't, yeah. I don't have any reason to believe I didn't. There was a lot I didn't get to. And if we can scroll down. So it says, good afternoon, please. We are looking for help to get in touch with an Ottawa convoy organizer or someone who can help us. My uncle is desperately trying to organize the convoy in Windsor. Currently, there is no persons or person or persons in charge. We are in immediate need of help and direction from, from the Ottawa convoy organization. We are not looking for funds so much as support, direction, and to make the connection with your convoy. And scroll down, I will continue reading. Um, and then it's signed by a Kathleen Tom in brackets Hogan. Do you recognize the name Kathleen Tom or Kathleen Hogan? I do not. Do you recall if you had any other communications from Miss Tom? I don't. Uh, do you recall, does this refresh your memory at all about whether or not you received any other similar messages from anyone in Windsor or any of the other uh, protest locations? No, I, like I said, I had a, a lot of emails that I never got to and, but I don't recall, I don't recall seeing any of them. Now I'm going to ask you um, some questions about uh, the agreement that was reached with the mayor of auto with respect to the moving of the trucks. And again, the commission has heard a lot uh, of evidence about that, but I have a few questions for you. Um, when did you first come to know that it was possible that there might be the opportunity to have a discussion with the mayor? Um, yeah. uh, well, we had a meeting with Mr. French, I believe it was February the 11th. Um, at that point, he didn't indicate to me um, who he was representing. I think he was just trying to open some negotiations. And I, I think it was maybe the next day or after that then that I found out that it was uh, from the mayor. And so or that the, he was on there on behalf. And so you said that was February the 11th? I think it was f a Friday, February the 11th. Um, and as we understand it, the letters that you and the mayor exchanged were on February the 12th. Does that accord yes, with your recollection? Yes, it does. So that happened pretty quickly, didn't it? It did, yes. Can you explain to me how you originally, how that developed over such a short period of time? Well, as I said, we had a, a meeting with Mr. French and some of the road captains and um, other volunteers. And it just, it happened really quickly because we wanted, uh, I viewed it as a, a step, a first step, a step to start, you know, getting the trucks out of the downtown core so that we could get those, those areas opened up for the citizens. And um, what have they been saying here? Uh, shrinking the footprint or whatever. Um, and and uh, it did happen really fast. And, and you, you know, you have to understand that we had been there now for, I think that was going into our third week. We were tired. We wanted to go home. <laughs> so we were looking for ways where we could start forming an exit strategy. And while um, our concern was obviously never with the city of Ottawa, we felt it was a, a step one, and number two, finally, someone is willing to sit down and, and just listen to us and have a dialogue with us. So you were open to the notion of shrinking the protest footprint with an eventual view to, to an exit, is yes. that fair? Did yeah. you have a timeline in your mind about how much longer you were willing to stay? 
Not really. It was, everything was very fluid and um, day by day. I guess my hope was that if we could open communications with the mayor um, and he could see that we weren't, you know, the types of people that we were being described as in the media, that perhaps that would open the door for t talks with someone, uh, with MPs or someone um, in the federal government who would take the time to sit down and listen to us. Um, you heard Mr. Dichter testify earlier today, I believe. Is that correct? I heard parts of it. Parts yes. of it. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Dichter, uh, his evidence in, in some summary was that he he did not want to shrink the footprint, and in fact, he thought shrinking the the move up to Wellington was a bad idea, and it was an attempt by some people to make it easier for the police to clear the protests. Was that a view that Mr. Dichter shared with you at any point in time? I don't recall if he ever did. I, I don't recall having that conversation, but again, um, there was lots going on. Do you recall if anyone within the board of directors or anyone who you were talking to on a regular basis, whether there was any dissenting voices, anyone who thought this was not the right move? Well, we talked with the road captains before that letter went out and, and had agreement. To, um, we discussed the draft of the letter, I believe, and Mr. Wilson and Mr. Chipiak drafted it and emailed it to everyone so that they would have a chance to read it also and waited for the approvals to come back in. I don't recall if any of them strongly opposed it, to tell you, like, I'm not sure. I don't believe so. Um. Mr. Dichter also testified today that after um, the news of the agreement came out, he received thousands of, I think maybe 2,000 messages of people who uh, had concern and seemed disappointed or upset. Was that something he expressed to you? Not that I recall. Do you recall receiving any negative feedback from anyone after the deal was became public on the 13th? Um, I think there was some people that felt a little bit confused. I mean, I, rem I, f I remember hearing that some people didn't didn't feel con or felt a little bit confused about what was happening. Um, I remember hearing something to the effect of Tamara's negotiating with the with the mayor behind our backs, which was not true. But again, it, it was just all rumor, like, you, you know. <laughs> so do you recall someone specifically saying to you that Tamara's negotiating behind her back? No, I don't recall any specific people telling. I just remember the gist of some of the things that I was hearing. Right. And, and other than the road captains and the board, were the fact of the negotiations, was that something that was discussed with the protesters more generally before the deal was entered into? We printed off um, uh, some information uh, after we after we discussed it as a group and went out to speak to the truckers about it to to explain to them why we felt this was a really good idea. I'm not sure what the experiences were of the road captains. I know I went out to 88, I believe it was, and had a great conversation with the gentleman that was that was. Um, kind of overseeing out there and um, he was in full agreement. I talked to some of the other truckers that were out there and they were they were in full agreement also. They all thought it was a good idea. Um, and we heard today uh, Mr. Dichter talk about the tweets that he made both from his personal account and from your account after the deal uh, was announced publicly in the media. When did you first learn that uh, Mr. Dichter had tweeted and then retweeted from your account that there had been no agreement? I've must have been that same evening. Um, I believe I was at the Swiss Hotel when that came out. Um, and I think it was definitely after the fact that I'd heard about it. And it must have been that same evening, I'm assuming. What was your reaction? I was shocked but um i knew that mr wilson they they, they had seen it right away I, I think he'd saw it come up on his twitter right away and um i trusted them to look after it correct it i should say did you ever discuss the tweets with mr dichter i don't believe so because so many things happened after that um monday was the invocation of the emergencies act uh, which we found out when we were actually, ironically, on our way to meet with uh, Mr. Brian Peckford. 
Um, and I, I don't recall having a, the conversation with him about that, but I, I could have. It was because it was kind of a big deal. Well, then the nature of the question was kind of a big deal. Do you, um, um, do you, I take it then, but you don't recall any specific conversations with him? I don't, sir. Um, Mr. Champ suggested, I think at some point yesterday, that um, in addition to the tweets that you went on a, uh, a Facebook live stream at some point and said you didn't support the deal that had been struck with the mayor, do you have any recollection about that? About that? Is, does that ring any bells? And that doesn't ring any bells to me. Um, and uh, were you here yesterday when Mr. King testified? I was, yes. And so you would have seen uh, that the commission showed a video that Mr. King released after the deal had been announced uh, in which he said there was no deal. Uh, he called it, said it's a lie, it's a false flag, and told everyone uh, to hold the line. Um, did you see the video at that time? I did not. When was the first time you saw that video? In totality, it was yesterday. I, I believe I heard about it. Uh, well, I know I heard about it, um, but I believe that yesterday was the first time I watched it, the whole thing. I might have seen bits of it before. What was your reaction to seeing it yesterday? Well, Mr. King wasn't um, in our meetings, so um, I, <laughs> I don't really have a reaction. I mean, he, he wasn't attending our meetings. I don't know if, uh, I'd, like I said, my interactions with him were, were quite limited, so I don't know if he'd spoken to one of the other road captains or if anybody had told him what was going on, so. I take it he didn't reach out to you? Uh, no. And would you have expected Mr. King before coming out and saying that a deal you had entered into was a lie? Would you have expected him to come and check with you first? I guess so. I, I don't really know. He, he kind of does his own thing. Do you still think that Mr. King was at the protest for the right reasons? I have never heard him speak from his lips that I could hear racist comments. I've seen the videos that have been, you know, online that you guys have shown. I personally have never bared witness to that. And I believe at his core, he was here to, just like the rest of us were, to exercise his democratic rights to a peaceful assembly. Do you have any regret that Mr. King was associated with the convoy? I've thought a lot about that question, and he is a part of the story. And I, I mean, I, I can't have really have regrets because it is what it is. The, things happened the way that they were supposed to happen, and I guess he had a part, of, a part to play, I, I don't know. That's that's a hindsight is twenty twenty, right? So the as 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 everyone in this room knows, the Emergencies Act was invoked on February fourteenth, two thousand and twenty twenty two. Um, after the invocation of the act, what was your understanding about whether or not people could continue to protest in the red zone peacefully? Well, nobody had ever come up to me and told me that we needed to leave. Have you have you seen the flyers that uh, that have been sh that have been shown in the evidence, uh, an OPS flyers giving notice that uh, people needed to vacate the area? Uh, uh, I did, yes, yeah, I did see those. Have, did you remember seeing flyers like that at the time? Um, I did see somebody sent me a screenshot of one. I, I can't remember if I had an actual copy of it, but I had a screenshot of one, and I thought it was odd. Um, now, it's been a while, but I, I think it was because there was spelling mistakes and it wasn't signed by anyone. I didn't know. Um, I guess at this point, I was kind of questioning the validity of anything I saw, really. And um, it was definitely alarming. Um, but again, nobody ever came to us and said, you guys have to leave right now. And as far as I was concerned, we were, we were peacefully protesting 
we were exercising our democratic rights to be here and to protest. So if no one came and told you you had to leave, what did you think the impact or purpose of the invocation of the Emergencies Act was? Um, again, this is an entirely new world for me. I didn't know. Um, I remember when uh, I believe the city of Ottawa implemented a state of emergency and then um, Mr. Ford uh, inv uh, invoked a, a provincial state of emergency. And um, I don't want to sound flippant, but what I saw from those were small groups of police officers standing around to larger groups of police officers standing around. So I didn't understand fully, I guess, what that meant uh, um, in terms of what was expected of us. So it, it was really alarming. I remember starting to get quite anxious about what could be coming. As, uh, as one of the people who was organizing the movement, as the person who you at least identified had been held out as a leader, even if you didn't feel that way, did you take any steps to figure out what it meant that the Emergencies Act had been invoked and what that meant for the people who were protesting and the people that you understood to be supporting your convoy? Uh, well, as I said, we were on the way to meet with Mr. Peckford when we heard that Mr. Trudeau was going to be invoking the act or, or announcing that he was going to be invoking the act later that day. And Mr. Peckford thought it would be a good idea for us to do a press conference about it also. And um, so we did do a press conference later that day um, prior to the Prime Minister's press conference. And um, we... Dis we wanted to continue and, and peacefully protest, um, of, but I, I knew that people were leaving, which I encouraged, and uh, I believe it was the 16th, it was the day before I, I was arrested that uh, some of the road captains and, and friends that uh, were close to our organization started leaving, which, which of course I encouraged. I mean, I was concerned about what could be coming uh, we had heard that there was um, quite a police presence coming and obviously I didn't want to see anyone be hurt. So I didn't want to see anybody get arrested. At that point in time, was it your view that it was time to leave Ottawa? It was getting close. <laughs> and you already mentioned that you got arrested on February 17th. Yes, sir, um, I did. Can you tell the commission uh, what it was like to be arrested? Well, it was, again, kind of ironic because I went down to the war memorial that day to attend the service that the vets were having there every day. I spent my afternoon walking the streets with um, a veteran as, and my husband and uh, Miranda, one of the road captains, um, just talking to people. And um, I was aware the night before, I'm sure you saw the video, that it was most likely coming. Um, or that there was a chance that I could be arrested. And we went back to the hotel, and within 15 minutes, everybody's phones started blowing up and that Mr. Barber had been arrested. Um, Mr. Bulford and I were at the Swiss Hotel with um, uh, Mr. Skubik and Mr. Tyson, and we discussed what we should do, what our next step should be. And we were concerned that if they were starting to arrest the organizers, that they would come to the hotel. And my husband was there. And Mr. Bulford's wife was there. And obviously that was the last thing that I would ever want my husband to see was to me be arrested. Um, We definitely didn't want that sort of activity occurring at the hotel with a woman who had been so kind to us, actually who was about to lose her business until we showed up. But like I said in my video, I, I wasn't afraid. I, 
believe and still believe that we did an excellent job remaining peaceful, advocating for the police, advocating for respecting the police. And um, so we made the conscious decision to go out and ask the police if they were looking for us. We walked um, up to the hill, and I believe it was Metcalf, and we stopped and talked to some officers. I'm not sure what their rank was. There was two uh, Suburbans pointed with their headlights up at the hill, and we walked up to them, and Mr. Bulford identified who we were and asked the gentleman if uh, we heard that they were looking for organizers. Um, we are the org we're part of the volunteers, and he indicated to us that, that he didn't have information on that. Um, Danny asked him I th maybe a second time, or he asked him another question, and he, he um, rolled his window up, communicated with somebody, rolled his window down, and said no. And I remember saying, well, if that changes, we're just going to be up at the hill here. And we went up to the hill, and I think we were there for an hour and a half to two hours. And we decided to go back to, to our room. Um, we'd presented ourselves to the police. They indicated that we were not, um, they were not looking for us. We walked down to the Ark Hotel and warmed up. It was, it was cold that night. Um, and I believe Sean was staying there and needed to get something. Uh, so we warmed up in there for about 10 minutes and then started heading back to the Swiss Hotel. As we crossed the street, there, had been, there was construction on my left side of the street on, in front of the buildings, I remember, so it wasn't very well lit. And as we were walking, I met another couple coming towards us, and the lady hugged me and thanked me and Danny, and she was crying, and we were standing there talking to this couple, and all of a sudden, three Suburbans just went, police Suburbans, I think that's what they are, uh, went flying down the street past us. And then a fourth one came and pulled over. And so at that point, I was pretty sure that I was about to be arrested. How has the arrest affected your life? <laughs> I've lost my job. I've lost my freedom of speech. I've lost my freedom to communicate with my friends, which was quite traumatizing because we just experienced something huge. And we didn't get any time to even sit down as a group and, and just talk about it and talk about our experience. We didn't have that opportunity. That was taken away from me. I have to be very careful about every move that I make. As you know, I was arrested on an alleged breach charge for attending a dinner in Toronto. I had the police show up at the place that I'm staying last weekend because somebody saw me outside smoking a cigarette. I have a daughter that I don't want her to be seen with me. Because I'm worried. I'm so sorry. Take your time. I have yet to see the particulars of the mischief that I I'm alleged to have committed. I just... It's definitely affected my life. It's, it's something that I've never been arrested before. I, 
The process, the legal process, I find extremely frustrating. My trial's not till next year. I have to live under these conditions for a year. But I will, I'll make it work. I'll manage and I did everything I felt that I could do in my power through the lives that I was doing. And I believe it worked as I was advocating again for peaceful protest, respect the police, please respect other people. That was a big part of the reason I did that live the last night. I uh, saw a lot of those flags and while I support anyone's freedom of speech, it's not something that resonated with me. I saw and heard of people that were upset with some mainstream media. And um, I just wanted to, I did my video because regardless of how angry we are with the lack or the leadership that we've seen, uh, the divisive rhetoric, the, the, the division between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated that I've seen come from elected officials, civil servants, towards their own people. And I saw those flags one day and I, and I kept thinking, I gotta get to the stage and make a speech. Like I, 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 felt, I felt that I needed to get there and I needed to just say, you know, Mr. Trudeau has three children and I have three children and my kids have to wake up and see this stuff on social media too. Actually, when I was arrested, my 19 year old daughter woke up to read an article that I hung myself in jail. She's 19. Thank you, Ms. Leach. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, we're uh, at the stage of uh, adjourning for the day. And... Uh, I think it's welcome for everybody. So we'll Sir, come back tomorrow at 9:30. Sir, uh, I have a. You have a question? Yes. Just, just a request. Um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, the, the witness is now technically under cross examination. hasn't started, but uh, we would like permission to be able to communicate with the witness. We actually are all living in the same building. In fact, she's staying. Pardon me. I, yes. Uh, oh, so, yeah. so, sorry. We'd like permission, sir, leave to be able to communicate with the witness, though she's still under oath. Uh, we actually all kind of live in the the same apartment buildings and sharing apartments with the witness and things like that. So subject to your direction, uh, whatever works, I understand that that was uh, given to uh, Chief Slawley's counsel. Uh, we would like the same uh, prerogative, sir, if that was possible. Uh, I think, I don't think there actually was a, any uh, permission given. Uh, what was pointed out is the rule does not prevent you from speaking to the witness as long as you don't speak about any of the evidence. So, and, and that's my understanding of the rule. So you don't need my permission unless you want to speak to her about her evidence, in which case that's a different matter. Uh, no, sir, but as we would have uh, the evening, uh, we would anticipate, we have already, but we would anticipate the possibility of continuing to prepare her for cross, but uh, if that's not permitted, sir, we won't do so. I don't think that's contemplated by the rule. Um, I'm sorry, you, anyone want to pipe in on this? I'm sorry. Uh, well, Commissioner, if, if, if it's of assistance, uh, uh, and, and um, I'm not certain exactly who, who helped facilitate the, the way in which we approach the matter with the with Chief Slowly, but I, I believe the application of the rule is that um, the witness's evidence given to date is not the subject of discussion, but that would, I think my friend uh, would be able to sp speak about the questions that he intends to ask without going back over what the witness has given. Yeah. I, I believe that's how we, we, uh, we reached agreement with 
our friends from the Ottawa Police Service who had raised the issue and uh, with some of your commission terms. Yeah, I think it, its Thanks. lawyers have to be aware of the rule. It's basically the same rule as applies to in courts. And you can't speak about the cross-examination on the evidence. You can prepare, but that's a different matter. And the line, obviously, uh, we rely on lawyers to respect that, obviously. I'm sure it's the same in Alberta. Kind of. Yes, sir, it is. We're all one country. Okay, uh, so till uh, 9.30 tomorrow morning. The commission is adjourned. La commission est adjournée.